Welcome to episode 134 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host Cassius and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean texts and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we begin our discussion of Epicurus's letter to Menorchius. Now let's join Calicini reading today's text. Let no one, when young, delay to study philosophy, nor when he is old grow weary of his study, for no one can come too early or too late to secure the health of his soul. The man who says that the age for philosophy has either not yet come or has gone by is like the man who says that the age for happiness is not yet come to him or has passed away. Wherefore, both when young and old, a man must study philosophy that as he grows old he may be young in blessings through the grateful recollection of what has been, and that in youth he may be old as well, since he will know no fear of what is to come. We must then meditate on the things that make our happiness, seeing that when that is with us we have all, but when it is absent we do all to win it. Thank you for reading that, and welcome everybody to the first episode of our coverage of the letter to Menorchius or Menesius or Menicius, depending on how you like to say his first name. And for those listening to the podcast in the past, you've heard a new voice there today. That is Calicini, who has become a regular participant over at EpicureanFriends.com. And she'll be joining us as we go through the letter to Menorchius, as well as some of our older people as well, I think will be popping in as we go forward here. Don has said he will join when he can, and we have Charles with us occasionally as well. So we have a good panel to go through the letter that is probably the most significant, well-known, and the one that everyone reads to really get to the heart of what Epicurean ethics are all about. And so what we'll be doing over the next several weeks, now that we've finished the letter to Pythocles, the letter to Herodotus, and we finished Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, we will attempt to go through this letter about how to live in a very deliberate and careful fashion and try to bring you some insights as to how the material that we've covered in the past is going to illuminate what we're discussing here. I think what all of us find is that the letter to Menesius is what people come to maybe to start with when they go to read about what Epicurus had to say. And often they have not read the background material. Often they don't stay with it after they read the letter. They just simply read this in a way that's sort of out of context. And I think if you have the context from the background, you get a lot more out of the letter than you would otherwise. And so we'll try to provide you that context and bring some commentary and our own thoughts about what some of these passages mean. And so today we're starting with section 122. Calicini has just read the Bailey edition, but we'll be comparing Hicks and other editions as well as we go forward here. So we've picked a relatively short section because this is all so dense, but we have a couple of major points here to discuss today, such as the importance of studying philosophy, the relative way that a young or an old person would study philosophy and how to approach these issues. And then the last sentence of the passage brings us back to our focus of Epicurean ethics that we are attempting to pursue happiness here. And we have a lot of detail and subtlety to bring out when we discuss the goal of happiness. So with that as background and where we are and where we're going, welcome to the panel. And who would like to begin on the issue of letting no one who is young delay to study philosophy? Yeah, I would like to start on one remark. It seems right at the start, Bailey omits a greeting and Hicks as well. So in my German translation, I have a starting phrase at the beginning of the letter, Epicurus wishes Menoikius luck. In fairness to both Bailey and everybody, it's always possible that what I put in front of us here to read may not be exactly what's in their book. I may have omitted a transition phrase, but right, I think the Diogenes Laertius has the greetings in it. And I remember there's commentary on the difference in the way he greets. The, the greetings have a unique flavor to them. Josh, you remember anything about that? 
Yeah, certainly. In the case of the letter to Minoikius here, the greeting is rather terse. All it says is, Epicurus to Minoikius, joyful greetings. Whereas in, I think it was in the case of the letter to Pythocles that we just got finished with, the greeting there included this other person, and it was talking about how, you know, now that I'm finished uh, with all the rest of my writings, I can attend to this letter. And so it was much more familiar. It was much more friendly. I don't think that's necessarily a flaw in this letter. But in the letter to Pythocles, you get that interesting insight into kind of the nature of, of the school and the fact that the letter to Pythocles, at least, was something that was requested. Somebody had you know, sent a letter to Epicurus asking that he write something on this subject. And so it was quite protracted. Uh, but here, Epicurus just gets right into it. I don't know if that says anything about this letter, but it's certainly worth noting. Certainly, it's true that Herodotus, I guess he goes into some length uh, describing, as you said, Joshua, why he's providing this. And in here, there's really no context at all as to who Menorcus is, why he's writing. When I referenced Herodotus, I think he goes into sort of an explanation as to why he's providing the letter, talking about this is going to be an outline because there's so much detail in my 37 letters. So the greeting is the same as to Menorcus, but then that letter has an introduction, which Menorcus really doesn't have. So in Menorcus, it's really in medias res. No? And, you know, not just in terms of analyzing the greeting, but that's really an important part here that we don't know much at all and maybe nothing at all about who Menorcus was. We don't know if he's a young person, an old person, whether he's new to Epicurean philosophy or whether he's asked for summary like Herodotus has. This doesn't provide us, and I don't think we know from any other material, anything about who Menorcus was, which I think turns into something that's very significant because some of the material here, at least in the opening, is pretty obvious and direct and doesn't require a lot of explanation. But the deeper we get into it, I think there are subtleties that it would be very important to know whether Menorcius had had access to Epicurus's letters in the past, and whether he understood these things or whether he was somebody who was brand new and that Epicurus thought he needed to talk in terms of very basic material with. Well, now I was curious if this letter might fall into the genre of a protreptic, which was popularized back with Socratic students, and it was a means to draw potential students to the school. So that could be also why the greeting is very short, because there's not a close relationship yet, and it's just outlining the school's philosophy as a way to maybe draw Gnosius into the school to come to study. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. I think you're absolutely on the right track there. He does, Epicurus does in, in quite a number of places, seem to direct a lot of attention, particularly towards younger members, it seems like. There are a few cases I can think of a couple at least in the Vatican sayings where he directs his attention more toward older people. But certainly, yeah, you do want to you know, because Epicurus is out there, he's trying to convince people, you know, not to join his cult and give him money and power or that kind of thing. But he's really convinced himself, at least, that he has come up with something and it's something worth pursuing. And as he explores it further, he looks around, sees the people around him and sees that they're not happy, that they, Lucretia says that uh, life is one long struggle in the dark. That's not a universal rule for everybody. That's not applicable to all people because some people seem to have methods. They seem to have ways of escaping that darkness, metaphorically. And Epicurus maybe thinks he's found a way to do that. And so he comes to us now as a person who wants to share what he's discovered in order to help us. And Colosini, I could certainly see this as being an example of what you're describing. I think that's a very good insight. You know, one more background item that would fit into what we're discussing now is that as we go through this letter and discuss his positions on ethics, it would be very logical to look at and compare the way these issues are presented and the principal doctrines. We really don't know much about the principal doctrines, whether it was addressed to some person in particular, whether Epicurus prepared it himself. Presumably he did, but I don't know that we know that. We have the issues of how we divide it up into 40 different lines, but it apparently was probably written as sort of a narrative, almost like one of these letters. 
And I think we're going to see that to some extent he follows here in this letter some of the order that he has in the principal doctrines. Although here, the very first thing he's talking about is the need for philosophy and then happiness. And then he goes into the issue of the gods, which we're not going to treat until next week or our next episode. But I think that's one way to get something out of this, too, is to, again, think about these other sources that we have and relate what they say to what we're discussing here in this letter. Because if you're looking at the principal doctrines, there's not an opening section to the principal doctrines that tell you to study philosophy. And there's really also not in the principal doctrines, even in the beginning, an explicit statement that happiness is the thing that you're after. The principal doctrines three and four are talking about pleasure and pain, but I don't think it uses the word happiness. And it's interesting to to correlate those two things. So now that you've mentioned the word happiness, I kind of have to go into something here. The word happiness that we're seeing in translation, as Don will point out, is just simply a translation of the Greek word eudaimonia. And this word eudaimonia is a word that carries quite a lot of baggage. So let me give you what I think describes what Epicurus is talking about when he's talking about eudaimonia. And I'm just going to pull this directly from the Torquatus material that we've already discussed. And this comes from section or paragraph 12 in the Torquatus material. And he says, let us imagine a man living in the continuous enjoyment of numerous and vivid pleasures alike of body and of mind, undisturbed either by the presence or by the prospect of pain. What possible state of existence could we describe as being more excellent or more desirable? One so situated must possess in the first place a strength of mind that is proof against all fear of death or of pain. He will know that death means complete unconsciousness and that pain is generally light if long and short if strong so that its intensity is compensated by brief duration and its continuance by diminishing severity. Let such a man, moreover, have no dread of any supernatural power. Let him never suffer the pleasures of the past to fade away, but constantly renew their enjoyment in recollection, and his lot will be one which will not admit of further improvement. That's kind of my opinion that I'm giving you here, Uh, but I'm pulling it from the Torquatus material on what we're talking about when we talk about eudaimonia. If you go to the Wikipedia page for eudaimonia, you'll see in the little box at the top that there's about seven or eight different Greek philosophers who have their own view on it. But that's what I'm going to put forward as being maybe a kind of description of the Epicurean view. Yeah. And the way you're approaching that, Joshua, that probably ought to be the focus of our discussion today is that, okay, here in the very beginning of this letter, He's telling us something that when it is absent, we do all to win it, as Bailey says, or as Hicks says, if that be present, we have everything. And if that be absent, all our actions are directed towards attaining it. And so what we're going to get into as the letter goes forward and near the end is there's a lot of discussion of words that we throw out that are ataraxia, absence of disturbance, aponia, absence of pain. And of course, we translate that in all sorts of different ways in English with tranquility or calmness or whatever. But here in the very beginning of the letter, the very first passage, he's telling us that what it is that we do everything to go after is happiness or eudaimonia, which all these words have many different shades of meanings. But I think it's very important to note that when we start the letter, it's eudaimonia that he's after, not necessarily tranquility, not necessarily some type of pleasure. When we get into all of our discussions about kinetic, catastomatic, calmness, tranquility, peace of mind, absence of pain, all these different things that we talk about that are very important because they give some subtlety to what he's discussing. When he puts it out there at the very beginning of the letter, it's this eudaimonia, which most people translate as happiness, that is the definition of what he's saying is the target. I think that's pretty important to emphasize. And it's a target, Cassius, that is pegged to pleasure in the way that, you know, paper currency used to be pegged to the gold standard. It is no longer. But 
so when we're talking about eudaimonia, it, you, like you say, there's shades of meaning. It's quite a complex topic. You could probably take an entire year-long college course just on the word eudaimonia. I'm sure that exists somewhere. But what we're talking about here, I think that the shorthand is a life that is some combination of the fullness of pleasure with no fear and with no pain. That's the ideal state, which may or may not be attainable. Well, now I have a question here because as you're saying that you're coming from the big picture understanding of Epicureanism, but with this paragraph, I'm wondering when it comes to eudaimonia, there's not any explanation around it. And so it's kind of assuming that everyone knows what that is. And could it be possible that it's just a much more simpler thing, almost like a feeling, like an emotion? Everybody knows what happiness is, that it's a feeling. So I'm not so sure, to me, when I read it, it doesn't necessarily point to the whole philosophy of including pleasure, but more of a just an overall very simple thing that everyone was able to grasp or assume that it means something the same for everyone. I certainly see your point there, Colosini. And certainly somebody who was educated in philosophy in the ancient world when they started reading this they would have had a very similar understanding going into it, not with the word happiness, but with the word eudaimonia. You know, they would have understood eudaimonia in the context of a word that was used in philosophy to describe a state like the state that we think of when we think of happiness. I guess I quibbled just slightly. You've said that it's a feeling. Epicurus elsewhere says the feelings are two, pleasure and pain. But I think what you're articulating is an interesting point that the way someone's going to come into this letter and encounter that word is going to color their experience. Now, what he says here is we must then meditate on the things that make our happiness, seeing that when that is with us, we have all. But when it is absent, we do all to win it. So my assumption here, it's been a while since I've read this letter. My assumption is that the things that make our happiness is precisely the things that we're going to get into here as we go through the letter. That would be my response. And Joshua, what I would add to that, this goes back to what we've been discussing already. Who is Menorchius and what is the purpose of this letter? Is Menorchius someone who has been familiar with Epicurean philosophy, in which case Epicurus is just providing a summary and he's expecting Menorchius to know the relationship between happiness and pleasure in Epicurean philosophy? Or is Menorchius somebody who's brand new to the subject? And is just some random Athenian who has been reading Plato and Aristotle all his life and has an understanding of eudaimonia based on them, but he does not know how Epicurus links pleasure to happiness. So really, it, we've been discussing it, but, but Calasini's done a really good job of raising this issue again. You can pull this letter out and read it for the first time and read this paragraph. As a new person, you can read it with absolutely no context whatsoever, or as an experienced Epicurean, you can read it with a lot of context of, of background of what Epicurus has been saying previously. And the analogy that I run into in my personal life in terms of law is that you're supposed to take into account all of the context that you can find in understanding something, and that it's a major error to take things out of context and not incorporate everything else that you should know about Epicurus. And so really coming to sort of a resolution of that perspective is really, really important, or at least to an understanding of what the issue is. Because the one thing I would quibble with in what Calasini said probably is that I think she said something to the effect that everyone understands happiness is a feeling. I don't know that everyone understands anything, frankly, after going through all this philosophy. Everyone has a different opinion about everything. And happiness to one person is entirely different than happiness to another person. He's a happy man in a religious sense, means that he's communing with God and in touch with God's will and living the life of preparation for heaven and so forth. That makes the man happy in a religious perspective. Or the Stoics, even though the modern Stoics seem to just ignore what the old Stoics said, even the ancient Stoics, I'm sure, understood the word eudaimonia. And they no doubt used it in certain contexts. But the goal of Stoicism in the ancient world was virtue, very clearly, and, and not eudaimonia no matter what the modern Stoics will say as their own goal. So the issue of what is happiness 
is so critical to the question that we're discussing. And what's the passage that I always go back to on Diogenes of Oinoander is that fragment 32, where he says, if gentlemen, the pointed issue between these people and us involved inquiry into what is the means of happiness, and they wanted to say the virtues, which would actually be true, it would be unnecessary to take any other step than to agree with them about this without more ado. But since, as I say, the issue is not what is the means of happiness, but, quote, what is happiness and what is the ultimate goal of our nature, unquote, I say both now and always, shouting loudly to all Greeks and non-Greeks, that pleasure is the end of the best mode of life, while the virtues, which are inopportunely messed about by these people, being transferred from the place of the means to that of the end, are in no way an end, but the means to the end. Let us therefore now state that this is true, making it our starting point. And I think we could go back into Torquatus and pull out basically the same thing, that a life of happiness is a life of pleasure. Now, those are things that people who have studied Epicurus will understand as to the Epicurean position. But somebody who just decides when they're 50 years old, they need to read a little bit about Epicurus. They go to Wikipedia. They read that the letter to Minoseus is the most important letter on ethics. They pick it up. They read this first paragraph. They see that the goal is happiness. Well, they don't have a clue at that point as to the relationship between happiness and pleasure from the Epicurean perspective. So this issue of integrating context is everything in this discussion. And we're going to run into this time and time and time again as we go through the letter. Are the words that he's using colloquial, loose interpretations of a word like eudaimonia or happiness? Or are they stated in the context of Epicurean philosophy? Maybe the best example of this is when Epicurus starts talking about gods, which we'll start talking about next week. He clearly has his own view of what a god is, and, and his definition of a god becomes so different than what we think of a god being that it gets very confusing. When we read about Epicurus believing in gods, we think that means he believes in Yahweh or Allah or somebody else who's supernatural and, and very specific. But the type of gods that Epicurus is holding to exist are very different than those. So you've got a whole series of words, and Cicero specifically, I believe, has recorded that he criticized Epicurus for using words in a non-standard way. So that's evidence that Epicurus clearly was using words with his own explanations of what they mean, and virtue is another one that would have that same contextual difference. So what Calcini has raised is probably one of the most important questions that people have to think about as they read through this letter. If they read through this letter on a superficial modern day context, and they just presume that everything is exactly in front of them and that everything in Epicurean philosophy is contained in this letter, they're going to come out with a very different understanding than if they have read the Lucretius's on the nature of things. And if they've read the letter to Herodotus and the letter to Pythocles and the detail that's in Diogenes Laertius, there's a difference between a sort of an academic who has studied all these things and made a career of it versus a normal everyday person who doesn't have the time to read all that. So this is a huge, huge issue. So I don't think we can <laughs> expect to resolve the question of happiness right now today, but it's certainly something that we'll need to come back to, I think, again and again and again as we go through this letter. But maybe just to move on here to sort of the meat of the passage, just about everything that we're looking at today, I think, has to do with when in life is it appropriate to begin the study of happiness? I guess I'm not aware of, of any sort of entrenched opinion on this that Epicurus might be pushing back against. He talks about it so much, doesn't he, that it almost seems like there must have been this idea prevalent in ancient Greek that, oh, that philosophy, that's only for, you know, young people while they're in school. Or that philosophy, that's that's only good for uh, old people after they've retired. I don't know which of those two views it would have been, but certainly he seems to be concerned about something that was going on in Athens in the third century, because he's really pushing back hard against this. And of course, we know that he began studying philosophy himself at a very early age and apparently began to articulate his own system before the age of about 30, I think. So where do we fall on this? Do we think that there was a tendency in ancient Greece to 
push philosophy as something that is fit for people to study in old age. That's kind of the view I have in my mind of, you know, Rasputin with a beard down to his knees or whatever. And in Homer, it's typically the wiser people are always the oldest people present. And sometimes even they're old and they begin to go blind. And there's this idea in Greek culture that it's the blind who can truly see. So is it he's trying to get people to study philosophy when they're young and all throughout their lives, not just when they're old. That's the impression I have of it. Does anyone else have a different take on that? Uh, not necessarily, because uh, at least at that time, it was very common that young people would go to to pick a teacher and learn philosophy in young age. Uh, so Epicurus did the same thing. And so Socrates had a lot of pupils like that. You're absolutely right, Martin. And then so I wonder, do people... As they get old, do they just, you know, well, now I've got a family. Now I've got, you know, my business to attend to. I've got work around the house. Maybe I've got a political career to worry about. And and philosophy is something that I'll push off until retirement. Is that the problem that he's addressing? He puts it in so stark terms here at the very beginning of the letter. You know, there's just this assertion out of nowhere. It makes me think that there's something cultural that he's pushing back against. Maybe I'm totally wrong about that, though. I, I, I guess I don't know. Josh, you've raised a couple of issues there that I would comment on. I think you're clearly right that a significant number of people have the idea that philosophy is something for old people to do. So there's this book called Constellation of Philosophy. It's like once you're an old person and you're about to die, you want some justification for what you've done. So you go reading the philosophers to try to get some comfort because you know you can't do the things you want to do anymore. So you're just trying to get some comfort at the end of your life. And so you postpone studying philosophy until you're old. Obviously, Epicurus thinks that's wrong. And you've got, I think somebody's mentioned Torquatus, the, the ending of the section we often talk about has Torquatus saying, no, Epicurus was not uneducated. The real Philistines are those who ask us to go on studying till old age, the subjects we ought to have been ashamed and not to have learned in boyhood. So I think the direct answer to your question, when do you start philosophy? It's like, what is it? When do you, when do you start talking? Three, two or three years old, right? Immediately immediately from uh, early age to, to the end. But you've also raised the issue of pushing back against something. And there's a lot of references to Epicurus's attitude of rejecting the standard Greek philosophy of his time. I know DeWitt talks a lot about this. Isn't there one of, one of the fragments is something about set sail from every form of education and flee it or something? And that's the only part of the formula, but that's the only part I remember right now. And and then there's the one about, I congratulate you on learning philosophy, not for Greece, but for something else, but for your own benefit or something like that. And there's a lot that you can construct about Epicurus's rejection of the, I guess the way it's summarized often is that the common Greek education of his time was oriented towards raising a good citizen soldier to support the state, which is that reference probably to learning philosophy for Greece. And what Epicurus was doing was attempting to teach people how to live happy lives, which is a very different approach and a lot, very different series of skills that you need to live happily versus to be a good citizen soldier. So he says, wherefore, both when young and old, a man must study philosophy, that as he grows old, he may be young in blessings through the grateful recollection of what has been. And then youth, he may be old as well, since he will know no fear of what is to come. As I read that, one of those things that jumps out at me there, the, the grateful recollection of what has been, being memory of past happiness, past pleasant experiences, that's something that seems to separate him, perhaps from the Cyreniacs about they always wanted to be just experiencing pleasure in the now. And what Epicurus is talking about here is memories of past pleasures. And also when he talks about no fear of what is to come, that's a kind of a way of saying a confident expectation of continuance of your pleasures and your happiness up to the day at least on which you die. But the philosophy is being used to buttress and support and convince you and to let you understand that you're responsible for your happiness, not only through just rotating from one banquet to another, but to use your mind to understand 
mental pleasures and to offset problems that you may have. And the point really here is you're responsible for your happiness. You can't do it without mentally being on top of the things that are happening to you. And you cannot do it successfully, even do that, without a philosophy that gives you an understanding of the best way to do it and the understanding that you can be successful in it, that you're not controlled by supernatural gods and you're not destined to terrible things by fate, that you have the ability to use philosophy to pursue a happy life. Time for somebody else. I'm pausing in case Colasini or Martin have anything yeah. to say. While they're thinking, let me just say that I, I totally agree with the angle that you're taking on this. It's very clear that Epicurus is talking to everyone. He wants everyone to study philosophy, and you've isolated happiness as being the thing that he wants people to study philosophy for. It's not so that you can become a good soldier. It's not so that you can become a good statesman. It's not so you can become a scholar. It's not so you can start your own school necessarily. You can do any of those things, but it's for finding the best way to live. And for Epicurus, that seems to have centered around this idea of happiness. And we'll have to continue to explore that idea. But I think you've done a great job, Cassius, of, of isolating the main point there. Maybe while here, let me get a full quote in here. This is Vatican saying number 76. You kind of hinted at it. Let me get it into the record. He says, as you grow old, you are such as I urge you to be. And you have recognized the difference between studying philosophy for yourself and studying it for Greece. I rejoice with you. It's a notoriously thorny saying or maxim, partially because we don't understand what it means to study philosophy for yourself, and we don't understand what it means to study philosophy for Greece. But it might have something to do, Cassius, with what you're saying about the citizen soldier and that ideal. And Epicurus seems to be not necessarily rejecting that completely, but he seems to be trying to chart another path. That would be my take on it. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I, I don't think he's rejecting it completely either. I know there's another fragment of in Diogenes Laertius' life when he has a list of criticisms of these other philosophers against Aristotle and different other philosophers. I think there's a group that he calls enemies of Hellas. So I guess I cite that just for the point that I think Epicurus was an Athenian. He was a Greek and he was loyal to Greece. And apparently he participated, he would have himself when he was younger been a soldier. And there's just no reason to think that he was not a loyal citizen of Athens in virtually every way, but that's not the ultimate goal of life, to be a loyal citizen of Athens. He's always drilling down, I think. He's trying to be logically rigorous and consistent. And I'll say this at this point. I remember I didn't learn very much philosophy when I was in college, but I remember one thing my professor said about the ancient Greeks was that one of their characteristics was that they did not take for granted that they knew what the goal was. They didn't take for granted that they knew what good was or what they should be trying to do with their lives. They were examining everything from scratch. So I do think that that is a characteristic that is, is probably true. And so when they say something like happiness is the goal, they're really not saying it superficially. They have this context of constantly fighting with each other about what is the right goal? Is it piety to the gods? Is it virtue? Is it pleasure? They always seem to be on the march to do the best they can to justify a final conclusion about what is their ultimate goal. Let me try to get a different angle on this. Let's talk a little bit maybe about what the problems are today. This comes to my mind because we have this guy that just started at work yesterday or two days ago or something. And I found that he was very interested in philosophy and had read quite a lot about it. And I guess, you know, we all have different experiences. We all have different paths that we've taken to get where we are today. Maybe I'll just go around the room, as it were, and just ask people, you know, about the people in their life. What do you think the people in your life have to say about philosophy? I know when I was in college, people sort of mocked philosophy. They thought that majoring in philosophy was like the ultimate waste of time, even more useless than an English degree, which is what I have. But maybe that's just something to talk about for a little bit, because Martin has had a very different life experience to Colosini. Colosini has had a very different life experience to me. And we've all had a very different life experience, probably Cassius to you. And so maybe someone can jump in here and talk a little bit about the people in their life and how they view philosophy. What is philosophy for? Is it for 
understanding the universe? Is it for appearing to be smart? Is it for what I think Socrates's dictum was gnothi seoton, know thyself? Maybe this is a time to talk a little bit about the people in your life. And so does anyone want to take the bait on that question? Yeah, actually, before I answer that question, I do want to interject that I noticed between the Bailey version and the Hicks version, there's a slightly different wording when it comes to, for example, it says in the Bailey version, study of philosophy or to study philosophy, whereas Hicks says to seek wisdom. And then I also have for the St. Andre translation, it says to love and practice wisdom. So as far as the word philosophy, it has sort of a stuffy meaning to me, like some kind of old and dusty thing that's related to history and just sounds sort of oppressive to me. But then when I hear the word wisdom, like for the Hicks version where it says to seek wisdom, then that has more meaning to me. And then also with the St. Andre, to love and practice wisdom. And as for my own background, well, I was raised Christian, so there's some sense of wisdom being an important thing, but it's pretty much downplayed, I would say, in Christianity. Then later I studied Buddhism, and so wisdom is very important in Buddhism because it's really about how you live your life. What kind of choices do you make? What actions do you take? Even down to your thoughts, like, are you thinking wisely? Because your actions are going to come out of your thoughts. So that's a really good question about how this applies to each of us. Okay, so, so just let you discuss the different translations. So let me add, give, give something like my own literal translation from the German translation I have, which is again a bit different. No? So the, the, after the greeting, the letter starts, neither shall, who is still young, hesitate to philosophize, nor who is already an old person, get tired to philosophize. So here they don't use the word philosophy, but rather emphasize the action to philosophize. And I don't think that the action of doing this has this idea of it's something for old professors and no one else. Doesn't the word philosophy just mean lover of wisdom? Yeah, yes, it does. Right. Martin, let me follow up on that because, okay, there was a German translation of Lucretius and the introduction or preface to this translation was written by Albert Einstein. Now, everybody knows who Albert Einstein was, or at least they have an image of him in his head. And they know a few quotes from the Internet that are probably wrong because everyone likes to say that Albert Einstein said or did things that he didn't do. But everybody knows who Albert Einstein is and what he accomplished. What's the state of things in Cologne, Martin, or in Thailand, where you've worked extensively? Do people talk about philosophy? Do they pursue philosophy? Are they interested in philosophy? the way they're interested maybe in Albert Einstein? A few people only. So in Thailand, in all of Thailand, I met only one person uh, who would be interested in the philosophy and one person who was seriously interested in Buddhism. And not two, no, no I have two. No. So, so only a few, even a few people only who are really fully into Buddhism in the way that they really go into the depth study it like philosophy. Whereas the vast majority of people I know they are up to this, who go every few days to the temple because someone died and they will attend some funeral, right? But that's about it. There, there is no other, not, not, not much else about Buddhism there. No? And of course, it's a lot of political abuse to have this Buddhism installed as a way uh, the state uh, should be, plus a monarchy so that the rich can exploit the poor, as a poor, and it keeps going like that. That's a good point. And of course, in Germany, Germany's got this wonderful, rich history of philosophy. Does the man on the street in Germany, does he philosophize? Is that something you see people doing or encounter people doing? No, not at all. I, I think the problem there is, that most of these famous German philosophy is just pomp. So, so I mean, it's it's basically <laughs> uh, Hegel there, yeah, which has been bloated up. So, so it, it's a big ball of nothing. And I think it's completely normal that people do not care about philosophy when they think of Hegel. Actually, as a, gr a growing up, I was very interested in philosophy. Then I read Hegel on my own without guidance, and I thought philosophy is bullshit. I'm not going into this. No? So and only by trying <laughs> later on here and there again, and especially then later on after I, as a 
philosophy of science caught my interest, I gradually got again into philosophy. So this very famous branch of German philosophy is just nonsense and counterproductive. That's a good point. So I kind of have the same experience. But of course, I'm also a citizen of the internet, in a sense. And what we have talked a little bit about on the podcast is this renaissance of stoicism uh, on the internet, particularly if I can uh, stereotype people a little bit here, particularly among younger, formerly Christian men. That's my experience with stoicism. And it's funny because, of course, you know, when Christians hear about the rising or the sort of the fall in religious rates, they say that, you know, well, if you believe in nothing, then everything is permitted. And it turns out, no, America's youth is <laughs> is flocking to stoicism so they can learn about virtue without the God bit involved. But I very, very rarely, in fact, almost never do I encounter people who think that philosophy is a way to learn about themselves and to learn about human happiness and how we should pursue it. And the only the only way that I see people in my life even approaching the idea of philosophy is through what we might call self-help books. And that's about it. And even then, that's a very, very short list of people I know. But in America, there's also this thing that, uh, at least when you read about it, apparently stoicism is pushed by the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, at least several of them. I couldn't give names, but they show off as stoics. No? Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Let me comment on that. Yes, that's a big point. And it really irritates these people who are pursuing Stoicism. There are some on the internet who follow the history and get back into the original meaning of Stoicism as the pursuit of virtue. What I observe a lot of these people, this, this is the example I think we've already used in this podcast about the Stoics think that they also are pursuing happiness. They understand that there's a virtue involved in Stoicism that they have to come to grips with. But that's what we see so many people come into the Epicurean discussions from who have been in Stoicism in the past is that these modern people are attracted to Stoicism because it's promoted that Stoicism has these rules of thinking and these techniques for overcoming adversity. And that's going to lead them to a state of happiness in a way that, as, as Calisini was mentioning, everybody has a sort of an underlying view of what they think happiness is. Most of these people who are reading in Stoicism think that, oh, this is just a set of techniques for becoming happy. And it's not. It was not intended that way. It was not set up that way. It was, a, at the very least, pseudo-religious point of view of coming into tune with the divine creators of the universe and that the divine creators of the universe have set up this thing called virtue. And that's what stoicism is all about. Joshua is right. I do think that if, if you were to look around and try to categorize what are the up and coming interesting philosophies to younger people, who is the Canadian guy I'm trying to think of? Uh, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Jordan Peterson. No further description of him is probably needed for most of our American audience anyway. But there are people like him who are associated with a vaguely stoic point of view. And it's just infuriating to me. And it kind of goes back with what Cicero used to complain about the Epicureans, that you can't talk about Epicurean philosophy in the Senate or in the camp because it's just not a manly thing to do to talk about pleasure. And that's sort of a subtext of all, so much that we talk about. But I just think that's absolutely not true. And that if these younger people, these younger men you're talking about, Joshua, if they want to be fighters, they need to go back and look at the examples of, of Cassius Longinus and the different Epicureans and even Brutus himself in the Roman Civil War. Brutus was not a Stoic. He was much more of a Platonist than he was a Stoic. And there's a lot of good material about that. The point of it is, is in terms of being a, an active person in life, if these younger people are looking for a philosophy of being an active, strong, creative, thoughtful, and focused person. It's Epicurus who set up the system from the very beginning, aligning the different observations about science and epistemology and physics and coming up with the logical conclusions about what does engagement with the world really lead to. Engagement with the world leads to the philosophy of Epicurus by understanding the nature of the world 
and not going off into these fantasies of religion, suppression of emotion that the Stoics are into. The point being that it is very frustrating to think about how Stoicism is popular, but what we see in discussing Epicurus on the internet is once people today dig into Stoicism, find out that the roots of it are not to pursue happiness and to pursue a life of fulfillment in that way. They often and hopefully will continue to come over and start reading Epicurus and they find that Epicurus is much more what they thought they're looking for in the first place instead of being slandered as the word hedonism is one that carries so much baggage to it. And that's not what Epicurus is about. I think we got discussing that because we were not necessarily discussing happiness at that point. We were discussing the word philosophy and what the word philosophy means, because it's not clear to people really what philosophy is in the first place. I mean, we talk about Epicurean philosophy as the unifying thing about what we're doing. But the philosophy, like Calassini has said, is a stuffy old person's term that younger people don't understand to be something that they need themselves. And explaining to people what philosophy is and the need for it is also one of the first threshold problems that we face. Because it is basically a matter of loving wisdom, which just simply means pursuing the truth. I was just going to add something here at the end. I've been sort of doing a close reading of Romeo and Juliet, trying to tease out some of its Epicurean influences, and I think it's rife with it. But there's an interesting passage where Mercutio is killed by Tybalt, and Romeo had tried to step between them, and then Tybalt put his sword under Romeo's arm, and that's how he managed to kill Mercutio. And Mercutio dies, Tybalt flees, and then Romeo goes into this soliloquy about how love has unmanned him. And that seems to be Mm -hmm. so much at the heart of this stoic renaissance that we've been talking about. And it it was the same in the ancient world, you know, that, you know, why is it that so many people from other schools will leave those schools for Epicurus, but no Epicureans are found to abandon that school for Stoicism or Peripateticism or anything like that? And the response was, you can make a man into a eunuch, but you can't make a eunuch into a man. And so much of this renaissance of Stoicism seems to me to be tied up into issues of masculinity and Epicureanism to these people, at least doesn't seem to come out favorably in that view. But it'd be a shame to put off your own happiness in order to put on a good show or uh, I, I don't know. It just seems it seems deeply unfulfilling to me. But these people, Joshua, have bought into the idea that there's a necessary conflict between emotion and logic or reason or strength or virtue. They think that emotion, pleasure, feeling, that feeling is inferior to reason, to logic, to to just communing with God, to virtue in the abstract. They think that pleasure and feeling are lowly things to be avoided. And not only to be avoided, the Stoics are not just neutral towards happiness. They think that Pleasure and happiness are distractions from the goal of being virtuous. So they see pleasure and emotion and feeling as enemies. And Epicurus is very clear that he takes a different position. But the important thing to say is not that just Epicurus disagrees with that, but I think Epicurus proves them wrong. Because when you think about it, why do you do anything in life but for the reward of the feeling that you get from it? And these Stoics, you can stack up any of these guys that you want to in terms of their goals. If they want to say that love of country is what they want to do, well, then they're doing what they're doing because of the feeling of love of country that they get from what they're doing. Nobody in his right mind does anything because it's painful. They do it, as as Torquatus talks in that narrative, they do it because it brings a reward in terms of feeling of satisfaction or feeling of accomplishment or feeling of pride or any of the feelings that these people who are looking into Stoicism are pursuing. If they get into Stoicism, they'll realize that the Stoics say it's wrong to pursue those things. They'll say that all of the satisfaction and emotional re- reward that these people are looking for is explicitly denounced in Stoicism as an obstruction and as a suppression of the path to virtue. And so it's frustrating. But that's, I think, the goal that we should have is to, to understand this. Again, not just because Epicurus said it, and, and we say that Epicurus is a smart guy, and so by his authority, people should accept it. But if they listen to his argument, they will understand that his argument 
arguments make perfect sense and that what they're doing in pursuing stoicism and pursuing these other goals that don't really have a concrete objective is just nonsense. Well, I think we've had an excellent episode today, especially with the contributions from Calasini, which have been great today, and I'm sure will be helpful in the future as well. But this has been sort of an introduction into the background of this first passage, 122 from the letter to Menasius, Menorchius, Menisius, however you like to say it. (laughs) And so what we've traditionally done as we come to the end, we try to go around the table and talk about our closing observations from what we've discussed today or just anything we want to say to summarize at the end of the episode. So we've traditionally started with Martin. Martin, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah to cut this short, I have nothing else to add to this. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, what we've also learned over time is that nobody has the ability to prolong by going off in a new direction that's really important and has to be pursued more so than Joshua does. So maybe we should go to Calasini next. Calasini, again, thank you for being with us today. We look forward to having you in the future. And do you have any closing thoughts for today's episode? Well, first off, yes, thank you for letting me be a part of this because I am super excited about the letter to Menesius. And I particularly enjoy the ethics aspect of Epicureanism. And in some ways, this segment here that we've been covering, it does bring up more questions for me because in my notes here that I took briefly, there's just questions again about what is happiness? What is philosophy? What is wisdom? It's almost like you can't really come to a final answer on those things. It's something that you might have to continually ponder as you go forward in life, that there's no end to those questions. So this has been very interesting. Very good. Thank you very much. Joshua. I was going to try and keep it short today, actually. (laughs) Just a couple things. It's so pleasing to me to be into a letter that is just rife with interest in every paragraph. I think we did the best we could on the letter to Pythocles. I think it turned out better than maybe I thought it was going to actually, but it's such a pleasure to get into a letter like this where there's too much content to talk about. Great to be here today. And most of all, Colosini, welcome to the podcast. It's been very good to have you. And uh, hopefully we continue to have access to your insights. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, the point that I would close on, we brought up some very important issues today. The point that I would emphasize in closing is I do think that there are common dangers in the study of Epicurus, just like there's common dangers in the study of the Stoics, that when you go out there onto the Internet and you read the modern Stoic positions on things, in many, many cases, you really don't get the authentic original positions that the Stoics were taking because they had in their philosophy, they were oriented towards an understanding of a prime mover, God, divine fire creating the universe. And so everything in their system ultimately unwinds from that orientation of a creation period and a creator and a higher level of existence, which has established mankind and tells us what to do. And so the modern Stoics really gloss over that, and you don't get that full picture unless you really dig into the philosophy. I think we have something similar going on in Epicurus as well. You go out to the internet, read Wikipedia on the letter to Menesius and his ethics, and you'll read some very general commentary about Epicurus's interest in pleasure, his interest in happiness, his interest in tranquility, his formulations of the feelings and discussions of absence of pain and so forth. And it's tempting and very easy to take a sort of superficial understanding away from that discussion. And it's really necessary to go back into the full context of what Epicurus was teaching, which we have through Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, which we have through a variety of other sources that are not as well known to most students of Epicurus. And so just as Calasini has said, you have to think carefully about what philosophy means. You have to think carefully about what wisdom means. You have to think carefully about what happiness means, eudaimonia. All of these key terms, when you start reading about ataraxia and aponia, you've got to translate these things into your own language and make them your own, so to speak, in terms of understanding exactly what they mean. Because if you don't get that understanding, then you'll miss a lot of the depth of Epicurean philosophy. And and that's what he keeps over and over 
telling you to do is that you have to study these things, study nature, study physics, study epistemology, and not just take things on authority. Epicurus himself, he did not take things on authority, and he's not teaching that you should take things just because he said them. You have to understand why he said them, and you can't understand why he said them unless you go deep and study these things and talk to other people who are also studying. If you just read them on your own and you get that superficial impression, then that's when people just move on to some other philosophy and just add it to their bookshelf and add it to their collection of a hundred other eclectic philosophies and move on. The purpose of EpicureanFriends.com and the things we do with the forum and the podcast is to provide a place and an environment where people who are generally oriented in the same direction can study these things together and go into that deeper understanding than you can get from just reading a couple of paragraphs on Wikipedia. So, okay, I think that's probably a good place to stop for today. So thanks to everybody for listening. We invite you to come by the forum where we have threads on this episode and every episode to discuss these things during the week. And we will be back in another week. So with that, let's close for the day. Thanks, everybody. And we'll come back next week. Talk to you soon. Welcome to episode 135 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean texts, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself. And we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we continue our discussion of Epicurus' letter to Minoseus. This week we tackle the issue of the Epicurean gods. Now let's join Martin reading today's text. The things which I use unceasingly to commend to you, these do in practice, considering them to be the first principles of the good life. First of all, believe that God is a being immortal and blessed, even as the common idea of a God is engraved on men's minds, and do not assign to him anything alien to his immortality or ill-suited to his blessedness but believe about him everything that can uphold his blessedness and immortality. For gods there are, since the knowledge of them is by clear vision, but they are not such as the many believe them to be. For indeed, they do not consistently represent them as they believe them to be. And the impious man is not he who popularly denies the gods of the many, but he who attaches to the gods the beliefs of the many. For the statements of the many about the gods are not conceptions derived from sensation, but false suppositions according to which the greatest misfortunes befall the wicked and the greatest blessings the good by the gift of the gods. For men, being accustomed always to their own virtues, welcome those like themselves, but regard all that is not of their nature as alien. Okay, Martin, thank you for reading that for us this morning. We are going to tackle today one of the thorniest issues in Epicurean philosophy, And that is the issue of the existence and the nature of the Epicurean gods. There's also involved in this section as well an interesting reference in 124 to the issue of conceptions derived from sensation. As Bailey translates it, immediately when I was listening to Martin read that, most people translate that word as preconceptions 
or anticipations. And so the discussion of that is something we'll probably hit on some today, but I suggest we probably won't spend as much time on that as we'll talk about just the most important issues of the natures of the gods. We also will want to talk to the extent we have time about how we get this information and clearly the anticipations and preconceptions or prolepsis, whatever words you want to use, are relevant to that. There's many, many controversies in Epicurean philosophy about what Epicurus was really saying about the nature of the gods. But before we get into the issues that are more heatedly debated and are much more speculative, I think it would be of most benefit to the listeners to the podcast to talk about the basics that everybody agrees on about what Epicurus is saying. What we're talking about here is material that's in principle doctrine number one. It's probably one of the most important issues in Epicurean philosophy is man's relationship to gods. And we want to make sure we hit the basic points before we get lost in the weeds of things that are very difficult to resolve. Because there are very many clear things that he's saying here and clear implications about how people should live. And it makes the most sense for us to be sure we cover those before we get off into the issues that are somewhat lost to us because we don't have as much documentation as we would like to have. We are listing in the thread for this episode a lot of additional information beyond what we're talking about today in the letter to Menaceus. There's also, of course, the principal doctrine number one. There are many references in other parts of Epicurean philosophy to the gods, including one that people don't necessarily read a lot, but one of the lengthiest descriptions of Epicurean theory on gods is contained in Cicero's book on the nature of the gods. There is a long section by the speaker's name is given as Valeus, who not only attacks the Platonic and other views existing at the time about the nature of the gods, but gives a lot of information that's really not available from other sources to us today about what Epicurus's view really was. Some very interesting theories. There's a word called isonomia that is listed in here and how the gods are are related to the issue of images. And, And one thing that's very counterintuitive is how he says that the images flow to the gods as opposed to flowing from the gods to us. There's many issues in on the nature of the gods that could be explored as well. Then there's Epicurus's riddle that everybody knows about to some extent. And there are references in Diogenes of Ornoander's inscription on the wall that are also relevant. And we'll try to cover as much as we can, again, to bring it down to a focus. Epicurean theology, I think everybody will agree, starts with the premise that there are no supernatural gods, that any gods that exist are natural parts of the universe. They're composed of atoms just like everything else in the universe is. And so before we get off into the parts that are difficult, there's a lot of basic material here that we can contrast against Christianity, Judaism, Islam, other mainstream religions of today to sort of set the stage about where Epicurus fits in the great scheme of comparison of those views. So let's try to start off about that because he says, first of all, believe that a god is a being immortal and blessed, even as the common idea of a god is engraved on men's minds. Who wants to start? Well, I might just start with that first sentence, because we did talk quite a lot last week about how the introduction in this letter is quite different from what we saw in the letter to Pythocles and the letter to Herodotus. And we didn't get much of an introduction here, but we do get a little bit more in this first sentence. He says, The things which I used unceasingly to commend to you, these do and practice, considering them to be the first principles of the good life. And so there does seem to be some connection between Epicurus and Minoikius, more than maybe we imagined in the last episode, given the very terse introduction. So this is apparently part of a thread of conversations that goes back in time, and we don't know how far, but I think it's the case in this letter, as in all of the letters, that he's not just speaking to Minoikius here. Epicurus used his letters as a way to address not just individuals, but whole communities in cities that he couldn't be everywhere at once to expound his philosophy. And so letters are a means for him to address communities, much in the way that St. Paul would later come to use his letters. And by later, I mean about three or four centuries later. 
And then there's that, again, the goal, we talked a lot about happiness, and here he describes it as the good life, which doesn't give us a whole lot more to work on. But it's clear from this that we're not looking for just a way to put off the misery, as you might find in Marcus Aurelius, for example, who's shrouded by commitments and duties and obligations. As emperor, he's far away from home on the warpath when he's writing his meditations. And he really seems to be in that book just looking for a way to get himself out of bed in the morning. That's not the image that we get from Epicurus. And that's not what he suggests to the people he's writing to. He's writing to Minoikius because he wants him to live a good life, whatever we decide that means. And he thinks that he's found a way through his philosophy to allow Minoikius and others like him to find their way to that good life, which otherwise might be very difficult. Joshua, I would follow on with what you just said by emphasizing again that, yes, he's telling readers of this letter that these are the first principles of a good life. And I don't think that when you say, I'm going to give you a list of principles of the good life, and I'm going to give you this one first, that's a means of emphasis. I don't think he's saying, once you understand it, you can forget about it. I think he's saying that it's important for you to regularly be thinking about these things that are the principles of good life and applying them. And even though you're going to apply his statements about the gods in a way that allows you to not worry that they're going to destroy your life or control your life, that doesn't mean that you just file it away on a bookshelf after you understand the point. One of the things that to me is important here is that Epicurean theology is an integral part of the philosophy and not just necessarily as an antidote to a particular pain. It's something that is part of what you're going to be thinking about on a regular basis. Yeah. And of course, some people may remember from the last episode that he immediately precedes this sentence by saying that neither when young nor when old should you put off the study of philosophy. And so that seems to me to be just what you're saying there, Cassius, which is that the right time is always now to study philosophy. You need to have an understanding of how to approach the idea of the gods at all times. It's not just something that you learn once and then don't think about anymore. And probably as you continue to think about it, your understanding or your idea is going to change a little bit over time. And I think a little bit later on in this episode, we're going to get into some of the different ideas that people have about the gods and perhaps more interestingly, some of the different ideas that Epicureans had about the nature of the gods. Right. So let's dig into the specifics by going into that next sentence where he says, first of all, believe that a God is a being immortal and blessed. And then he repeats that at the end of the sentence by saying, do not assign to him anything alien to his immortality or ill suited to his blessedness, but believe about him everything that can uphold his blessedness and immortality. So if this translation from Bailey is correct, there's three separate statements here that the major attributes of a God are number one, immortality, and number two, blessedness. Now, Blessedness is not a word that we probably have a very specific meaning of in our mind. But to go back to what I said at the very beginning, I think we should emphasize that if the primary characteristics of a god are immortality, deathlessness, and then blessedness, he's not listing omnipotence. He's not listing omniscience. He's not listing these other attributes that we in the modern world, influenced by Christianity and monotheism, by Abrahamism, that we attribute now to God. Epicurus's work in the Greek context of the way the Greeks thought about Zeus and the other gods at that particular time, he's simply saying that the major characteristics of gods are their ability to avoid death and their blessedness. So we can wipe out of our minds from an Epicurean point of view the idea that God created the universe, the idea that God created mankind, that God put Earth in the center of the universe as the central focus of his plan. We can put it out of our mind that God knows everything, that God has his finger in everything, that he knows the number of feathers on the back of the sparrow, that he determines everything from the beginning of time. 
that he predestines man to certain things. Now, we'll deal with heaven and hell next week, but we can put aside all of those things that we most commonly associate with the idea of a God from this Epicurean perspective. Does anybody disagree with that or have any subtlety to express on that? Does this opening passage here not basically wipe away most of what the modern world thinks in terms of what a God is? Is it fair to infer from this description in 123 and 124 that the gods of Epicurus are very, very different from what we think of in the monotheistic perspective? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. And there's basically two lines of evidence for this. One of them is the writings of Epicurus himself, like the letter that we're reading now. The other line of evidence is the pushback that he got from his contemporaries and from later thinkers and writers about his view of the gods. This isn't like one of the things that you have going on, particularly in the United States, is the Temple of Satan or the the Church of Satan, who will Anytime you've got this issue of the Ten Commandments going up on a government property, they want to put their Baphomet statue up because they're trying to illustrate that free speech is not the exclusive domain of Christians, that it should apply to everybody. But this is quite a combative and argumentative way to approach things. I'm not passing judgment on whether it's right or wrong, but Epicurus is not necessarily taking that approach. He's certainly offering a very very different view of the gods and what they are and what they're like, what their nature is. But he presents it in terms that are so mild. And so it's almost hard to argue with them here. But of course, people did. Maybe we should talk for just a minute about this word blessed. If somebody were trying to argue with this presentation, they might say that, well, he says gods are blessed and that means gods uh, have supernatural powers. I think that's probably not a fair reading of the word blessed to, to suggest that it means anything more than just sort of perfectly happy. Yeah, I think you're right about that. The Greek word is makarion. And I was just looking uh, to see where else that pops up, but I don't really have the time to do that right now. Yeah, we can get Um, that in the thread. And as he's describing that, when he says immortal and blessed, we do have another reference to this issue of the preconceptions. The phrase is, quote, even as the common idea of a God is engraved on men's minds. Now, that is likely a reference to what is discussed in the Valais material of On the Nature of the Gods. Again, trying to postpone the discussion of controversies until we cover the major points, the idea of whether the common idea of a God is engraved on men's minds and the idea of whether we have preconceptions or anticipations about them or whether we actually can determine things about gods from the receipt of images, which we've discussed a little bit in the past, but is also relevant to the God situation. The sources of our evidence about the gods are something we should defer, but the bottom line is that he is saying very firmly that gods are immortal and that they are blessed. He's not giving any other attribute to them other than that. Let me take the word blessed here because we've been trying in the last episode, the word we were dealing with was happiness or eudaimonia. In the first part of this text, we're dealing with the good life and then we get blessedness. These to me are all wrapped up in basically one identity. The good life, according to Epicurus, to my understanding, is a life of blessedness. And if you could attain the kind of life that he imagines the gods to live, that would be not just the good life, but the best life. And so a blessed life is the best life, or it is supreme happiness or supreme eudaimonia. That's the life of the gods, to my understanding. Okay, and I have a feeling maybe the best way to do this is just to talk at least a brief period about each of these sentences and then reserve at the end for our excursion into controversies. The next sentence says, for gods there are since knowledge of them is by clear vision, but they are not such as the many believe them to be, for they do not consistently represent them as they believed them to be. And the impious man is not he who popularly denies the gods of the many, but he who attaches to the gods the beliefs of the many. When I read the sentence, for gods there are, since the knowledge of them is by clear vision, 
the immediate question I want to ask is, do you have a clear vision that the gods exist? <laughs> That's the question I want to ask, but I, Cassius, I don't know if you want to get to that yet. That's the statement that Epicurus is making here. He says, for gods there are. Now, there are many people today, many people who consider themselves Epicureans, who would take issue with that language. For gods there are, since the knowledge of them is by clear vision. Does that represent your experience with the gods? Do you see them by clear vision or do you understand them to be by clear vision? So let's go ahead and talk about for gods there are since knowledge of them is by clear vision and just stay with that sentence for just a moment. Presumably it relates to what's said in 124 as well. Let's go ahead and just talk about the things that seem to be the evidence parts of these two issues. He says, for gods there are since knowledge of them is by clear vision. That is a statement about how we get evidence of the gods. Then the next two sentences are really probably not evidence statements. But then 124 says, for the statements of the many about the gods are not conceptions or preconceptions derived from sensation, but false suppositions. And then he goes on and talks about how they're false. But he's listing here a couple of statements, this statement about clear vision, and then he's talking about preconceptions derived from sensation. Or I'm going to use the word preconceptions. Everybody else does besides Bailey, I think. Um, I think you're right, Cassius. I think it is supposed to be preconceptions. Yeah, I think it's Bailey putting his finger on the scale and slanting it in the direction he wants it to go. So we've discussed before the episode started, how many of us really can say that we have knowledge of the gods by, quote, clear vision? And probably there's not many of us who would say that we do have clear vision of the gods. And if we did say we have clear visions of the gods, we would question that person's sanity to some degree. <laughs> I think Bailey makes here a poetic translation. I don't think he meets his clear vision that he sees them with the eyes. So if you compare this with his translation, it's more like this. If you hear an explanation eh, and you understand it, then you say, I see. So it's more more seeing it in this way, which is meant here. So you probably would need to know about the Greek original, what is meant. But if you take Hicks as a reference, there is no statement of clear vision or indicating that we see it literally with the eyes. Eh? So it's rather that it's manifest. No? Yeah, it's written there as manifest. That's an excellent comment, Martin, because, yes, let's read the Hicks version. For verily there are gods and the knowledge of them is manifest. What you just said, Martin, I think extremely well stated, because you can look at a particular translation and a choice of words and put so much emphasis on that particular choice of words and just come totally away from what is probably the more reasonable meaning of the sentence. The word, I think, is idiom. When you say you have a clear vision of something, that doesn't necessarily say you're seeing it with your eyes at the moment in front of you. It just means that you have a clear understanding of it, perhaps. And when Hicks says knowledge of them is manifest, that's much easier to, to accept, I think, for most of us than to say that we have a clear vision. There's another area in this text further up in 123 where we kind of have the same problem because Bailey says, even as the common idea of a god is engraved on men's minds. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of problems with that sentence. But if you mm -hmm. go to Hicks, he says, according to the notion of a god indicated by the common sense of mankind. I also have some problems with that idea. But in Bailey's translation, it's the difference between the active and the passive, in my view. If the common idea of a god is engraved on men's minds, what that implies to me is that if there's an engraving, there has to be an engraver. This is starting mm -hmm. to sound a lot like creationism or what they now call themselves the intelligent design movement. See, the reason that, that I have so much internal resistance to the way that Bailey phrases this is because we've all heard Christians use something very similar. God's laws are written on men's hearts. You don't believe in God, but you know that you're sinning because God's laws are written on your heart. Well, I, I don't mm -hmm. accept that idea. I don't accept the idea that the common idea of a God is engraved on my mind. And I don't accept that the notion or existence of a God is indicated by the common sense of mankind. Or maybe I just don't have common sense when it comes to this issue. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, there's a difference here that I'd like to articulate. The Christian will tell you that God's laws, his moral laws, which are, according to Christianity, moral truths, moral absolutes, 
are engraved on your heart. And therefore that when you break those rules or laws, not only are you committing sin in an absolute sense of the word, you are also doing so with foreknowledge because even if you've never heard of the Judeo-Christian God, that's a phrase I don't like to use, Judeo-Christian, but even if you've never even heard of Yahweh, his laws are engraved on your heart, so you know you're sinning. The Epicurean view here, while I still don't like it, is completely different. He's not saying that God's laws are engraved on your mind or on your heart. He's not saying that there are any sort of transcendental moral laws or truths that the gods impart to us. That is completely foreign to Epicurean theology. And to conflate the two would be greatly dangerous. So we have to demarcate that line, in my view. Joshua, when you said a moment ago that the Epicurean view, even though you may not like it, whatever, I think what we're now into is a great illustration that we should not rely on a single translator or even to some extent, even a set of translators. When we start with something that is clear and the Epicurean physics really is clear, there is no supernatural God. There is nobody creating the universe. You've got a set of presumptions there that have to play out in this ethical section as well. And so when he talks about clear vision or engraving or something like that, you've got to read it very Not skeptically, that's not the word, but you've got to read it very carefully and make sure that you're not bringing into what you're reading or what this translator has written, that he hasn't brought into it some Christian or theistic notion that was not there. What Martin said a minute ago about clear vision, it really jumps out at me. I remember one of the few sections in Lucretius that I've managed to memorize a little bit over time is the section in book one where Lucretius starts talking about what Epicurus stands for and something to the effect that Epicurus is one who stood up against religion and so forth. But the Latin is humana and then the two words ante oculos, which is some kind of a statement of before your eyes. I think that's what Martin's talking about, that there are these idioms of using words like like it's before your eyes, why can't you see it? That doesn't necessarily mean that you're observing it at that moment, but that it ought to be clear to you because of all the evidence that you've got. So I think that's the first task in reading the letter to Menaceus, no matter who the translator is, is to make sure that we're not slanting it according to our own modern monotheistic understandings of the way we expect Epicurus to have been talking. Okay, so I think this might have come up in a thread on the forum about how there were in the temples, there were statues and like, for example, the statue of Athena, very tall statue. I wish I had the numbers of how many feet tall the statue was, very large, so that there's a cultural experience all around the religious aspect that was going on in ancient Athens and and that whole time. Culturally, people were affected by the sight of these temples and the sight of the statues within the temples, and that this created an effect on their minds. And so I think it's important to take that into consideration about this idea about the gods. It could have been almost like a psychological phenomenon happening because of the whole cultural system there. I agree fully with him. Yeah, I think I understand the idea. And if you look at Egyptian engravings on walls and stuff or on uh, statues or obelisks, they'll have these images of a seated king or god king or pharaoh or demigod or whatever, and then a bunch of people standing in front of him sort of as, you know, he's the lawgiver and they're taking the law, that kind of thing. And the seated figure of the god king will be just as tall as the standing figures of the hoi polloi, as we might say, of the people. And so you know that if he stood up, he'd be taller than them, maybe even twice as tall. And so this difference in scale does have, a, I think, a psychological effect. But certainly if you situate yourself into the mind of a Greek peasant farmer in the third century, and you imagine this person living in more or less a hovel, and they're spending their days out in the fields and they're you know bringing in the harvest and everything they do is tied to nature and they're living a life of essentially poverty 
And we know that Epicurus did not come from a wealthy family. His parents were not people of means. They were actually fairly poor. For someone like that, then, to walk into one of these amazing ancient buildings like the Parthenon, and immediately as you approach this building, the, the sheer structure and grandeur of the building, it would have had a huge psychological impact, I think, on a person's mind. And then to go into this building and to see this giant statue in gold leaf of the god, yeah, that certainly that would have had a huge, a huge impact, I think. And then later on, when you've got the Library of Alexandria and they're coming up with all these interesting mechanisms, almost like clockwork, or you've got, what would you call it, hydraulics? The stuff was not really used industrially or economically, but it was used in the temples. They would rig this uh, up in such a way that the door of the temple would open and close hydraulically. But you wouldn't know as, as a, you know, a peasant farmer living in the field surrounding Athens, you wouldn't know that this was a hydraulic system. What you would see as you approach this was the house of God, the doors of the house of God opening and closing on their own. Now, a person today would immediately detect the imposture because we're surrounded by illusions constantly. But for a person in that time to see something like that would would have had, I think, an immediate and, and clear effect. And they could wind up these little statues on hidden wheels. They'd wind them up with rope. And then they, as they unwound, they would move across the room. And then as they unwound completely, the bag of sand would then lift up and then it would drop down. And then on, on, on cue, this statue would then withdraw. You see this stuff happening as, as a person who had never seen something like that before. And it's got to have a tremendous impact on your mind. And maybe the best example we have is the example that we get from Lucian about Alexander the Oracle Monger and this snake that he used as sort of a physical embodiment of the god Glaucon. And he rigged this up in such a way that he had this paper mache head of the snake. So the actual head of the living snake would tuck into his shirt and then out from under his arm would pop up this paper mache snake head that was very realistically wrought, particularly in low light. And then there would be a mouthpiece in the snake, sort of a, think of like one of those old gramophones that would amplify sound. And then that would go through a series of pipes into the room behind, and then somebody behind would be talking into the other end of the pipe. And you would think that the god snake was talking to you directly and in person. And so there's lots of reasons to think that it would be apparent common sense to most people that these things were real, even though they were evident charlatanry. <laughs> I hope I haven't taken that in a completely different direction, Colosini, from where you were going. But to discard all of the mechanical part of it and just to take the statue of the god herself, that alone would have had, I think, a huge psychological impact. OK, yeah. But so I, my, my takeaway here generally is that what we have to draw a distinction between is the epistemological claims of Epicurus when it comes to the gods. And we have to contrast them with the ethical and moral claims that religions like Christianity make about the gods or about God. Christians yeah. are claiming that the moral laws of God are self-evident to humans, and Epicurus is making the claim that epistemologically we can have knowledge of the gods. But he's not making claims about moral laws that the gods are handing down. The, the Epicurean gods don't do that. That's not the function. They didn't create the universe. They don't have any control over it. They don't interfere in the lives of human beings. And their primary purpose in Epicurean philosophy is to serve as an example of the blessed life. There are so many different directions that we could go in. But before we go further down the line we're talking about, let's just make sure that we've covered the rest of what he's saying in 123 and 124 before we start extending it too far. Because I think the part we have not covered yet is that the gods are not as the many believe them to be, for they don't represent them consistently. And the impious man is not he who popularly denies the gods, but attaches to the gods the beliefs of the many. That's probably worth some comment right there. There's a whole book called On Piety, I think, by Philodemus. I mean, clearly Epicurus was, according to many sources, participating in certain of the public rites, which would have had at least some religious aspects to them in his day. So there appears to definitely be an Epicurean aspect of the word piety. So maybe we should talk about that in that way for just a minute. 
What is piety to Epicurus? Is it purely a negative statement of denying attributes about gods, or is it, I don't think you'd use the word impiety if you were just saying that they're wrong about what they're saying. You'd use probably another word. What is Epicurean impiety? Joshua, can you take that one? I know you're conveying a lot of the different issues that we're struggling with here. Is the word impiety something that is in Epicurean terms similar to what we would consider it to be in in other religious terms? I think that what we've been talking about in terms of the demarcation between epistemological claims and moral or ethical claims applies also to this idea of impiety. Epicurus seems to hold the idea that to attach to the gods traits like jealousy, lust, adultery, capriciousness, vengeance, anyone who's read the Iliad and has seen the interplay between the humans and the gods and between the gods and the gods, the idea that the gods take sides or that the motives and interests and actions of human beings are just the sport almost the emotional sport of the gods. That is the idea, in my view, that Epicurus seemed to think was impious, to think that the gods were so capricious that they would take this human, Paris, and use him to judge between the beauty of gods and mortals. And then if he chooses the wrong thing, then all the goddesses who didn't get chosen start this campaign, and then it ultimately leads to the Trojan War. That's the kind of thing that the capriciousness of the gods is something that Epicurus decisively rejected. And it it comes to a head, particularly in Lucretius, with this idea that the gods are going to demand human sacrifice in order to placate them, and that the style of that sacrifice is going to be the sacrifice of a child by its parent. Okay, now you're saying that he's rejecting those ideas and considering them to be wrong. But what about the word impious? Doesn't that word imply some kind of a sacrilegious aspect? Yeah, but again, it's impious to have a false epistemology about the gods. It's not impious to disobey them. That's that's the distinction I'm drawing here. And what I read this as is not necessarily, you know, Epicurus didn't come up with the word impious. He's not going to start an inquisition to go around and start killing people if they don't agree with his idea of the gods. What he's doing is he's taking the issue of impiety, which was hugely important. In fact, one of my favorite Socratic dialogues is Euthyphro, which is all to do with how we understand impiety. And so he's taking this this entrenched cultural idea of impiety that people are slinging not only at each other, but uh, predominantly at him. You know, he's, he's taking all these barbs from the Platonists, from the Stoics, from the leaders of the cities that he's in. People are accusing him of being impious. And so I don't read this as Epicurus coming up with the idea of impiety and then and then trying to enforce it. What he's doing is he's taking an allegation that's made against him and, in essence, accusing the accuser. I don't know that I have a different suggestion than what you're just saying. I think you've really covered the major point. Another reference that came to mind while you were talking, Joshua, is Lucretius Book 6, and it's line 68 in the Latin, and it says this, Unless you purge your mind of such conceits and banish them from your breast, and forbear to think unworthily of the gods by charging them with things that break their peace— These sacred deities, you will believe, are always angry and offended with you. Not that the supreme power of the gods can be so ruffled as to be eager to punish severely in their resentments, but because you fancy those beings who enjoy a perfect peace in themselves are subject to anger and the extravagances of revenge, and therefore you will no longer approach their shrines with an easy mind— No more in tranquility and peace will you be able to receive the images, the representations of their divine forms that form from their pure bodies and strike powerfully upon the minds of men. From hence you may collect what a wretched life you are to lead. So there's a thread of statements and numbers of sources that talk in these almost religious terms about If you have thoughts about the gods that are unworthy, that ascribe to them duties and business that no true god would really perform, that there's a negative result of that. Yeah, but the victim of your impiety, if we accept those terms, is not the gods, right? 
it's not that you're going to drive the gods into a rage and then they're right. going to run through your life as if you were Job and kill your children and, and do all that. That's not going to happen yep, because the gods, according to Epicurus, don't do that. The victim of your impiety, if you accept those terms, is you. Mm-hmm. It's your own peace of mind that you are threatening when you talk about the gods in terms like that. Okay, this is probably the point in the episode we should go ahead and explicitly talk about the fact that there are very serious differences of opinion about what Epicurus is really saying in these passages as to whether gods exist in physical form or not. You can sort of divide down the different perspectives into some people take the position that everything that Epicurus is saying here is a mental construct and that What we're talking about in terms of God-like beings or gods are sort of idealistic ideas in our minds that don't really exist in the physical universe. That's one major category. And then another major category would be those who say absolutely Epicurus did say that physical beings exist in the physical universe which are immortal and blessed. And there's a lot of controversy about whether one of those two is clearly the superior position to take or whether the evidence is just not clear. And that's this is one of the areas that we're really missing text to really be more confident of which position is which. But let's go ahead and jump into that thorn bush. Is Epicurus really saying that physical beings exist? At this point in the podcast, I hope we have hit hard enough. And maybe I'll say it one more time. Nobody says that Epicurus held supernatural beings to exist. Nobody says that Epicurus held that omniscient or omnipotent beings who can perform miracles to us and so forth. Nobody's saying that Epicurus held that. And so a lot of people will then take the position, well, that means Epicurus is an atheist. And that's only if you define the word atheist in a sort of modern monotheistic sense, because the Greeks had a far different vision of what gods are than the Judeo-Christian world or the Islamic world, the Abrahamic world. And we don't doubt that the Greeks really believed that Zeus existed. At least most Greeks seem to have been very sincere in their belief that Zeus and these other gods really existed. And yet their definition of their God was very different than what you'd be taught in church today in, in a Christian environment. So this appears to be under anybody's perspective, a different definition of what a god would be. Epicurus was not accepting the common Greek definition of a god, nor was he accepting the Abrahamic definition of a god. So I hope we've hit that hard enough. And so as we talk about whether these beings really exist or not, we're not talking about whether Yahweh exists or not. We're not talking about whether Allah exists or not. Probably Whether we're arguing for it or not, somebody may have a better way of describing the sort of idealistic position than than the way I just described it. Would anybody want to describe it differently? Right. So I I do take the view that because there's another point, Cassius, that you you left out, um, which is did Epicurus just say that he believed in the gods to keep off the authorities? Oh, yes. That's another view. My view on this is that Epicurus really did think that there was an order of existence higher than humans. In fact, I would go even further. He thought that there was an extensive order of beings throughout the universe because the universe is infinite. It's eternal. Things are constantly being thrown up by nature. So you've got stuff happening all over the place. And you've got, just as we have very lowly forms of life, single-celled organisms, that kind of thing on Earth, We expect to find that kind of thing in other places in the universe. And just as we have intelligent organisms on Earth, you expect to find intelligent organisms throughout the universe. And I think that Epicurus really did believe that there was an order of intelligence. And I think the word he uses, it translated as immortality, but I think incorruptibility is is another way to put that. And the importance of the word incorruptibility is it has to do with the incorruptibility of the physical form of the God. So I really do think that Epicurus thought that there was an order of existence, that it was physical, just as everything in in nature is physical. There's nothing non-physical except for the void. So I really think that Epicurus thought that the gods existed in physical form and that they existed 
maybe all over the universe, depending on how you take his view of worlds and the intermundia and all that. But I do think that Epicurus thought the gods were physical. There is this other train of thought, which we call the idealist view. And I think it centers on this Greek word eidolon, from which we get the word idol, I-D-O-L, translated generally as images. And so the idea from the idealist perspective on the existence of the gods is that these are images that we have in our minds of the ideal state of the good life, the ideal blessedness, the ideal happiness. That if you imagine for yourself a being, which you can call a god, who would live the kind of life that you're trying to live, but who could attain that life in a way that maybe it's not possible for humans to attain, and who could attain that life over the period of an eternity, that it would be useful to reflect on the supposed existence of that being. Because it's something for you to strive towards. The analogous situation there, Joshua, is one of the Vatican sayings, I think, says something to the effect that reverence for the wise man is of great benefit for he who does the reverencing. Something to that effect. Meaning that just like when you play tennis or do any activity in life, if you surround yourself by people who are better than you are, who already know how to do it, you can learn by their example. All sorts of different analogies you can use to the benefits of setting up a goal to which to aspire to and keeping that goal and that vision in your mind. And this is something, Cassius, that people do all the time. If you're a football player and you want to get better at playing football, you're going to go to games and watch people who play football better than you do. You're going to watch what they do and you're going to try to emulate how they do it. You're going to watch tapes of games going all the way back to the 60s because you want to see how the best players of all time have played the game of football because you're trying to get better at it. The idea here seems to be that we want to emulate not just better happiness, but the best happiness, the perfect ideal state of happiness, which, again, is probably not attainable for human beings but that if we emulate it, can get us closer to our best form of happiness. What you just said there, Joshua, is pretty much what I was attempting to emphasize in the beginning about how I don't think the Epicurean doctrine of gods was intended just to be a negative thing where you throw out supernatural gods and then you just put it aside and never think about it again. I think it had in the Epicurean scheme this function that you've just talked about, this function of keeping in front of you on a regular basis an ideal towards which you would aspire. You could even call that a technique, perhaps, since the Stoics are so big into techniques. You could potentially think of this as just one of those things you would do on a regular basis to try to improve what you're doing so that you just don't get caught in a rut of the same thing day after day. You should always be aspiring to a more successful, pleasant life. So the question is where we go from here. Martin, let me ask you a question. Do you spend time in your day imagining a perfectly happy and incorruptible God and then trying to strive toward living a life like that God. Do you find that helpful? For me, not. No, I don't. <laughs> I completely don't do that at all. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely the same way. What I do find helpful, and maybe I'll just illustrate this point. What I find helpful is just thinking about nature itself, the raw form of nature, atoms and void. I find it helpful to think about the vast immensity of space and time. That's the kind of thing that helps me to put my finite, tiny, minuscule existence into perspective and to think about, okay, given the allotment of time that I have, which is going to be a flash of a microsecond in evolutionary or in cosmic scales, what am I going to do with the time that I have? And I don't find it helpful to imagine what an incorruptible and blessed God would do, but I do find it helpful to just put that time into perspective and to think about the time that it takes light to come to us from the nearest star, much less the nearest galaxy, which is so incomprehensibly far away that it's very difficult for the human mind to imagine. This is the kind of stuff that I find helpful. So I'm very skeptical that the gods, if we take the ideal view, are necessary for that. And I'm even more skeptical in uh, taking the physical view, because I just don't think that a being exists that we would call gods. I think that the idea of the gods is too wrapped up. And of course, Epicurus didn't have to do with the baggage of monotheism, but I think that the baggage is real and it's problematic. It's so problematic, in fact, that just thinking about the gods becomes 
a hindrance more than a benefit. That's my view. Joshua, I'm a little bit surprised to hear some of that from you because I kind of associate you with more of an artistic and even poetic bent. You know, art is such an interesting subject in itself about the things you surround yourself by in your day-to-day life. Do you surround yourself by sort of, I don't know if you want to say heroic imagery or that is something to aspire to, or do you not? I think there are many people who might suggest that one of the negative aspects of our current civilization is just people who sit around every day and do nothing but watch television shows. And they will adopt what they see on television, which often is probably not the highest art that's possibly available out there. And they'll internalize the things that they see. Maybe, again, we're not talking about the cream of the crop in terms of the intellectually aggressive people. But if we're talking about normal people, normal people who aren't constantly engaged in philosophical explanations and research, they probably are more affected than other type people by the things that they see around them. And if they're in ancient Athens or if they're in Nashville, Tennessee, and they go up and see the huge building like the Parthenon, and they go inside and see these huge gods and so forth. Calassini posted to the forum recently, and Don and Calassini were talking about Horus and how Epicureans are supposed to be fond of the countryside, and to some extent that might mean fond of a simpler lifestyle and so forth. I can, I can see it argued that people of a simpler lifestyle are probably even more affected than all of us who are constantly battered by images everywhere. They could be very affected by seeing statues of gods and the way that those gods are posed, whether those gods are smiling or not, I think is recorded in one of the Epicurean positions that we should portray gods as smiling. I could see the idea that surrounding yourself by images of what you aspire to is a pretty important thing to do. Now, whether we do it or not today is a different question, but it it could in fact be a very helpful thing to do to make sure that our pictures and our things we see around us every day are positive and uplifting images of what we would like life to be instead of the opposite. You said artists, and I myself being an artist, there is something there with regard to sort of image of gods and goddesses in the creative process, even now in time where we have monotheism surrounding us, but yet the human psyche is not, I would say it's not um, monotheistic. The psyche has many aspects to it. So for instance, Joseph Campbell, he brought up the idea of archetypes and he was studying various cultures and their religions and their beliefs and all the different gods and goddesses all in all world religions so there's this element of looking even for the modern artist right now there's an element of looking to creativity that there's a source of creativity in the images and the ideals of what these images can represent or bring up in fact going back to ancient greece and the muses The muses were, well, the idea was that inspiration came from the gods. So that's a whole thing which I have not studied fully enough. But the idea is that the muses are the source of your creativity. So there is still this connection in some psychic way between gods and goddesses. It's hard to explain because this is not something that people go around talking about. But I'm sure if you asked any artist is there some element of inspiration and you really dive deep into what that was, you would see some common archetypes coming forward that would relate toward the ideals of perfection and beauty and all the things that good art come from. I could take your question here, which is finding inspiration in the idea of the gods. And then you mentioned things like art and and architecture and poetry and all that. I think that the province of finding inspiration for me comes from human culture. It comes from art and architecture and poetry. It comes from something as simple as fantasy or science fiction literature. There are these worlds you can escape to. Video games are quite important to me. So there's there's a lot of areas where if uh, if life is 
may be lacking in inspiration where you can retreat to these worlds. And of course, I love Stephen Greenblatt's book, The Swerve. I know it's very controversial, but one of the things he describes in his book is the way that these Renaissance humanists were trying to resuscitate this ancient world of the Greeks and the Romans, the world that we study on this podcast, the world that we study when we study Epicurean philosophy. But they didn't have access to it the way we did. We have access to it because of the things they did to bring it back. But when you read the letters, for example, of Paggio Bracciolini, the guy who rediscovered the manuscript of Lucretius in 1417, I think, in a monastery in Fulda in Germany, it was like opening a new wing on, on a library, which you can go into when there are things in your life that maybe are not as, as satisfying as you would hope. And Paggio's letters are rife with that idea. He'll talk about things that are going on in the world that he despises, like the killing of heretics, for example. He, he thought that was repulsive, particularly heretics who were well-educated, who spoke Latin, and who were highly intelligent <laughs> and articulate. And so he would see these things happen. He was at the Council of Constance. He saw people led to the stake and ultimately executed and in his letters back home to Florence, he would describe what he was seeing. And then he would say this interesting transitional phrase. He would say, but back to the books. So the world he lived in was deeply unsatisfying to him. So he retreated into this almost artificial world, the world of Cicero, the world of Homer, the world of Epicurus in some ways, and Lucretius. And so I don't need to reach for an image of a god in order to come up with something to give me a new perspective or something to lead me to pursue something better or more fulfilling, to pursue something that will make me happier. It's it's not required. And as I said earlier, Epicurus didn't have the same kind of baggage surrounding the issue of divinity that we have, because I think Calicini is right. There is a, there's a huge difference between a pantheon of polytheistic gods and a monotheistic god. And to write in a culture of polytheism and to then offer this new interesting take on the gods, I can see where there would be a lot of value in that. But we are now, in a sense, poisoned by uh, the poison fruit of Abraham. <laughs> and so when I look for inspiration, I essentially see two choices, and it's Athens or Jerusalem. I will always, I will always choose Athens. If I'm not choosing Middle Earth or, uh, you know, <laughs> Dune or something like that, there's all these worlds that we create. But the world of the gods is not interesting to me if I try to imagine them actually existing in reality. That would be my take on it. Joshua, I really like the line of thinking we've been talking about for the last few minutes here, because the way I would reconcile what you're saying, Joshua, and what Calcini is saying would be that I'm like Martin. It is absurd to me to think about spending time considering the nature of Jehovah. God is love or whatever. All this monotheistic view of divinity that we are subjected to in the modern world, it's been drained of all specificity or all ability to relate to it at all. God has become such an abstraction. I guess to some extent people would argue that that's why Jesus is more important is because you can wear your what would Jesus do armband and think about in terms of modeling your life after Jesus. And I guess to some extent that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit here. That's much more relatable at least than it is to think about God and trying to model your life after God. There's just such little ability to do that that it, it doesn't make any sense even to try. But the analogy of the way some people look at Jesus probably does make more sense, and maybe that's more the direction we're talking about here, is that not in any sense a supernatural way, but keeping in front of you a vision of the way you want your life to be, the way you want yourself to be, if you're a child or a high school football player, like you used the analogy earlier, have a picture of dating myself, all these people like Johnny Unitas or Joe Namath or people that I don't I don't know the names of modern football players at all. But that's what people do when you're younger. You hero worship. There's obviously bad things about hero worship, but there's good things about hero worship if it gives you a goal to aspire to and helps you work towards that goal. And what I hear you saying, Joshua, and what Martin said previously is that we are not able to do that with the God of Christianity, Judeo-Christianity and so forth, just because of the nature of that particular God. But 
if you're coming at it from the Epicurean perspective and you're familiar with the way the Greeks looked at their gods, I think it's much more possible to see how that could work and how that could be an important part of life. To some extent, if Epicurus is developing a worldview that is going to appeal to wide groups of people, he's not just appealing to the philosophers who are spending their time buried in books. He's appealing to normal people out there in the normal world and thinking about how to give them ways to relate to the universe. Okay, we're probably beginning to come to the end of the normal episode length. So let's, rather than try to go down too many new roads, talk about summarizing the roads we've been on. Just one more comment. I'm not sure whether in the long talk it has been mentioned already, but what my understanding is of what usually the, what, what I have heard the nowadays Epicureans in Greece they think those ancient gods as being symbols for something what those gods, gods represent. And in this way, they can still be valid today. And in that way, they were also valid for Epicurus at that time. So that means by looking at this as a symbolism, there is no difference between ancient Epicurean philosophy and modern Epicurean philosophy as uh, these Greek uh, Epicureans see it. Yes, I've heard that kind of thing, too. I think you're right, Martin. In fact, we have a a forum friend in in Athens. She lives in Athens, right? Thessalonica. Okay, okay, you're right, you're right. And she recently had a a grandchild, and the the grandchild is named after one of the nine muses, which I thought was very interesting. So I certainly see that kind of thing. I am an occasional poet, and I have written many (laughs) verses on Venus, the planet, because usually I'm walking around at night looking at the stars. And Venus is always very prominent if you see it in the sky. I think it's the third brightest object in the night sky. And it does give me some kind of, I guess, rumination or reflection to think about Venus and what it meant to think that Venus was a god and what it meant to discover that Venus was now a planet. And it's this interesting interplay of something in nature that is carrying the characteristic of something very human. And I do find that interesting, and I have written on it quite extensively. And so every time I see Venus, it's like my heart lifts just a little bit. (laughs) I guess I can see that kind of thing as being valuable. And of course, metaphor is, is hugely important to me. And so Lucretius has a passage where he talks about when you think of Bacchus and and Ceres as wine and, you know, cereal grains and that kind of thing. So I certainly see the value in, in that stuff. It's it's not like I'm total curmudgeon when it comes to the imagery of the gods. And then there's this further idea that you get in Lucretius and indeed in this very letter of thinking about nature as being not just an inert sort of sterile, lifeless matter, but being in many ways sort of the generative mother of everything that exists. And that I find extremely compelling. And and you know it's compelling because actually there's uh, modern Christianity is is I see this quite a lot. I have you know I was raised Catholic. I have Catholic family members. The reference to Mother Earth, which people sometimes make quite casually, there's a lot of pushback to that idea from Catholics today because they are hugely concerned about people confusing the creation with the Creator, and. The ultimate takeaway for me from from this passage about the gods in the letter to Menoikius is that there is only the creation. And ultimately, the word creation isn't even right because it was uncreated. There's only nature. There is no creator. That, to me, is the key point we have to take away here. Well, continuing on with that analogy, just briefly, the issue of just using a image or something as an example to aspire to somebody looking back into that book three of Lucretius starts out by talking about Epicurus and how they considered him to be a father like figure. So that would be another example of a father figure. In this case, there's also a question you discuss about whether Epicurus himself fits that description or not. But the Epicureans certainly considered him in that kind of a way as an example by which to follow. And then basically, there's also the book five introduction, which says that Epicurus was essentially a god 
God himself because of what he had done for us as humans and how he had shown the way out of the dark path of religion and so forth. So there's lots of material that provides analogies of, again, there's that word hero worship, which has all sorts of negative connotations to it. But a father figure is not necessarily so negative. And it's easier to understand how it helps to think about what some figure that you hold in high regard would do in any particular situation. Yeah. Now, the thing about Epicurus, Cassius, is that he's not twice as tall as us. That's right. (laughs) When we talk about, you know, these statues or these Egyptian hieroglyphics, there's a passage in Lucretius in the Latin. It says, nos exequat victoria Kylo. We, by the victory are exalted as high as heaven. That's uh, Rolf Humphrey's translation. I was interested when I was reading Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare that there's a line in Romeo and Juliet where after Juliet dies, Friar Lawrence said that she is now as high as heaven. And Mm -hmm. I saw that and I immediately thought of Rolf Humphrey's. And now I genuinely don't know if Rolf Humphrey's was using this phrase from Shakespeare to translate Lucretius, or if Shakespeare was taking some influence from Lucretius when he wrote that poem. I think he absolutely was, because there's also references to Wormwood, to dreams. There's almost this line for line passage on dreams from Lucretius, his description of little atomies. There's quite a lot in there that that I'm absolutely loving when it comes to Lucretius. And that's all Um, in Romeo and Juliet, or just different? Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. Well, okay. I'm going to go around and ask for final comments, but without jumping ahead and the letter, we have to remember that how does the letter to Menesius end? Meditate, therefore, on these things and things akin to them night and day by yourself with a companion like it to yourself, and never shall you be disturbed waking or asleep, but you shall live like a god among men. And that's kind of a famous line in Epicurean phrasing. So in a sense, even this letter concludes with the call to consider yourself and aspire to be a god among men. Yeah, let me get something in here on that, because throughout this episode, I I might have sounded like I was totally poo-pooing the idea that what we're talking about here. One of my favorite authors, of course, is Henry David Thoreau, and he read about the first hundred lines of Lucretius and reported that in his journal. And he said that the most interesting part to him was this image of Prometheus. Of course, there is no image of Prometheus in the first hundred lines of Lucretius. There's a discussion of the Gryas Homo, I think he calls him. He's talking about the Greek man, Epicurus. Mm -hmm. And Epicurus, in effect, stealing fire from the gods. That is something that I find hugely inspirational. The idea that he's how does he say it? He's rending the tight barred gates of nature's hold asunder. He's wringing secrets out of nature and he's passing them on to us. And then he's defiant toward the gods. And by his victory, we are exalted as high as heaven. So that kind of thing I see a lot of value in. Joshua, I don't read what you've been saying today as being curmudgeonly about the subject. I think the point, and I'm glad you raised that, because I think what people might hear and people might expect, supernatural religion has been a poisonous influence. And that is the Epicurean perspective. Whether we agree with it or not, it's clear. Much of what Epicurus was doing was combating the negative effects of religion. But the interesting thing is, this is a contrast that I regularly draw. The famous modern atheists who are constantly campaigning against religion, maybe they want to suggest some kind of a humanistic view to replace religion. But this modern atheist movement is mostly negative, at least in the way I look at it. I don't think Epicurus was wanting to stop at just simply refuting bad ideas about supernatural gods. I think he was interested in pursuing a positive side to thinking about this subject. And I know it's hard for us to do anything but deal with the negative because we've been living under what we consider to be oppressive or generally negative influences our whole lives. And we tend to associate negative things that go on in the world with the negative influence of supernatural religion and the discord that comes from it and so forth. But I think that that's an interesting thing that we can get out of Epicurus is that it's not just a negative subject to talk about or think about the nature of what divinity is or would be like, that you can get something positive out of it. And even though we're not really used to doing that, that's probably one of the things that additional study into Epicurus might give us interesting new paths to pursue. Okay, so with that, let me go around and ask for closing statements from everybody. And we generally start with Martin. So, Martin? No, I have have none today. Okay. Calasini? 
Uh, yeah, so this has been very good because I see now that this is a very important aspect that I've been kind of just pushing aside as far as understanding what place gods and the idea of gods have in Epicureanism. And as you had said, Cassius, in the very beginning, this is at the very start of the letter. So that means this is actually very important. And so as I reflect on everything that we've said, I realize that for me, this idea of gods, or I could also say archetypes of gods, it's something that I need to go back and look at again. So the gods as ideals, and it's been such a long time since I studied Joseph Campbell, and I'm thinking I really need to go back and do that again as an artist, that this could actually enhance my life. And I've just, I've thought of myself so much as an atheist that anytime I see the word God or gods, I'm just like, eh, whatever. But coming back to really studying this, I see maybe I'm missing something that would actually be very beneficial to increasing my happiness in life and increasing my inspiration and improving my art. And so this has been very, very helpful for me. So thank you. Okay, Joshua. Okay. <laughs> so it, as some of you may know, I did take a brief tour through through Buddhism and and Kalasini has been there as well. There's this image surrounding the Buddha's enlightenment, the stories that sort of have grown up around that event. And one of them is that the was his name Mara, the temp the sort of the tempter, appeared to Buddha and tried to draw him away from the path of enlightenment and all that. And there's this particular moment where the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, puts uh, his He's sitting in sort of a lotus position, meditation pose, if you can imagine, and he's he's resting a finger on the ground. This is called the earth witness mudra. Mudra is like a pose or an arrangement of the hands in statuary. This is actually quite important in Greek statuary as well, that the way you hold your hands can indicate whether you're a philosopher or an orator or a statesman or a soldier. And the image is of the Buddha calling the earth to witness. So he's got this tempter who's trying to stop him from achieving his goal, and he puts his finger on the ground, and it's sort of as if all the beings of all the worlds who want to be freed and need him to take the first step are crying out against the sort of almost Satan figure to leave him alone so that he can do the necessary thing that he needs to do. The earth witness mudra was always my favorite sort of statue of the Buddha. And so what I guess I'm trying to say is that I do find that kind of thing helpful. And it kind of dovetails with my image of less focus on the gods and, and more focus on the issue of like a Prometheus figure, you know, someone who is clearly working on the side of, of the humans. <laughs> and so when you say that, Joshua, you, you raised that earlier about the Prometheus figure, and that is Epicurus himself in the first sections of book one of Lucretius, right? Yes, That's his... yeah. He doesn't give Epicurus his name, but he says, you know, first a man, a Greek, he goes on, then he goes on to say that he climbed the flaming ramparts of the world and crossed the bounds of space and time and thought and brought back news of what could be and what could not. And I wouldn't be doing this podcast if I didn't find the story of Epicurus himself inspiring. And I didn't find the quest that he took in, in many ways to seek out the grounds of not just choice and avoidance, but of the study of nature and of epistemology and physics and of how we know what we think we know is true about the world that we live in. If he hadn't gone to the trouble of doing those things and then brought them back for us so that we can read them and profit from them. And so that would be where I would put my focus in lieu of the gods. But yeah, I guess that's going to be my closing comment. All right. And let me remind you as my closing comment would be the end of what you've been quoting there. So his force, his vital force of mind, a conqueror beyond the flaming ramparts of the world, explored the vast immensities of space with wit and wisdom and came back to us triumphant, bringing news of what can be and what cannot limits and boundaries, the borderline, the benchmark set forever. And then these are the final words I wanted to add. Religion so is trampled underfoot, and by his victory, we reach the stars. 
So there's always in Epicurean philosophy this interplay with proper view of the gods and, and where they live and how they live. Okay, we'll close for the day with that, and we'll come back in another week. So thank you, everybody, for your time today. Very good. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Welcome to episode 136 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean texts, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we continue with our discussion of Epicurus' letter to Menoikius, and this week we discuss the issues of life and death. Now let's join Joshua reading today's text. Become accustomed to the belief that death is nothing to us, for all good and evil consists in sensation, but death is deprivation of sensation, and therefore a right understanding that death is nothing to us makes the mortality of life enjoyable, not because it adds to it an infinite span of time, but because it takes away the craving for immortality. For there is nothing terrible in life for the man who has truly comprehended that there is nothing terrible in not living, so that the man speaks but idly, who says that he fears death, not because it will be painful when it comes, but because it is painful in anticipation. For that which gives no trouble when it comes is but an empty pain in anticipation. So death, the most terrifying of ills, is nothing to us, since so long as we exist, death is not with us. But when death comes, then we do not exist. It does not then concern either the living or the dead, since for the former it is not, and the latter are no more. But the many at one moment shun death as the greatest of evils, at another yearn for it as a respite from the evils in life. But the wise man neither seeks to escape life, nor fears the cessation of life. For neither does life offend him, nor does the absence of life seem to be any evil. And just as with food, he does not seek simply the larger share and nothing else, but rather the most pleasant. So he seeks to enjoy not the longest period of time, but the most pleasant. And he who counsels the young man to live well, but the old man to make a good end, is foolish, not merely because of the desirability of life, but also because it is the same training which teaches to live well and to die well. Yet much worse still is the man who says it is good not to be born, but once born, make haste to pass the gates of death. For if he says this from conviction, why does he not pass away from life? For it is open to him to do so if he had firmly made up his mind to this. But if he speaks in jest, his words are idle among men who cannot receive them. We must then bear in mind that the future is neither ours, nor yet wholly not ours, so that we may not altogether expect it as sure to come nor abandon hope of it as if it will certainly not come. Joshua, thank you for reading that for us today. For the start of this episode, we've chosen to read 
basically the entire section from the letter to Menesius that deals with the issue of death and how long to live and issues that are closely related to that. But this is one of the most well-known and important issues in Epicurean philosophy, so it's likely that we're not going to finish it today. We wanted to give the full context so that everybody would know as they started thinking about this topic everything that Epicurus said in the letter about the topic. Also, before we started recording today, Calassini brought up an issue that we could profitably address right here at the beginning. What was the contemporary opinion about whether there was a life after death and what it meant in terms of Hades or the underworld or anything like that? Calassini, is that basically the question or would you restate it differently? There is parallels, but yet differences in how we think about the afterlife. And on Wikipedia, I see kind of a brief explanation, which I can really, really quickly read. It says, in older Greek myths, the realm of Hades is the misty and gloomy abode of the dead, where all mortals go when they die. Very few mortals could leave Hades once they entered. The exceptions, Heracles and Theseus, are heroic. Even Odysseus in his Nekia calls up the spirits of the departed rather than descend to them. Later, Greek philosophy introduced the idea that all mortals are judged after death and are either rewarded or cursed. It's a very complex subject. I don't think we can think of Greek religion, theology, etc. It's something that is uniform and monolithic in the sense that you can think of maybe Christianity as being far more monolithic, even though we know that Christianity has now fractured into a million subsects. Religion for the ancient people was widely diverse, and they sort of accepted not just the myths of their own country, but in some ways the myths of other countries as well. And so this must necessarily also reflect on the afterlife. And then Edward Gibbon has this famous quote. He says, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were considered by the people as equally true, by the philosophers as equally false, and by the magistrates as equally useful. Now, that's a rather cynical. <laughs> With that view in mind, and granted, Edward Gibbon is a rather controversial figure as well. Let me just give you my outline of what I see being the prevailing view in Greece around the time of Epicurus of what happens when you die. You know, this is such a complicated thing because we don't think of it this way, but transmigration of the soul was actually a huge belief as well that had come over from Asia Minor. And so, and then you've got the Egyptian beliefs, but in general, Hades or the underworld is not a place of punishment. That's true in a very few cases, uh, and those cases are also very famous. You've got Ixion's wheel where he's, is he tied to the wheel and he's just turned over for all time, or is he pushing the wheel? I can't remember. You've got the case of Sisyphus, who's got to push this boulder up a hill, and then when it gets to the top, it rolls back down, and he's got to push it up again. You've got the case of Tantalus, who is in a stream of water with fruit hanging over his head, but every time he goes to reach for the fruit, the boughs of the tree pull away, and every time he goes to take a drink of the water, the water recedes. So in a few select cases, you have punishments that are deemed fit for the crime, and then on the other end of the spectrum, in a few select cases, you've got this place called the Happy Isles, which is where all the heroes end up going after they die. So Achilles and Odysseus and, and Homer will be in the Happy Isles. But the common fate of most people is precisely the thing that most Greeks want to avoid, and that is simply to be forgotten. You don't go to the underworld to be punished. You go to the underworld as a sort of forgetting. And you just sort of wander around, as Lucretius says of Ennius's description, shades pale in wondrous wise. So it's not at all like what we think of when we think of hell. It's not like what we think of when we think of heaven. It's this weird alien place where, for most people, it's just an endless diminishing of consciousness. Joshua, what you've just said is my understanding as well. I noticed in looking at Lucretius, there's line 102 from book one, where he says that still I fear your caution will dispute the maxims I lay down, who all your life have trembled at the poet's frightful tales. Alas, I could even now invent such dreams as would pervert the steadiest rules of reason and make your fortunes tremble to the bottom. No wonder. But if men were once convinced that death was the sure end of all their pains, 
they might with reason then resist the force of all religion and contemn the threats of the poets. As it is now, we have no sense, no power to strive against prejudice because we fear a scene of endless torment after death. And yet the nature of the soul we know not, whether formed with the body or at birth infused and then by death cut off, she perishes as bodies do, or whether she descends to the dark caves and dreadful lakes of hell, or after death, inspired with heavenly instinct, she retires into the brutes as our great Aeneas song. So it's a confusing picture as to whether they really thought there was endless torment after death or not. And I'm convinced that you're right, Joshua, that it was not universal that they thought that that would happen. But it probably was universal a fear of what could happen to them after death. So that even if they weren't convinced that they will burn forever if they do bad things, even if they didn't have that kind of frame of reference, they still were not anxious to find out what was going to happen to them when they died. So with that as background, one of the most famous lines in Epicurean philosophy, become accustomed to the belief that death is nothing to us. Let me add in one more thing, which is something that Lucretius said. You might have just talked about this, and I wasn't paying close enough Mm -hmm. attention, but he's talking to Memmius, and he says, one day or other, you yourself may fall away from us, seduced by the rant of priests or something like that. And so... right. It's not merely that death is something that we naturally fear, it's that we're culturally conditioned to fear death. And there's people who trade in convincing you to be afraid of death and to accept their cure. Mm -hmm. Epicurus is offering a cure here, which he's giving to you freely, and you can accept it or not. And I think probably for a lot of people who come to Epicurus, it's not just so that we can party all the time and live in extravagant orgies of sin and dissipation. That's not why we're drawn to this philosophy. We're drawn to this philosophy, at least in part, because of what he has to say about life and what he has to say about death. And if you follow the order from the principal doctrines, this is actually more important to us than even the issue of pleasure and pain, because it comes first. First off, he addresses the issue of gods, but even that is just closely related to this issue. I might even say that this issue is really more important than the issue of God's. You know, there's that, was it Pascal's wager or whatever about the issue of if you think that there really is an eternity of bliss ahead of you by listening to the religious threats and bribes, then you would in fact listen to them because it would be worth it if you could achieve eternal bliss in heaven by following the regulations of a religion. But if you once become convinced that there is no life after death, then as we've discussed many times, and I think of all the different illustrations Joshua has brought up, which is the story, Joshua, about Thomas More said that the one thing you couldn't be in this utopia utopia. is, is, is not believing in life after death, right? Yeah, to believe that the world is the mere sport of chance and that the soul dies with the body are the two things which it is forbidden to believe in Moore's utopia. So you can take all the positions you want to about virtue and pleasure and pain, but that's not as important as just believing that you can be punished in heaven for an eternity if you fail to follow the rules. Yeah, and if you don't believe that you're going to be punished for an eternity or rewarded after death, we as a society or as a civilization cannot trust you. I think it was John Locke who said that promises, covenants, and oaths can have no hold upon an atheist. So if, if you don't kowtow to this, to this idea that you're going to be punished after you die for what you've done in this life, then you simply can't be trusted as a person. I'll throw another example on there, too, which comes to my mind because of, we talk about Cicero so often. I'm remembering that in one of his speeches, he accused Julius Caesar of being potentially an Epicurean because Caesar had made the argument, this is the Catiline conspiracy stuff out of Cicero, that Caesar had argued that Catiline should not be executed or that his conspirators should not be executed. Caesar said it would be better to send them to some prison out in the cities of Italy because once they're dead, they're not punished anymore. But if you keep them in prison for a long time, that's a worse punishment than just executing them. And as a result, Cicero accused Julius Caesar of having Epicurean tendencies for having made that argument because Cicero wanted to execute them immediately. Let me drive us in one more direction. The the very first line of the Iliad by Homer, the first word is rage. And the first line is talking about the rage of Peleus's son, Achilles, who sent many heroes 
down to Hades. So this is in the first line of the first major literary work of the Greek world. It's this issue of death. It's immediate. It's immediate in Greek literature. And it's it's there all the way till the end. And this is why I think uh, Epicurus wants to deal with it and sees it as so important because it's culturally one of the most important things that humans discuss and talk about. Joshua, you're about to get me wound up on this issue because, you know, (laughs) I don't think we tend to put much emphasis on it in our readings of Epicurus and so forth. I have a feeling most of us, I guess because of our Christian background or whatever that we've been taught over the years, we just kind of take for granted that there is something after death, whether it's some kind of spiritualism or whatever, whether it's Christian or anything. It's almost a given, it seems like, in our culture that even the popular culture, nobody really takes the position that when you die, you're just gone. They're always holding open this possibility or even probability that there's some kind of consciousness or existence after death. And I think that's wrong for us to de-emphasize that because these points that are being made here that we're discussing, you can't really be free to live your life the way you want to live it today and during your lifetime. If you think you're going to be held into account to somebody else's standard after you die, not only is it a matter of getting rid of pain in a very general sense, but you're a slave of whatever you think is going to happen to you after you die. You can never really put that out of your mind other than by sort of closing it off and trying to forget about it. But sweeping things under the rug is really never a very good idea, I think, to deal with important issues. You should affirmatively if you can, take a position on it and follow the implications of that position. And this is a subject that's much more important than issues like whether the universe is infinite or whether the universe is eternal. I can see the possibility of putting some of those issues aside and not really worrying about them. But the idea of what's going to happen to you after you die, that you could somehow be hauled before some judge and held to account for it, is something that extremely practical in terms of how you live your life today. It's well worth being uh, at the beginning of the text. And I think I did finally find a copy of principal doctrine number two is simply death is nothing to us for that which is dissolved is without sensation. And that which lacks sensation is nothing to us. That's very close to what we're reading here in the letter to Menorchius, almost identical in fact. So I think that this brings up the idea that consciousness depends on sensation. So this goes against what some people believe, that somehow consciousness can exist outside of the body. I would say that it's not just some people who think that consciousness doesn't require a brain. It's most people, in my view, think that you can sustain consciousness and that there are conscious beings who don't have what we would conventionally call sensation. Of course, Epicurus himself rules out that idea by giving the gods physical form. One more thing before we leave that very first sentence. Become accustomed to the belief that death is nothing to us. I've always been concerned that that's interpreted as being a flippant remark, almost like it's being dismissive and saying that you don't care about it all and you're not even going to think about it. But we're not only going to think about it, we're going to devote a lot of very important sentences to it in this discussion. And we're going to constantly talk about it in Epicurean philosophy. So it's not nothing to us in the sense of irrelevant to discuss. In fact, we can't really go too much further without talking about the issue of are we talking about the way you die? Is that nothing to you? Or is it really, the phrase I generally use, the state of being dead that's nothing to us? What is it that's nothing to us, Joshua? And what does it mean to say that it's nothing to you? Does that mean it's irrelevant to you? Well, I would take a very literal and physical approach to what Epicurus says elsewhere. He says that when we are, in other words, when we continue to exist as a conscious being in the universe, then death to us does not exist, right? We're not dead, we're still alive. And that when death is, in other words, when the moment comes when you die and cease to exist as a conscious being in the universe, when death is, we are not. And so it's this idea that there's a clear boundary between life and death, and death does not have any real effect on our life except, as he says here, in anticipation. It's the anticipation of death, the fear of death before it happens to Epicurus's mind causes 
all the problem with the experience of death because you don't experience anything when you're dead. It's just the fear of what you'll experience when you die that causes so much grief for so many years for so many people's lives. What if somebody says to you, Epicure said that death is nothing to us. Why are we even bothering to talk about this? It's nothing to us. It's irrelevant. Let's move on and talk about something else. What if somebody <laughs> says that to you, Josh? What do you think is the right response to that? Well, I would focus in on that word accustomed, as both Bailey and Hicks use the word accustomed. This is not something that Epicurus meant for you to just flippantly discard this whole set of uh, beliefs and practices and religious principles that were surrounding him and surrounding us. It's not just throwing this stuff off and then just going to do whatever you want. You need to spend time, not just today or tomorrow, but throughout your life, you need to spend time thinking about death and what happens when you die. That, to me, is the meaning of the word accustomed there. He clearly, by that word accustomed, takes this to be something very serious and something that is worth consideration over the long term. And I think it's Seneca who said something to the effect that Epicurus said to actually think about death. That There's that meditate mortem line, I think, that's in Seneca that he attributes to Epicurus to tell us to meditate on these issues. At the very okay. end of the letter to Minoikias, at the very end of this letter that we're reading, he says, meditate on these and other things, both alone and in company with like-minded people, etc. So everything we're reading in here is something we're supposed to not just read once and then throw onto the bookshelf, never to be read again. Everything that we're reading here in this letter is something that we're meant to read over the course of a whole human life. Martin, any particular part of this you'd like to tackle? Yes, I'd like to, uh, to comment on this, that most people think that there is conscious without a body and conscious without sensation. But uh, this is different from what I see as Christian-inspired popular beliefs in Germany. So I think what I most common see when people who believe in the afterlife, that they, when uh, once their soul has separated from the body, they see what the beloved ones do here on earth. No? So that means there is still some sensation, even though they are no more with the body, they have a different way of sensing what's going on and literally in some way see it. No? Otherwise, this whole idea wouldn't make sense. And I see this very often, that people refer to this in this way, including my own father, he wasn't even religious at all, but I don't know whether he jokingly came up this up or not, but this is something very common in, in popular belief. Plus, even weirder, we have a saying in Germany, if somebody does or says something which is fundamentally against something, what was important to the deceased one, then the, the body of that person ro rotates in the grave. I almost didn't follow you in the very beginning, so I think I'm going to ask you to explain exactly what you mean. But now everybody's heard the cliche about people rolling in their graves when things happen in the world above them that they would not have liked. But So, Martin, explain again, what, what is this attitude you're talking about that your father had? That it, they... This popular belief is that the soul which has, is in heaven can uh, see what the beloved ones do on earth who are still alive. Ah. Yeah, you're saying that people who are not even Christian think that in Europe? I mean, I wouldn't say my father was not Christian, but he at least wasn't religious you know, in the sense that he would, uh, he detested the church. You know? But mm -hmm. he never stated a any atheist preference. And also in the end, he thought there would, would be no afterlife. But before that, at many occasions, he in some sense referred to this, that those who are dead and in, in, in heaven, that, that they can see what we are doing. But plus, I know this only from a couple of movies. So there we have this idea that those who have died can become something like protective angels for their beloved ones. Guardian angels, yes. So, well, of course, what I say is completely non-Epicurean. I don't believe anything of this. But I think it's just to say that I, I don't think that the majority thinks that consciousness without sensation is there. No? So they really think, uh, they, they think merely that the soul can exist without the body. And it has other means to sense what's going on. If people believe that they're going to continue to live after death, to some extent, that removes the urgency to live your life while you're alive. In fact, I feel like there's a Vatican saying or something to the effect that if people once believed 
for sure that they were in fact mortal and they were not going to continue to live, they would be more intent on living their lives and not postponing their happiness. Maybe there's that one for sure. The one about don't postpone your happiness because we've drunk a mortal brew or something like that. We have added evidence for this, what you just say, by those early who contracted AIDS something like, say, 20 years ago, 20 to 30 years ago, because at that time, that seemed uh, would mean they would die within a few years. So quite a number of them, they spent all the money, they, they made debt, spent it, and they, they got then the surprise when medical progress was sufficient that even though they could not get be cured, but they could sustain to, to, uh, their lives. No? So they had to face paying back their debt. Well, we're doing a very good job of hitting home on the significance of the topic, and we're not moving very far through the specifics of it yet. Let's go back to where Calassini brought up a few minutes ago about the issue of all good and evil consists in sensation, and death is deprivation of sensation. That's kind of his ultimate proof of the whole issue, and his whole argument will stand and fall, I think, on that very contention right there that all good and evil consist in sensation, but death is the deprivation of sensation. So let's go into that. Do you guys agree that that is ultimately the foundation stone on which everything else here is based? I mean, he's not just making an assertion that there is no heaven and hell and just stopping at that point. He is attempting to give us some reasoning and some evidence that would support us reaching his conclusion. I think that's probably the real heart of it right there. So do we accept that it's a good argument that all good and evil consists in sensation, but death is deprivation of sensation? Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and and Lucretius actually takes it one step further. He outlines what is now referred to as the argument from symmetry, which is that you spend your whole life being afraid of death, but before you were born, you spent an entire eternity in a non-conscious state and apparently suffered nothing by that. So the cessation of sensation and consciousness that will come with death is going to be identical to everything that you, I guess, didn't experience before you were born. You know, it's an, an eternity on either end of your life. And so one of the eternities you've already been through. And so you've just got one more coming up, but you won't know it. You won't be alive to experience it. It won't cause you any more harm than all those bad things that happened in the past and we didn't know about it and it caused us no harm. There'll be all sorts of things that happen in the future that we'll not know about and will cause us no harm either. We've included in the episode notes today the section from Lucretius that you're talking about, Joshua. It's mainly in, it looks like, the end of book three. The conclusion of book three is a very long discussion starting around line 830. That also begins with the section, death then is not to us, nor does it concern us a whit, inasmuch as the nature of the mind is but a mortal possession. When I tried to explain this to a non epicurean then he may raise the objection. We simply don't have any memory of what happened in the eternity before we were born. Maybe we were suffering in eternity, we just don't remember it. So what's a good response to that? I think there's a river of forgetfulness, right, Joshua? I'm forgetting whether you're supposed to drink it when you are born and when you die, but... That can, would be the lethe or lethe. I mean, we Martin? can imagine it is similar to the deep sleep state, because in the deep sleep state, we, uh, if people wake up from deep sleep suddenly, they cannot remember what happened, but they can be emotionally in extreme turmoil. So something on is going on in the brain and it doesn't leave a memory, except that somehow if you get excited with fear or something like this, it takes a minute or more to, to get rid of that fear. Mm -hmm. So it's different from these nightmares. Now, if you have nightmares that is in light sleep, when you have this dream phase, so those you can at least briefly remember. And if you train yourself to memorize them, you can memorize them better. Or if it's repeating, you can increasingly memorize it. But from deep sleep, you don't have a memory of what was going on in your brain. But it can be as intense or even more intense than waking up from a nightmare. Well, now, I think that this whole section here in the letter is presenting something that's a remedy toward fear and worry. And it's also presenting a whole worldview that we can basically choose to believe in just like other people, they don't realize how they're choosing their worldview. 
But ultimately, in some sense, this is all theoretical because when we die, we don't know what exists. Nobody comes back from the dead to say, okay, this is what happens after death. So as human beings, we've all created stories to make sense of it. And it seems, especially for me, this makes sense for me because um, it does lead to a sense of peace and it leads to a removal of fear. And I feel it provides a worldview that is in alignment with science and the scientific process, which is very important to me. Yes, and essentially we make a choice. No? And for, for me personally, the Epicurean philosophy is the best choice to do. I think where you are now, Calasini, you've moved to what we have as the third sentence. Therefore, a right understanding that death is nothing to us makes the mortality of life enjoyable, not because it adds to it an infinite span of time, but because it takes away the craving for immortality. And that's beginning to hint at some things we've been discussing a lot lately on the forum around Principle Doctrine 19 and the doctrines that are in that section of the list. But the bottom line is, is that is a practical result of realizing that death is the end of consciousness, the end of sensation, frees us from so many different problems. Not necessarily frees us and just leaves us floating alone, but frees us to then use our minds and use our bodies and use the things that we have available to us to actively pursue the right kind of life. Again, it's so many of these different things, you can state them in sort of a passive way or an active way. Here he's talking about it doesn't necessarily extend your lifespan at all, although presumably if you're using your mind aggressively, you are going to have a longer lifespan than somebody who just sits around calling on witch doctors to help them. But it takes away the craving for immortality. And that would take us back into the direction of 19, which we'll get to later on, about how the mind can understand that a infinite time is really not necessary to live the kind of life that humans have possible to them. At any rate, this whole issue is that a right understanding of this issue of death is very, very important. The very first line in 125 is going to extend that, but I don't want to go there if somebody has another comment before we go there. I just want to add in here because I haven't put in my thought here. You certainly do have to take that sort of step of analysis and ultimately coming down on one side because it's not there's no there's it's not possible to prove that there's nothing beyond the grave. You know, it's and it's not possible to prove that there is anything beyond the grave. Ultimately, an individual has to examine whatever evidence or claims they think they can examine and try to do the best they can. And I personally have satisfied myself that I think I have the best answer to that question, but that will be a stumbling block for many people. They're not going to really even get to the point where they can experience the palliative of not caring about death because they can't make the necessary argumentative leap first. And so I don't know what more to say to those people, but it's certainly a problem. You have to get to a point, and Epicurus is trying to get you to a point where you can accept his claim that death is nothing to us. But if you never get that far, the letter to Minoikius probably isn't going to be very helpful to you, unfortunately. Yeah, I would continue to focus on that line about all good and evil consisting in sensation, because to me, so much of Epicurean philosophy comes back to whether you accept that contention or not. Once you do accept the contention that sensation, the faculties of hearing, seeing on all those along with it, the feeling of pleasure, and of course, this issue of anticipations, once you come to the conclusion that you have to be able to make contact with something or to feel it in the many senses of the word feeling, once you realize that if you don't feel something, it really isn't relevant to you. If you can't somehow come into contact with it now or in the future, then there's really not much difference between those things and just pure imagination and pure dreaming. If you really go down that road of practically speaking, what is relevant to you in your life, it's only those things that you can feel, that, that you can touch, that have some relationship to you. That's the point that everything else hangs on. If you really get rigorous about looking for a standard of proof that requires evidence, if you're willing to base your life on what evidence do you have of something, then I think this is a very good argument.
all good and evil consists in sensation, which is just calculated to make a Stoic or a Platonist or a deist or any kind of theist go wild with anger because feeling is something they consider to be an obstacle to wisdom or something to look down on. But in the Epicurean worldview, if you don't have evidence for it, then there's no reason to think that it exists. So on that point, let me get something in here by Cicero. I can't remember which book this is from, but I'll try and find that and put it into the thread on the forum. He says, if I err in my belief that the souls of men are immortal, I gladly err, nor do I wish this error, which gives me pleasure to be wrested from me while I live. So he doesn't seem to accept Epicurus's terms. He finds pleasure not in coming to terms with death, but in holding to a view of immortality, even if he thinks he's going to be wrong. And certainly the way I read this, this belies to me an intrinsic feeling of pain that he already has and that the pleasure he imagines he has by thinking of the immortal souls of men, whether he's wrong or not, this is a way of responding to that pain. Or that's how I read it. You know, you could almost try to reconcile what you just read from Cicero with what's later on in the letter to Menorchius about it would be better to believe in the myths about the gods than to believe in what is essentially hard determinism. You could almost see Epicurus taking the position that, well, yeah, if believing in this fantasy of living in heaven for the rest of your life is in fact pleasurable to you, then by all means indulge that pleasure. You could, you could see the potential of that argument being made, but I don't think Epicurus would make that argument. And so you've got to figure out a way to, well, how do you reconcile all that together? And I think that you reconcile it through the physics and the epistemology of Epicurean philosophy. He's not just simply saying, if it feels good, do it in Epicurus. He's telling you to think about the implications of what you're doing. And ultimately, yes, you want what you do to feel good. But that's not the way the world is, that you can eat as much ice cream constantly as you want. The world functions in natural ways that are beyond your control. And you have to predict the results of your actions and choose and avoid accordingly. And ultimately, therefore, you've got to take a position on many facts of existence. Is there really a heaven? If there is a heaven, then by all means, I think Epicurus would say, go for it and follow all these rules if, in fact, that guarantees you eternal bliss. But is there evidence that that is, in fact, going to happen? I think Epicurus would say clearly no. And in fact, is there a lot of evidence that that's not going to happen? I think Epicurus would say clearly yes. But you end up having to take a position on factual matters that go beyond just blind faith. If you did not conclude that all good and evil consists in sensation and death is the deprivation of his sensation, then I don't think you could make a reasonable argument that you'd want to be an Epicurean. If you believe that there's an afterlife and that how you spend that afterlife is going to be determined by what you do here, then you're going to live entirely differently. Yeah, definitely. I always forget who wrote this, but there's a book that suggests that it is only Christians who can really be Epicureans because it's only Christians who are making choices that will allow them to experience real pleasure and real happiness. And of course, the pleasure and happiness being described is the pleasure and happiness of heaven. And that Epicurus himself, by making the choices he made, was actually choosing an eternity of pain. It's not a book I think highly of, but certainly the central proposition that if you reject Epicurus's claim of, the, you know, that the soul dies with the body and that there's no experience or sensation after death, you're not going to find anything really helpful in almost anything else he has to say. All right. So I think I've read it briefly, but for there's nothing terrible in life for the man who has truly comprehended that there's nothing terrible in not living. So that the man speaks but idly who says that he fears death, not because it will be painful when it comes, but because it is painful in anticipation. For that which gives no trouble when it comes is but an empty pain in anticipation. And then he doubles down on the nothing to us. For death, the most terrifying of ills, is nothing to us. Since so long as we exist, death is not with us. But when death comes, then we do not exist. It does not then concern either the living or the dead, since for the former it is not and the latter are no more. 
So it looks like he's addressing there this argument that, okay, well, I'm an Epicurean. I don't believe that I'll be suffering when I'm dead, but I'm suffering now because I'm thinking about the fact that I'm going to be dead and it causes me pain now. So apparently some people were willing to go halfway maybe and say, well, I'm not worried about what happens after I die, but I don't like worrying about it now. Yeah, I mean, it's really uh, more of the same, isn't it? This is part of being accustomed to the belief that death is nothing. You have to go over it a number of different times in a number of different ways throughout your life for the idea really to sink in. And here's maybe an angle to approach this. Christopher Hitchens in his autobiography that I've talked about before on the podcast says that, you know, even though he's he's an atheist, he does not believe in punishment or reward after death. He says that the problem with death as he was approaching it was that and the problem with Lucretius and Epicurus and their response to death and and the advice that, that they offer on that point is that his feeling was not that the party was going to come to an end. His feeling was that the party was going to keep going on, the party of life, but that he had to leave early. Mm-hmm. And so there's this, you know, not everybody fears death because they fear what comes on the other side of death. It's for some people, it's they just don't want to stop living. They want to go on living forever. And that's been a huge conversation on the forum lately is this idea of immortality. Yeah, Joshua, that probably takes us on into 126. And maybe we can begin to conclude today by introducing this issue. 126 says that the many at one moment shun death as the greatest of evils, yet yearn for it as a respite. But the wise man neither seeks to escape life nor fears the cessation of life. For neither does life offend him, nor does the absence of life seem to be any evil. And then there's the line that we talk about a lot. And just as with food, he does not seek simply the larger share and nothing else, but rather the most pleasant. So he seeks to enjoy not the longest period of time, but the most pleasant. Sometimes I feel like we ought to just like repeat that every day because I'm not so sure that that really sinks in. And this whole issue of time is so complicated. But I think that's basically what you were just saying, Joshua, is the attitude towards death and the attitude towards life. You don't want to feel like you're missing something after you're gone. So in order not to fear that you're missing something, you have to sort of come to terms with, well, what is it exactly that you're missing? And are you missing anything? Are you missing anything new? Are you missing anything significantly different? Or are you basically mentioning what we might call variation or seasoning. I think I've seen some people discuss it as well. Yeah, we could probably talk for a little bit about this desire, which seems paradoxical to escape life as it relates to the fear of death. It's hard to see what he's writing in response to here. And of course, this is a very difficult subject to talk about. And what we always say on the forum is if you're having mental health problems, don't go to a philosopher, (laughs) go to a therapist, go to someone who specializes in this kind of medicine. And in fact, stop listening to the podcast and go there now. But there's this idea. Was it Seneca who said this this quote? I can't think of how it goes. It's something like, you know, here's how it goes. He says, the path to freedom is always before you. If you don't believe me, just turn over your wrist. I hope I'm attributing it correctly, but it's something that you know Epicurus is not going to advise in any in any situation. In fact, he says that when when you recognize that there's nothing terrible in death, it makes you realize that there's nothing very terrible in life either. I, that's probably a very controversial thing to say, but so I guess the main thrust of this is that. It's something that we've been talking about a lot on the forum is that you don't get an eternity. But if, if you did, it would be nice. It's not that life is meaningless or that we have no desire to go on living or that we should bow out when the time is right or anything like that. It's, you know, if we had more time, that would be great. But there will come a time in all of our lives when we will die. And if you don't think now about how you're going to approach that when it comes, you're probably going to be in a sorry state when it does come, and you're probably even more so going to be experiencing a kind of niggling fear in anticipation of it coming. Well, I would say that there's two different things happening for how to approach this. People who feel secure and healthy and Life seems like it's flowing along really well. There's no sense of death on the horizon. 
that approaching this is very different than someone who is laying in bed with a terminal illness and who knows, oh, they only have six months or three months left to live. I remembered that I once watched a movie called Wit, and that was about from, I think it was the year 2001, so quite an old movie. I'll read the description. Professor Vivian Baring, played by Emma Thompson, an expert on the work of 17th century British poet John Donne, has spent her adult life contemplating religion and death as literary motifs. Diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer, she consents to an aggressive and experimental form of chemotherapy. So the whole movie is about her dealing with, she's facing death and she is reflecting on her life and her work and trying to make sense of her mortality. So it's quite a heavy movie, but in some sense, it kind of takes you through all the steps required of considering your own mortality. Of course, I haven't seen this movie, but the way you describe it, it sounds very interesting. Does the main character in this movie, does she find it difficult to reconcile her actual lived experience with the pain and the fear of death that comes along with cancer, with the more academic approach that she had taken throughout her life? Does she have a moment where she suddenly realizes that maybe she's not as well equipped to deal with this right. as she thought she was? Is that the is that the idea? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a challenge as well. You know, when you say that death is nothing, it sounds so simple, but really there's very little that's simple about death. And I think that this idea of becoming accustomed to the belief that death is nothing, Cassius used the word flippant earlier, and I, I know he didn't really mean that, but it does mean that you're not going to solve this problem today, you know. But as you continue to think about it and you continue to allow your response to what Epicurus is saying here to sort of to mellow or ripen in your mind, and then as you go through life, you'll be able to test that against different things that you experience in life. And then as you come to the end, I think you'll be able to approach that time in your life with the knowledge that this is something that you've been preparing for all the while. Yeah, right, Joshua. When I reference some people thinking it sounds flippant, I certainly did not mean to say that. I think it's flippant. I, yeah, yeah, in fact, no, of course. When I say, <laughs> Right, right. When I say it, it sounds flippant sometimes, I think that's a test. I don't think Epicurus is going to be ever flippant about anything. So if it sounds flippant, to me, that's an indication that we don't understand yet exactly what he's saying, because this is all so deep that if it comes across in a way that makes no sense, then, you know, we can decide whether, well, is it you, the listener, who doesn't understand Epicurus, or is Epicurus just stupid? And generally, I take the position that Epicurus is not stupid. So if it's something sounds uh, discordant, then there's something else to explore through it. And of course, what you're saying also, what both of you are saying reminds me of the, I think it's the Vatican saying about every man approaches death as if he had just been born or something like that. There's ultimately ways to take the sting out of it. But in the end, it's something we all have to live with, have to die with, that we don't live forever. So why don't we begin to close for the day on that note? There is a lot of additional material here that probably what we've done today is just sort of introduce the topic of why it's important and so significant. And we'll come back next week and try to bring it to a conclusion and try to once again put it in perspective. Because, again, it's as Calcini's raised in the example of somebody who spends her whole life thinking about death. You have to wonder if Epicurus would say that that was a good use of her time. While you're supposed to think about it and put it in context, it seems to me a lot of this issue is intended to not only deal with the pain of dealing with it, but also to help motivate you to spend your time wisely while you're still alive. So there's many different perspectives that come from it. And probably, in fact, a whole, a whole episode could be devoted to this issue about just as with food, he does not seek simply the larger share and nothing else, but rather the most pleasant. So he seeks to enjoy not the longest period of time, but the most pleasant. And I think that's one that just has so much implication to it on the issue of life and death and so many other things about what we discuss in Epicurus that it'll be worth spending another week on what we've read today. So in the interest of time, why don't we start with our closing statements for today and then we'll come back next week. So Martin, closing thoughts for today. I have not today. Okay. Calasini, closing thoughts for today. 
So I just remembered something. There's this movement where they call it a death cafe, and people get together to discuss death because it's something that, you know, we kind of sweep it under the carpet. It's not part of regular conversation. There's almost a taboo about talking about death. And I've never been to one myself. I was very close to going, but people just get together and there's usually snacks, tea or cookies or something, and just talking about death and helping each other feel comfortable with that. I don't even know if that was just sort of a fad a few years back, how far that was going on. I know it was happening in Oregon. I don't know if they had it in like California. So maybe a West Coast thing. I don't know if they have it on the East Coast. But I just remembered how there are people contemplating what death means and trying to make sense of it. And so it's an important part of life. And maybe it's something to revive or look into for anyone who's interested in thinking more and also talking with other people. That's very interesting. And you mentioned something that has been recognized and maybe goes under the name of the hidden death. And if you're curious, you can read more about that online. I think it's I think that's what it what it's generally called. But it's the idea that we don't have this face to face moment with death that people would have had. In past times, you know, people no longer die in the home very often. There's this whole professional medical and administrative and funereal apparatus built up around death to, in a way, sort of keep it out of view. And the question that's being asked is whether that's something that's good for people or not. And then when you do want to talk about it, you can hardly talk about it at all because it immediately becomes a conflict with religion. Because the point that Epicurus was making is just directly contrary to any mainstream Western religion that we've grown up with anyway. Cassius, you were barreling toward my closing comment there. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to get in here at the very end was I think that there are people who, when they hear this, are going to just want Epicurus to shut up and think, you know, that, okay, you're you're taking away sort of what Cicero was describing, the pleasurable feeling that I get, my only respite, my last sort of hope in this world is that there's something beyond the grave and and you just want to take that away from me. And all I wanted to articulate Mm -hmm. was the idea that simply to have an opinion about what happens when you die cannot be construed as being in any way a challenge to your individual equanimity. Certainly, it's a challenge to the things that you believe. But, you know, we're not out here trying to just make people miserable. That's not the goal. In fact, it's the opposite of the goal. And one further point would be that if you hold the view, and probably not very common among anyone who's going to listen to this podcast, but if you hold the view that non-religious people, Epicureans, the nuns, as they're now called, if you hold the view that these people just ruin it for everybody by casting doubt on well-established ideas, I would put it to you, as, as uh, Lucian put it to his readers and Alexander the Oracle Monger, that the real people that we should be taking issue with are not the people who are skeptical of claims being made by religion, but the people who have put forward these ideas, probably knowing themselves that these ideas were false. That's where you should direct your contempt. It's not toward Epicurus that you should be directing your energy. Certainly people throughout history have really, really hated Epicurus for things he had to say about life and death. That's fine. You know, I'm not I'm not going to convince you not to do that. I doubt if I could. But just keep in mind the people who convinced you to believe what you believe and ask yourself if it turns out that you're wrong. Is it Epicurus the one to blame or is it? Alexander the Oracle monger or people like him, these televangelists and these people who are just preying on fear and anxiety surrounding these very important issues. Do I have you wound up yet, Cash? Ah, you do. But I I think I'm going to save most of my winding for next week. I'm looking at Lucretius line 80. But in these things, I fear you will suspect you are learning impious rudiments of reason and entering into a road of wickedness. But so far from this, reflect what sad, evil deeds religion has produced. 
And then there's that line, such scenes of villainy religion could inspire. There's more famous so renderings potent of it. So was religion in persuading to evil deeds. Right, right, right. If you think that it's Epicurus who's calling you to tread on unholy ground, look around you and think about who is really the source of the evils that we run into in life, and you'll come up with a different picture. I guess I would give the advice that after thinking about death, after talking about death, it's important to reaffirm the goodness of life and to realize that we have so many opportunities for pleasure and joy. And it's up to us to get creative with coming up with fun things, coming up with good things, happy things, and focus on the creative energy and creative power that we have over our own selves and over our lives and how we can share that with people around us and build friendships. Join the Epicurean Friends Forum and make new friends. I don't know that I have anything else to add today, so we may be ready to stop on Vatican saying 38. He is a little man in all respects who has many good reasons for quitting life. So it's very clear in Epicurean philosophy. For an eternity in the past, you've not been existing. For an eternity in the future, you will not exist. All you have is the time of your life to make the best of it. And so, yes, if you run up into circumstances, as Calasini was talking about earlier, all the different hazards of life that cause you to want to despair and feel like there's no way out, those things do happen. And in certain instances, Epicurus says that you can exit the play when it ceases to please us. Or the analogy that you raised, Joshua, from Seneca about turning over your wrist or many other examples of, of things like that. Yes, the man who does not fear death can really fear nothing terrible in life because he knows there is an exit. But that is not the way to look first. It is a last resort because once you've done that deed, there is no further existence whatsoever. There will never be any additional pleasure for you, no matter how many eons of time go by. So Vatican saying 38, he's a very little man in all respects who has many good reasons for quitting life. And as we'll come back and discuss next week, as we continue in this section on life and death, how Epicurus says the same thing in his letter to Menarchius about how bad it is to wish you had never been born. That is not the Epicurean position. You should not wish you'd never been born because then you would have no opportunity to experience any pleasure whatsoever. So it's a complicated subject, but Epicurus's position, you know, we talk about the analogy of glasses that are half full versus that are half empty. I'm convinced Epicurus, if, if he had to choose one of the two, he'd choose the half full one. As an attitude towards life, there are positive attitudes towards life and there's negative attitudes towards life. I think all of us would agree that Epicurus has a positive attitude towards life. Okay, with that, we'll close for the day and we'll come back in another week. So thank you everybody for your time today. Seize the day. Bye. Okay, bye everybody. Bye. 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 Welcome to episode 137 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean texts, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in this study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we complete our discussion of Death is Nothing to Us and Related Issues. Now let's join Calasini reading today's text. 
but the many at one moment shun death as the greatest of evils, at another yearn for it as a respite from the evils in life. But the wise man neither seeks to escape life nor fears the cessation of life, for neither does life offend him nor does the absence of life seem to be any evil. And just as with food he does not seek simply the larger share and nothing else, but rather the most pleasant, so he seeks to enjoy not the longest period of time, but the most pleasant. And he who counsels the young man to live well, but the old man to make a good end, is foolish, not merely because of the desirability of life, but also because it is the same training which teaches to live well and to die well. Yet much worse still is the man who says, It is good not to be born, but once born make haste to pass the gates of death. For if he says this from conviction, why does he not pass away out of life? For it is open to him to do so, if he had firmly made up his mind to do this. But if he speaks in jest, his words are idle among men who cannot receive them. We must then bear in mind that the future is neither ours, nor yet wholly not ours, so that we may not altogether expect it as sure to come, nor abandon hope of it as if it will certainly not come. Okay, thank you, Calassini, for reading that for us today. We have previously covered the issue of God not being a problem for us, and now we're in this issue of death. We started it last week, but we will finish the issue of death today and then move on as the letter proceeds into other issues. So let's go through each of these parts. The many at one moment shun death as the greatest of evils, but others yearn for it as respite from evil. But the wise man neither seeks to escape life nor fears the end of life. Then there's a really important sentence that follows that. But let's start with that sentence today. As I'm looking at the material that we're going to talk about today, it's kind of confrontational in a sense. As he usually does, he talks about errors in the way of looking at things in a wrong perspective. And so in this first sentence, he's talking about the inconsistency that people have about death in ordinary life. At one time, we shun death as the greatest of evils. And yet there are other times when we actually are happy to receive death as a relief from the really bad things of life. And so as often he does, neither of those two extremes is the correct view. He's saying that the wise man does not seek to escape life, nor does he fear its end. He's happy to continue living, but he knows that the absence of life is not an evil in itself. He's not going to be punished. He's not going to be suffering after life has gone. And why don't we just use that as the introduction to lead into, we touched on it last week, but it's a really important sentence that has lots of implications. And just as with food, he does not seek simply the larger share and nothing else, but rather the most pleasant. So he seeks to enjoy not the longest period of time, but the most pleasant. And in this context of the issue of life and death, it seems that there's a big time element going on here in this discussion. And it would be easy and maybe accurate to say that what he's saying here is that just as with life, we don't seek simply the longest life and nothing else. We search for the most pleasant life as opposed to the longest life equating that to someone at a banquet who doesn't just pack in the cheap stuff at the banquet, but goes for the caviar or the most pleasing type of food. Does that not give us some insight into what he's saying about the length of life? So, Cassius, I might be the only person left on the Stephen Greenblatt train, but in his introduction to the swerve, he makes a point about describing particularly his mother and the way that she looked at life and the way that she looked at death. And she was constantly, fear isn't even almost the right word. She was certain, she was absolutely certain that she was going to die young. And she was certain of it to the point where she would constantly bring it up. You know, every time she sent him off to school, it was, you know, this thing about how she's going to die. And every time that she went away on a trip, it was, you know, I may not see you again and that kind of thing. And while that's true, that's also not a particularly healthy way to live. And the the great tragedy of it and the reason that Stephen Greenblatt found so much relief in reading Lucretius is when you have this fear of death at the forefront, 
not only did this woman live to a ripe old age, and therefore for most of her life she had she had just wasted all this time worrying about her imminent death when it didn't come. But even worse than that, even worse than that is the tendency that people in that state have to poison life, not just for themselves, but for the people around them, the people that they love. And so she had, in her fear of death, allowed herself to lose the best of life and to cause who knows how much anxiety in her family and at least particularly in her son who's writing this book yeah so she had a very flawed attitude towards the whole subject and when i first started reading epicurus and and i still follow many of the suggestions from dewitt i remember how dewitt used to talk a lot about how attitude towards things is a really big aspect of epicurean philosophy he started out the letter by telling us not to worry about the gods and also that death is not going to be terrible for us because we're not going to sense anything. We're not really even going to be there. But he's not just giving us a list of facts to accept. He's telling us what to think about those facts and giving us an attitude towards it. Maybe that's what the section we're talking about today in some is really doing. He's already made clear, you're not going to be suffering. You're not going to be rewarded. You're not going to be experiencing anything after you die. But that doesn't solve the problem for you of what you should think about it right now today. Are you going to obsess over it like Stephen Greenblatt's mother in that example Or are you going to accept it and deal with it? And if you're going to accept it and deal with it, then exactly how do you deal with it? Do you consider it to be a great evil? Do you consider it to be a relief from the burdens of life? And of course, the answer is that everybody's in a different situation and circumstances are going to be different. Everybody's not going to have the same opinion about it. It is a great evil in in certain situations and not the state of being dead because you're not going to experience anything. But but dying before you wish to is obviously something you're going to avoid unless you really are confronting situations where you would find death to be a relief from all the pains that you are dealing with. So you have to have a healthy attitude towards the whole subject. And I guess this example about the largest share and nothing else just really helps focus your mind on the issue that you're not simply doing everything you can to live the longest number of years and months and days. You've got to think about and work towards getting the most out of the time that you do have. Because if you do just focus on the fact that you're going to die young, like Stephen Greenblatt's mother, or the fact that you just want to live to the ripest old age you possibly can, you're going to be missing the whole purpose of being alive in the first place. It's not just to live a long time. The issue of how to live has got to be dealt with. And I guess we could go ahead and the next line, he counsels the young man to live well and the old man to make a good end is foolish. And of course, this is an important clause, not merely because of the desirability of life. Anybody who wants to argue that Epicurus took the position that life is not worth living or that you should make an early end of it or that suicide is an easy way out of problems, these sections here refute that because he's clearly saying, I've never seen any translator who says anything much different than Bailey here when he says because of the desirability of life. It's as if it's it's a given, it's assumed that life is desirable in Epicurean philosophy. That's going to be an unchallengeable position. Because it's the same training which teaches to live well and to die well. What you had said about not just the longest period of time, but rather the most pleasant, there's two ways to look at that. And it's either going forward in time and you're not so concerned about death because you feel healthy and you're young versus being later in your life and you're feeling ill, possibly your death is about to come. And so in some sense, that section could be seen as something that's helpful to alleviate any kind of disappointment regarding not having a longer life. Because in the time that's left, you still can focus on pleasures in life and you can make those last moments seem pleasurable for yourself. That was just an idea that came to me about that last section. This little phrase in here, the desirability of life, does present a kind of a challenge because while life is desirable, meaning that it's something that we want and we want it to continue, it's also something pleasurable. In other words, the life that we have right now, we're experiencing as a kind of pleasure, the life that we could have in the future, we experience as a kind of desire. 
And Epicurus says elsewhere, he says, don't allow your desire for the things that you don't have to affect or to eclipse the pleasure that you experience from the things that you already do have and that you fought so long and hard to get. So that to me is the intrinsic challenge or problem here is that the reason that we have such a problem with the fear of death is because of this problem. While we do want life to keep going on, and it would be great if it just kept going on forever and ever, the desire for that in the face of, I think, what we can consider the known facts is something that might cause you not to experience all the pleasure that you could be experiencing now. Does anybody think I've misput that? The difference between the desirability of future life and the pleasure that we get from life as we experience it now, is that not the right way to look at it? I think you're right, Joshua. I don't have any problem with the way you stated that. And I think a lot of what we're talking about today in the letter is kind of focusing on this issue of you don't have full control. And we're going to get into that as we go forward. We don't have full control over how long we're going to live, but we do have some control. We could choose to kill ourselves if we choose to today. So we can certainly shorten it. And sometimes we can, by our choices, we can extend it, but there's a limit in the amount of control that we have. And if you set out as your number one desire to live forever or to clearly live longer than you have the capacity to live, then you've set yourself up for failure because that's just impossible to do, or at least eternal life is impossible for humans to do. So whether we talk about those words vain and empty desires and so forth, setting a desire for something that is clearly impossible is pretty obviously a bad thing to do. Martin, anything so far? Uh, yes, I, I would like contrast here a little bit uh, on this one. Uh, so on this one, where is it mentioned? The desirability of life. So this is how Epicurus characterizes it. And then in Aristotle, in contrast, in his book on rhetoric, he then mentions life being useful. No? So he refers in, in that this particular context in which he mentions it, where Achille helped his friend, and as a consequence of that one, he knows that he will die, most likely. But for him, then, not helping and living longer would just have been useful, but not honorable. So that means that this desirability of life is completely no criteria. Of course, in that context, also not the pleasure. That reminds me of all this issue about there's only two feelings, pleasure and pain, and how a life when you're not in pain is, is basically a life of pleasure in Epicurean terms. And useful, like you say, is a word that doesn't tell you what it is you're focused on, but desirability, at least to me, is a little more clear that he's focusing on pleasure of it. So I think that's a good distinction, Martin. This is from Walden, one of my favorite books. He says, if we are really dying... Let us hear the rattle in our throats and feel cold in the extremities. If we are alive, let us go about our business. It's, it's kind of about drawing a hard line. Until you're dead, you have plenty to do right now where you don't have to endlessly worry about death or the desire to prolong life. I think that can be maybe helpful. Might have been helpful for Stephen Greenblatt's mother. I don't I don't know. Gosh, Josh, as you were reading that, that struck me as being very similar to someone on the forum this week posted a comment by somebody named Crantor, I think. Crantor, although a stoic philosopher, was reacting against the idea that feelings should be suppressed and said something to the effect that if I'm going to be sick, I want to feel bad. I don't want to be sick and not know I'm feeling bad. As we continue the next sentence, everything is pretty closely related. When Epicurus says, yet much worse still is the man who says it is good not to be born, but then once born to make haste to the gates of death. You know, there's a whole lot of people out there who will take the position that it would be better never to have been born in the first place. I'm not sure there's really a philosophy that affirmatively says that. I think there has been a custom for Christians in some periods to say something like for anybody who takes the position that you're really attempting to release yourself from this world and this life into something else, is it not sort of logical to take the accompanying position that it would be better never to have been born in the first place? When I read this for myself, this sentence to me is pointing to something that if someone is really depressed and upset about being alive, I think it's a very common thing to say even now in time. Like if somebody is having a really tough life, they go, oh, I just wish I had never been born. To me, it points to something that's not a religious thing or anything other than a strange sort of reaction to hopelessness and deep depression that can enter somebody's mind. Well, let me give you two quotes here. One of them comes from Sophocles. 
He says, never to have been born is best, but if we must see the light, the next best is quickly returning whence we came. So that's exactly what Epicurus is referring to there. And Sophocles is before Epicurus, right? I think so. This is where we need Don for the Greek tragedians. (laughs) Yeah, because if that's famous, then that's exactly why Epicurus is mentioning this. He's a few hundred years before Epicurus. So you're right. This is probably exactly what he has in mind. But let me give you another interesting point. There's this weird, weird book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes, which some people think may have been influenced in strange ways by Epicureanism. But in that book, it says, So I have praised the dead that are already dead more than the living that are yet alive. But better than both of them is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Ecclesiastes, by the way, is this person who's always shouting, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. That's his catchphrase. This is a good time for me to repeat that I'm learning this stuff like everybody else is. I try never to put myself out there as an expert on anything. It's an interesting subject for me. That's why I enjoy reading about it and talking about it. But those are two things right there that I should have always had front and center whenever I talked about this passage, Joshua. If Ecclesiastes said that, then obviously it's going to be a Judeo-Christian position that it would be better never to have been born and never to have sinned. So it's very clear that Epicurus is disagreeing with that. Since most of our audience is American, Western, Christian background, that's going to even mean more to us than the Sophocles reference, especially if we don't know if Socrates was advocating it. But can you read it again? What Ecclesiastes said? It says, uh, so I have raised the dead that are already dead more than the living that are yet alive. But better than both of them is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. There's an interesting phrasing here. I have praised the dead that are already dead. This seems to me to be kind of a allusion to the same idea as another passage in the Bible, which says, let the dead bury their dead. In other words, to be living in, you know, on the earth without a promise of a salvation in heaven is to be dead, dead in their sins, spiritually dead. These are phrases that often come up in Christianity. And those were the words of Jesus, by the way, let the dead bury their dead. When he says, let the dead bury the dead, the dead that he's talking about are people who are alive. So he's referring to people who are not saved? People who are spiritually dead, I guess, would be my interpretation. It says here, the phrase, let the dead bury their dead, is another way to say, put your spiritual responsibilities to God before all other duties. I'm sure there's many interpretations. Well, we've got two major ways to go here, contrasting this with just sort of a general person who's depressed, who says he wishes he would never have been born, but also contrasting Epicurus's positions with mainstream religion. Sounds like it ought to be a pretty important part of what we talk about here for a few minutes as well. But I guess we could go ahead and conclude the reading. For if he says this from conviction, why does he not pass away out of life? For it is open to him to do so if he had firmly made up his mind to this. But if he speaks in jest, his words are idle among men who cannot receive them. It's clear that Epicurus disapproves of the idea of wanting never to have been born or wanting an early way out of life. It's clear he disapproves of it. And here he's saying that the person who makes that argument, it's kind of like the man who says he knows nothing, who stands on his head and who's talking nonsense. Because the man who advocates an early death or never having been born shouldn't even be here to make the argument because he should have terminated his life a long time ago if he was serious. But if he speaks in jest, his words are idle among men who cannot receive them. Do you think there's any subtlety there that's not obvious? I don't know about subtlety. I think the people who can't receive his words are people who just sort of laugh them off. You know what I mean? If you're I full of way, it. But yeah, you're full of shit. You're not going to do it. So quit talking about it. You know, that kind of thing. So the two options are if he's serious, he should have already committed suicide. But if he's joking, he's just wasting his breath. This is a particularly tough thing to think about, especially if somebody is feeling suicidal. It's sort of poking at them in a way that says, now, wait a minute, are you sure you really want to die? And it's almost challenging a person to really think about, do they value life or not, their own life? It's almost this really deep feeling to value life no matter what. And so if you go in there and really sit with it, even when you feel suicidal, you kind of realize, yeah, I kind of want to live actually, but if only I could live a better life. So it's a challenge because it almost seems cruel to even 
speak that way or think that way towards someone who feels that down and out and hopeless that they might actually kill themselves. I think that would be the wrong response to come up with this quote to a person who looks to be suicidal. So this is rather for a debate where uh, you look for the general statement. So where someone puts this up, say, as a logical statement, then you can use this one in the debate to refute this. But uh, it's, I agree, it's not appropriate to come up with this quote to talk with someone who is suicidal. I completely agree with you, Martin. This is a philosophy debate with a student who wants to know his ultimate philosophical position. It's not a counseling session for someone who Epicurus thinks is seriously debating suicides or something like that. Hicks translates this as much worse is he who says that it were good not to be born, but when once born to pass with all speed through the gates of Hades. For if he truly believes this, why does he not depart from life? It were easy for him to do so if once he were firmly convinced. If he speaks only in mockery, his words are foolishness, for those who hear believe him not. Epicurus is not here writing to someone who is depressed or seriously considering suicide. He's talking very abstractly, philosophically about the general issue of whether it's better never to have been born or not. Because there are people out there, such as Ecclesiastes and every subsequent person who takes Ecclesiastes seriously in the Judeo-Christian position, who could go to that verse in the Bible that Joshua has read earlier and think after reading it that it would be better if he had never been born. And it's to that person who's making the religious or philosophical argument, I think, that, that Epicurus is addressing here. Okay, that sounds like a good point to get some Richard Dawkins in here. And I've referenced this quote before, but I don't know that I've read it in its entirety. He says in Unweaving the Rainbow, science delusion and the appetite for wonder. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will, in fact, never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred? That's a very powerful way to put it, and I think it's certainly a good way to cap off this issue of whether we are better never to have been born. Epicurus, I think, is very clear that life itself is worth living, not just worth living, but worth extending if possible. It would be good to go on living even longer. And he's got absolutely no truck with this idea that we'd be better not to have been born. That's a great find there, Joshua. And the only problem I have with it is that we should have saved it to the very end of the episode. And in fact, we may just have to come back to that at the very end of the episode, because I can't think of something, in my view, would more accurately state what Epicurus is going towards here. Dawkins is using some allusions there about lotteries and it would cause people to maybe to remember, you know, they ridicule and, and Lucretius the idea that there are souls waiting to be born and jostling with each other to get in place to, to come into life. But nevertheless, that's the reality of the attitude is that those of us who are alive, who get any length of time in life, we're not necessarily better than some non-existent people who've never come into existence at all. We're almost certainly worse than some of them. <laughs> it would be a way of putting it. There's not just some huge stock of immortal souls floating in the universe waiting for this opportunity to have life on Earth. No, no, and you're right. And, and Dawkins is not saying that either. It's, it's kind right. of a metaphorical or poetic way of understanding it, but certainly that's not the view of either of them. But it's very consistent, though, with, you know, sometimes I'm not always completely happy with some of the implications of sort of a Carl Sagan-esque 
huge, immense universe, and here we're one little dot in it and so forth. Some of those implications I don't always go with, but it's sort of a similar picture, though, that in the immensity of space and time, we have come together in this moment, and it's our moment to experience it and enjoy it as best we can. Whether you want to consider it luck or whatever has brought it to this point, to take a negative attitude about it seems very poor use of time. By the way, just to get this in here, we are recording this on August 28th. And in one of the days, I can't remember which one, immediately on either side of when we're recording this is the anniversary of the discovery, roughly 113-ish years ago, of the Burgess Shale, which shed so much light on the early history of vertebrate life. And so if you want to isolate a point in time where we could talk about when this major stroke of luck or chance or whatever you want to call it occurs, it would be some point around the point where you first get this proto vertebrate form of life that ultimately becomes not just all later mammals, but of course, all not just mammals, of course, lizard. I mean, every, every vertebrate form of life comes from this one little worm looking thing or something that looked much like it. And it's out of, that that we managed to win the lottery of stupefying odds to to be born today into this world and that's another point that i wanted to make here which was i think about it this way if we cannot hope to defer death or for any life beyond the grave then we also don't have to because rejecting false claims about death is not just a negation it's also something positive to me. It represents a promise in a way made by nature that we are of this world, of this world. This is something that is a complete repudiation of Christian theology. Christians say that they are not of this world, in this world, but not of this world. But to me, it's far more encouraging to realize that we are, in a sense, at home in the universe. We belong here. We are part and parcel of nature. And Lucretius expresses that in a way that has to do with death, where he says that the earth, which is the mother of all things on the earth, is also the universal sepulcher. And I've found in Romeo and Juliet, in Friar Lawrence's little soliloquy in, in Act 2, Scene 3, maybe, Act 3, Scene 2, I can't remember. He says the earth, that's nature's mother, is her tomb. What is her burying grave? That is her womb. And from her womb, children of diverse kind, we sucking on her natural bosom, find. So that's the other idea that we'll get into here in a little bit, which is something in Lucretius, this idea that while we die, our death prepares the ground for more life to come. I still feel there's some loose ends for me. Because reading this, it brings up the question of, in the Tetrapharmacon, isn't one of the points that the good is easy to get? Because it seems that is really the antidote or really what one would need to focus one's mind on regarding, in the face of death, the flip side is really, well, wait a minute, life is good because pleasure is easy to get, which is a whole like teaching in itself, which Probably, I guess, I don't know if there's any principal doctrine that comes up right away to summarize what that would be. Calasini, I would deal with your question this way, especially given the earlier question you asked as well, that Epicurus is really not writing a letter in the form of counseling to a particular person who is struggling at the moment with the emotions of life and death and those things that go with it. We do have sections that I think do provide that response, and we intend to talk about it a little bit as we finish the episode today as we go into the Lucretius material, because there you're going to see some very specific personal statements that are intended to reconcile someone who is facing death or just is really wrestling emotionally with the issue of why life can't go on forever. But for right here, I would still focus on the question that he's really refuting these other intellectuals who want to argue intellectually that you should never have wished to have been born in the first place, that you'd have been better off if you'd never been exposed to all this sin from an ecclesiastical point of view. I mean, I guess the Ecclesiastes may be implying that you did have a soul that was alive or conscious before birth, and that that soul that was conscious floating out there in the sky somewhere would have been better off if it had never been born. 
Of course, that's very different than what Epicurus would say. Epicurus would say there was no pre-existing soul. So as far as whether the soul was made worse by being born, that would just be totally nonsensical from an Epicurean perspective because that soul didn't exist until it was born in the Epicurean perspective. I disagree with you about what is going on in this section. I think it really can be helpful for somebody on a self-help level. I mean, we have this term now in modern times, self-help. But back then, that's what philosophy was. It was therapy in a way. That's my feeling. That's why I get so passionate about Epicureanism, because I see there are good things in it that can help me live a good life. The reason why I kind of interrupted, Joshua, you were going in a direction toward the Lucretius things that, like the statement that why death is necessary. But, you know, that's that's true and all that, but that really doesn't help somebody if they are feeling like it would have been better not to be born at all. To me, that I don't know what else is on the list of what other points there are, if there's anything that actually helps one feel more joy in life. That's my point that this, I really believe this is, in a sense, it's like existential therapy, which is a whole branch in psychological counseling, although there really aren't very many therapists that do that form of therapy, of existential therapy. I wish I could offhand explain more about what it is, but it's dealing with things of death and meaning and purpose. I think I've missed some of the other points of it, but um, parts of Epicureanism would be compatible with existential therapy. Well, Calisini, I'm sorry. I thought you meant that you did not find this helpful, and that's why I was trying to distinguish between this and some other sections. But if you find that this is helpful, we definitely should go down that road. I thought you were saying the opposite. I thought you were saying that this might be too confrontational or something for someone who was struggling with the issue. Okay, now I'm in a circular thinking here because I know I did say that. I think it just brings up more questions. That's why I said we need to really bring up the idea that... The pleasure is easy to get. That's where I was going off because that's my real problem with the Tetrapromicon being too abbreviated because I don't really find pleasure always easy to get. There are certain types of pleasure that are always available, and that's his point. But sometimes when you're emotionally upset or in difficult circumstances you find that the terrible is not so easy for you to endure and that the good is not so easy for you to get in a superficial way of looking at it. So I've always thought that the full meaning of principal doctrines three and four and and the issues of pleasure and pain are needed to fully explain what the Tetrapharmicon means. But where I interrupted you then was when you were discussing the issue of whether pleasure is easy to get or not and how that relates to the question that we're talking about. The reason why I say all this is because doesn't it say somewhere that it's foolish to even say this whole thing about wishing to have never been born? Foolish is because as Epicureans, we do believe that life is good and there's a way to live joyfully. Right. It's foolish to argue that you should never have been born because if you'd never been born from an Epicurean perspective, you would never have existed. You would never have had any opportunity for anything good for you at all. It's not like an ecclesiastical position. And again, I don't know whether Ecclesiastes took the position that souls preexisted birth or not. I think to some extent, maybe that's implied. For somebody who thinks that you're conscious and floating out in space somewhere can take the position that maybe you were better off there and you never should have come to Earth in the first place. But that's a ridiculous position from an Epicurean perspective because you never existed until you were born. Let me add here the Christian perspective. So the soul is created by God during conception. There are no souls floating around before conception. So that means there, there, there is no, no nothing before. Joshua, I'm trying to think about all the different variations of some Christian arguments that I've heard. Is it clear to you, Joshua, that Christians take the position that they say life begins at conception? My gosh, you hear nothing but that when you hear <laughs> when you live in 2022 and hear the talk about abortion. But as far as whether the soul preexisted or not, I have seen arguments made that there are Christian doctrines that do support pre-existence of the soul. What do you think, Joshua, on that? Is that It doesn't true? make sense for, for earlier Christianism, because the early Christianism, the thinking was even that on the return of the Messiah, 
the dead will rise again. So that means people go to heaven with their body. Yeah, let me give you Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse five, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And yeah, before you were yeah. born, I consecrated you. And then elsewhere it says, I counted the numbers of hairs on your head before I made you or something like that. So I think certainly you can find that idea probably all over scripture. It's probably also possible, given what we know about how people interpret scripture, to find a completely different idea. That's Jeremiah on the subject. I think it rather means that God decided before what you would be, but it doesn't mean uh, uh, that you existed before. Okay, Principle Doctrine 27 says, Of all the things that wisdom provides for the complete happiness of one's entire life, by far the greatest is friendship. So I think in some sense, at least I feel that friendship is really a very important path to happiness. Now, Other people might not agree, but in some ways, it's like the friendship is going to be with you even as you move through life. If you're cultivating friendships, then it gives you some feeling that there's some reassurance that there is someone there to help you through whatever might happen in life. And those pleasures from friendship are relatively easy to get. Yeah. Before we turn to our effort to end on a high note, let's finish this last line of the text from today. We must remember that the future is neither wholly ours nor wholly not ours, so that neither must we count upon it as quite certain to come, nor despair of it as quite certain not to come. It seems to me that's another realistic suggestion that we can't let ourselves fall into despair unless we have some very unusual circumstances. Tomorrow is going to come, and we have some degree of control over how we're going to spend it, and whether we're going to look for the good things in life or despair. So I saw this quote on the wall of an ice cream parlor, and it said, life is like ice cream. Enjoy it before it melts. And I thought that was kind of an interesting idea. Yes, ice cream doesn't melt immediately. You have time to eat it, but you do need to eat it relatively quickly. Epicurean philosophy is that we're going to take this idea, but we're also going to temper it with prudence as far as how we see the future. And so this last section, which you just read, would be something to consider as far as we enjoy life, but we enjoy it with prudence and knowing that it's uncertain exactly how long we have to live. And so we make choices, taking it all into consideration. What we seem to be isolating here to my mind, is is maybe two different threads of how you can look at this. Colosini, you mentioned the therapeutic angle. There's another angle, which is maybe expressed by Montaigne when he says, I want death to find me planting my cabbages, but careless of death and still more of my unfinished garden. That seems to me to maybe another way to look at things, which is that maybe once you've settled in your mind the idea that after all it is better to have been born than not to have been born and that you've accepted that you are going to die and you can't do anything about that that you simply need to get on with the business of living and when death comes it comes but for now i will be happy and you can't let yourself get too worried about unfinished business you know that the interruption could come at any moment totally unexpectedly And you have to be reconciled to the fact that even though it could come any moment unexpectedly, you're still going to do the things that you want to do, even if you never live to see the result of it yourself. Because you can play percentages and you know that it's likely that if you're in good health, you're going to continue to live on for some period of days or weeks or months at the very least. But you really don't know that that meteor is not going to come out of the sky and fall right on your bedroom any moment. So you never have total control over how much time you have left. On the other hand, you can have a good sense of confidence that you can predict the length of time that you're going to have. So you've got to be prudent. The word prudence keeps coming up and not let yourself fall into some extreme of despair or disconnectedness from reality. Because the reality is you do have some control over how long you're going to live. Yeah, this issue of prudence is an interesting one. Is it ever the case where you can just sort of put prudence to the wayside? The reason I'm thinking about this is because our friend and sometime podcast panelist Don has gone to the work on the forum of pulling out all of the nautical and seafaring references in Epicurus and in Lucretius and maybe some others. 
And we've been trying to decide what to make of that. And I don't know if we've settled upon any certain idea, but what I proposed was that there's something inherently dangerous, not to say reckless, in going out on open water. But that maybe what we really need from Epicurus's point of view is to expose ourselves to a certain amount of risk or danger so that we can better understand what it means not to be afraid of death. Yeah, Joshua, this is the time. Let's go ahead and discuss that other analogy in that same thread you're talking about, the one that's the ship in port is the safest, but that's not what ships are for. Let's talk about the implications of that one, because I wasn't entirely sure whether you agreed with that one or not in the thread. So what do you think about that one? Well, I, first of all, I think it's interesting because, Colasini, you had a picture of that and you said it was hanging on a wall in a restaurant or something somewhere, much like the ice cream quote. So this is an excellent source of philosophy is going out to eat. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I certainly I certainly see a lot of value in that. And that's kind of what Montaigne is saying here is that, of course, Montaigne is a terrible, terrible example of this because – he absolutely did shut himself up in his room with his books for the last half of his life and didn't do anything risky at all or didn't expose himself to the outside world really much at all. But to me, there's a kind of, I guess I don't know if I want to say sickness, but it's too negative, isn't it, to always be focused on this issue of death. Or the issue of safety to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I'd rather do and what I hope I've in some sense managed to do in my life is to come to a conclusion about death and about what it means to me and about the knowledge that I will die and satisfied myself more or less that I won't have any life beyond the grave. And once I've got that all more or less worked out, I'll continue to revisit the issue as I'm doing here today. But I'm also hoping that I can go out now and do other things, right? And, and not have to worry so much about death because I think I understand it. Calasini, what about the ship in port? Well, I was thinking about how there's different ways to gauge when it's safe to sail. In fact, I looked it up. For the Mediterranean, you're going to have rough waters, most likely in fall and winter. And spring and summer is going to be really good weather for sailing. But it did say occasionally there can be storms even during that time, but they're very rare. So as far as prudence, you would choose the time of year that's safe, and you would make sure there were no storms on the horizon. And then you would be more likely to sail out of the harbor and make it to your destination safely. And what about the aspect of the quote that says that the ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are for? What's the take home of that saying? Well, if you're always saying it's safe in life, are you really living? So you take risks, but you, you choose risks that are not extreme. You choose risks that might only have a very small potential for something going wrong versus something that has a larger potential for going wrong. Yeah. And the point of exposing yourself to risk is not to get, you know, is not to go out and get killed, but it's to unsettle yourself when it comes to the idea of death. I think people try to hide death in a hole. They don't want to think about it. And as I think we maybe talked about in the last episode, our whole society has done a very good job of eliminating death from before our eyes. We don't see it. People used to die at home. Now they go to the hospital. People used to be buried by their family. Now they're prepared by morticians. And so the specter of death, as it were, in the form of the dead body of someone that we love is not something that we're exposed to in the way that people would have been exposed to it for centuries. And we just have to get used to that and continue our lives anyway. Martin, let me ask you, what is your view of that saying about the ship is safest in port, but that's not what ships are for? It's like the way Colossini put it. No? So the, that means if, if you play it safe, you don't have the most pleasure in play. Like that. But on a comment of what, of what was said afterwards uh, or just before, so I don't think that I take risks just to get reminded of this or to, to, to get this exposure to. I simply take risks because I gain more pleasure as a consequence of the action. And the risk is just a potential pain, which I have to counter, uh, which I have in there to consider whether it was wild. Right. As you say that, I'm thinking of a picture I think I saw of you once hanging on, uh, what are those, uh, what are they called? Zipline, like zipline. Zipline, yeah, zipline suspended over a canyon or something. Exactly. So this one is a great pleasure and the risk is very low. So that means this is a risk I like to take. Looking at the clock and thinking about where we are, 
it's probably a good idea for us to let go of the goal of attempting to talk too much about the Lucretius material. We can put that in the show notes and we can always come back to that in the future as the ways that we have arguments from Lucretius that Epicurus would have made as well about reconciling ourselves to death. The real way we need to proceed, I think, as we begin to close this episode, as we begin to close the discussion of death and the letter to Menorchius, is to stay with this central point that what is our attitude towards death going to be? We know that it's there. We know that it does limit our ability to do certain things in life. And so how are we going to proceed with our lives? How are we going to sail our ship? Are we going to consider our ship as being better just anchored in port from the moment it's built to the moment we scrap it? Or are we going to consider that life has to be lived in order to experience the pleasures that are possible to us? That's probably the way to end this discussion, to put it in that kind of a perspective. Because it seems like that's what Epicurus is doing with most of this discussion here. He's certainly acknowledging that death is out there, that it's final, that there's not going to be an experience after death comes, but that that doesn't mean that we should just immobilize ourselves like a deer in a car headlights, just stand there and do nothing because of it. It means that we take the facts of life and death and then go forward and not simply stay in port like that ship at anchor. I think we're all pretty much in agreement with that general orientation, but let's think about how to conclude this section on that basis. What's our attitude towards death going forward? You know, it's interesting that Thoreau, in the conclusion to Walden, says something very similar to that quote by John Augustus Shedd. He says, rather be the Mungo Park, the Lewis and Clark and Frobisher of your own streams and oceans. Explore your own higher latitudes with shiploads of preserved meats to support you. And then he goes on to say, were preserved meats invented to preserve meat merely? It's the same kind of idea that we have these things so that we can go and, as Thoreau says elsewhere, adventure on life. Of course, the Epicurean perspective being that we were not launched off by some supernatural shipbuilder and we're not using our ship according to what some supernatural shipbuilder told us to use it for. We're evaluating our ship and using it for what we interpret. Nature has has had... Uh, not necessarily in mind, but what what has happened as a result of nature creating this ship. Always there, what has nature given us other than pleasure and pain, which is the Epicurean perspective. Yeah, let me tie that in, because what Lucretius also says is that we come into life like a baby thrown onto the shores, screaming. And there again, you have a reference to the sea. And, and in a sense, I see that sea as being maybe kind of the universe itself, the restless motion of atoms through the void, this generative power that exists in nature that gave rise to you and that when you die will subsume you back into itself. And just as sort of a point to really drive it home, Thoreau, who I've mentioned several times, his last words at the moment of his death were, now comes good sailing. He did not believe in an afterlife. So what he meant, I think, was that he had lived a good life, was happy with it, and that death, as Lucretius says elsewhere, in addition to being an end to life and an end to pleasure, is also, when it comes in good time, is an end to pain. And Thoreau was dying of tuberculosis, so there was great pain indeed. So, Calasini, you asked some good questions about how Epicurus's advice translates into real world situations. What are you thinking now at the end of a discussion on death is Epicurus's main point? Well, we started with death is nothing to us. And so then we covered all the reasons why that is true. And also the flip side of it is that you still value life. So it's not like you're going to say life is not important just because death is nothing to us. And the very last sentence of this section, which was indicating that you're neither going to hold on too tightly onto life nor reject life. So there's a balance between how you make sense of life and death. That reminds me of the DeWitt material about life does not lose its value because it doesn't go on forever. Just because it ends doesn't mean that it wasn't valuable in the first place, that it isn't valuable now. And we often talk in the DeWitt material about sometimes he'll go off in a different direction that may not make complete sense. And this may be one of them because DeWitt ends up taking the position that Epicurus thought that life itself was maybe the ultimate good. And that's a big rabbit hole when you start talking about ultimate goods and so forth. But I think that DeWitt's 
certainly right when he points out that in Epicurean philosophy, pleasure and pain, which are the ultimate guides of life, they have no meaning unless you're alive. They have no meaning other than to the living. And so the ability to have life is a prerequisite to the experience of any kind of pleasure at all. So it's the opposite of saying death is nothing to us. It, it really is true that in a real sense, life may not be everything for us because there are times when we'll choose to leave life. But for the implication that death is nothing to us, if you, if you take it superficially, that means that the issue of death is not important. You could do the reverse and say that, in fact, life is extremely important. And that permeates through all of Epicurean philosophy. You're just not going to take a superficial attitude towards the importance of your life. It's the most important thing that you have that allows you to experience pleasure. You can talk about friendship and other tools for pleasure, but if you're not alive in the first place, all the friendship and other things in the world aren't going to get you anything. You have to be alive. And so it's perfectly sensible that Epicurus would mock somebody who says that it's good never to have been born or to make haste to pass the gates of death. You absolutely don't want to make haste to pass the gates of death. You'll do it when you have to, but until then, you'll get the enjoyment that you can out of life. So we're beginning to come to the end of the episode for today. So we took upon it as a challenge that we would make sure we tried to end this on a high note. So let's go around the table and discuss our high notes. Now, saying it that way creates something of a challenge because I then would normally say Martin would be first. Are you ready to end on a high note, Martin? I feel on a high note, but I have nothing to say. <laughs> You may not have anything to say, but you're experiencing the pleasure of, hopefully, of our discussion today. Calasini? There is a challenge for myself, which would be, I need to really think about what I can do in my life to improve my friendships and put more time and effort into making friends, because it's such an important part, I think, to have friendship in life. And also, as far as the kinds of friendship, it challenges me, in what way can I increase the way that the Epicurean philosophy is in the world and how there's potential that I can help teach people Epicurean philosophy. And in that way, there's a whole avenue of building friendship. And especially it's important to have people who think in a similar way, have similar goals in life. So that is an important part of friendship, that there's the shared common interests so it's really a challenge to me to put more effort into building friendships in life. Joshua, shall we go back to Richard Dawkins? <laughs> <laughs> Let me do this first. This might be more of a bittersweet note than a high note, but there's this really great webcomic and I don't know if he still writes it or not, but it's called XKCD. And there was this particular comic where it was vector drawn, so you could just sort of zoom in as much as you wanted, and it was drawn huge. So but the more you scrolled out, the more you saw, the more you zoomed in, the more you saw. And you're just looking at stick figures doing all kinds of different things. And the guy who's speaking says, talking about life, he says, they told me it would be happy, and it was. And they told me it would be sad, and it was. But I just didn't know it would be so big. And that, to me, reminds me of something. I'll post it in the show notes if I can find it. I was just looking for it now. When Romeo and Romeo and Juliet is on the verge of ending his own life, Friar Lawrence says to him, have peace. The world is broad. You know, he's talking to possibly a 15-year-old who had never set foot outside of the city of Verona who thinks he's got a good cause for ending his life. But in fact, there's not one of us who has tasted even a fraction of 1% of what the world has to offer. And if you haven't done that, then life has got to still be worth living. And now, with that being said, I can go into Richard Dawkins. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place but who will, in fact, never see the light of day, outnumbered the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds. How dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state?
from which the vast majority have never stirred. That certainly, through Richard Dawkins, gives us a good way to summarize and end this topic of death. We'll come back next week and move forward from the topic of death and start talking about the reason for living, the way to pursue pleasure and happiness in life. And Epicurus is going to give us some really good advice on ways to look at that after he's now given us good advice at the ways to look at death. So with that, we'll come to a close for the day. Thanks, everybody, for participating. And we'll be back next week. See you next week. Thank you. Okay, pleasure. bye. <laughs> bye. Welcome to episode 138 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean texts, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we continue our discussion of Epicurus's letter to Menoikius, and we begin our discussion of the nature of pleasure. Now let's join Martin reading today's text. We must consider that of desire some are natural, others vain, and of the natural some are necessary and others merely natural. And of the necessary some are necessary for happiness, others for the repose of the body, and others for very life. The right understanding of these facts enables us to refer all choice and avoidance to the health of the body and the soul's freedom from disturbance since this is the aim of the life of blessedness. For it is to obtain this end that we always act, namely to avoid pain and fear. And that when this is once secured for us, all the tempest of the soul is dispersed. Since the living creature has not to wander as though in search of something that is missing and to look for some other thing by which he can fulfill the good of the soul and the good of the body. For it is then that we have need of pleasure when we feel pain owing to the absence of pleasure. But when we do not feel pain, we no longer need pleasure. And for this cause, we call pleasure the beginning and end of the blessed life. For we recognize pleasure as the first good innate in us. And from pleasure, we begin every act of choice and avoidance. And to pleasure, we return again, using the feeling as a standard by which we judge every good. And since pleasure is the first good and natural to us, for this very reason, we do not choose every pleasure. But sometimes we pass over many pleasures when greater discomfort accrues to us as a result of them. And similarly, we think many pains better than pleasures, since a greater pleasure comes to us when we have endured pains for a long time. Every pleasure, then, because of its natural kinship to us is good. Yet not every pleasure is to be chosen. Even as every pain also is an evil, yet not all are always of a nature to be avoided. Yet by a scale of comparison and by the consideration of advantages and disadvantages, we must form our judgment on all these matters. For the good on certain occasions we treat as bad and conversely the bad as good. Okay, Martin, thank you for reading that for us. We are now going to embark on two episodes at least on discussions of pleasure from the letter to Menoikius. There's some very complicated material in here, and there are a lot of opinions out there in the world about some of the details of what we're going to be reading. But I think for purposes of this podcast, it's going to be best for us to take sort of a common sense approach to what we're reading and keep in mind the big picture of what we've already read in the letter to Herodotus, the letter to Pythocles, earlier here in the letter, and also in what we're going to read in the rest of the letter. 
So we're going to need to integrate the details in with the big picture and not let the big picture get out of focus. And of course, the big picture is that there's no supernatural God. There is no life after death. Everything ultimately is made out of atoms moving through the void. We have the issues of epistemology and all the issues of physics that inform what we're about to discuss today. And of course, what that means is there's no God, there's no heaven and hell. The only life we have is this lifetime. So we have to intelligently use our time as best we possibly can. I've always thought myself that someone who really becomes convinced that Epicurus was right, that there's no heaven or hell or experience of any kind after death, that in fact there's an eternity of time before we were born and an eternity of time after we die, and only in this lifetime do we have the chance to experience any kind of pleasure at all. I've always thought that a person who really understands that point is going to be very concerned about using this lifetime as productively as you possibly can for whatever it is you decide the goal of life is to be. And so that's what we're talking about here as we discuss pleasure and the role it plays in happiness. And so we'll go through what Epicurus is saying here and try to compare it with some of the other texts that we do have a command of, such as the Torquatus material that we've previously read and what we know from Lucretius. And also there are other authoritative texts that survive from the ancient world that can help us put the whole thing into perspective. So why don't we start this week by, of course, the text begins with the famous division of desires into natural and necessary. We must consider that of the desires, some are natural, others vain, and of the natural, some are necessary, and others merely natural. And of the necessary, some are necessary for happiness, others for the repose of the body, and others for very life. And then the next line, the right understanding of these facts enables us to refer all choice and avoidance to the health of the body and the soul's freedom from disturbance, since this is the aim of the life of blessedness. So the aim of the life of blessedness is not to obey God, because there's no supernatural God in Epicurean philosophy. The aim of the life of blessedness is not to secure your place in eternal bliss in heaven, because there is no such place in Epicurean philosophy. So what is the best use of the life that we have? And when he refers to the health of the body and the soul's freedom from disturbance, what does that mean to an Epicurean? Well, let me comment on a very general approach, and that would be taking in the whole context of not just the text that we're reading, but of what happened to it and how it came back. And of course, for this, I almost have to go to Stephen Greenblatt since that was his whole thesis. And what he says in the swerve is this. He says something happened in the Renaissance, something that surged up against the constraints that centuries had constructed around curiosity, desire, individuality, sustained attention to the material world, the claims of the body. And I particularly remembered that because of that phrase, the claims of the body, because what we're talking about today is partially pleasure and how we should understand that, but it's also partially desire and how we should understand that. And it's critical to me that we understand desire as being something that is closely linked with what Greenblatt calls the claims of the body. And when you frame it in that context, what it tells me at least is that desire is not in itself bad or unworthy. It's not something that we should necessarily avoid. We're going to hear things in this letter that almost make it sound like desire is the enemy and that tranquility or absence of pain is the fruit that we should be pursuing. But in fact, if you accept that as your goal, you are like Don Quixote jousting with windmills because the fundamental desires of human life never go away. And if you accept that, that they never go away, you accept that the blessed life of the Epicurean gods is not available to us. What that does is it throws the question back in your lap. If you are going to experience desires, if you are going to experience dissatisfaction, what kind of life are you going to live knowing that you're human, knowing that these things are never going to go away, knowing that you only have one life to live? Are you going to go, as Cassius always says, are you going to go live in a cave and stare at the wall and enjoy your freedom from disturbance and trouble? Is that the goal? 
And I don't think that that is the goal. I think that if Epicurus thought that was the goal, he wouldn't have written this down because he'd be away living in that cave. So there has to be something more in my view than the mere surface implication here. Now, peace, tranquility, freedom from disturbance, absence of pain. These things are all components for me of the blessed life. And as Don would repeatedly say, these are kinds of pleasure in themselves. And if pleasure, as it says in 129, is the beginning and end of the blessed life, if it is the first and natural good, then these are going to form a component of what we're pursuing. But if we do what Diogenes Voinwanda repeatedly censures people for doing, which is confusing the means with the end, we're going to have a problem. So how do we get around that? How do we take this idea of tranquility, freedom from disturbance, absence of pain, and put these in their proper place in the context of a means to an end? Or are they the end? That's the question we're going to try and hopefully get a hold of today. Joshua, I think that's very well said. And you could almost stir me up to go on another rant based on the way you said that. Because get back to what Stephen Greenblatt was talking about in his book, the emergence of these views during that period against the backdrop of religion at that particular time. To me, so much of this is always a matter of a struggle between the body versus the spirit world, sort of. The whole idea of religion, that we are at war with this world, that our souls are trapped in the flesh, and that we're struggling to get free of of those problems of the flesh, and that the desires and the pleasures of the flesh are something low and to be fled from and suppressed in favor of something that's supposedly more noble and higher in the spirit world. That is a war of something against this world. And Epicurus is a philosopher of this world and of the things that we observe around us. He's never giving in to this idea of a platonic ideal out there or a religious ideal of any kind. He's embracing the world as we see it and feel it around us. And he's never agreeing with these guys who allege that there's something wrong with pleasure and with the way we feel things or with desire in and of itself. So to me, that's the big framework here is that Epicurus is willing to wage war, as Lucretia says early in book one, against the gods glowering down at humans who are crawling around in oppression on the earth. He was the first to burst the gates of nature and liberate us from those fears and oppressions and show us the path to reach for the skies ourselves as human beings. So that's the biggest picture here, that pleasure and desire are not something to be fled from and suppressed in this world or within ourselves, that they are ourselves, that they're all that we are, that while we have a spirit in the sense of the ability to think and to articulate words and so forth, that we are not spirit creatures trapped in our bodies. We are, in fact, whole beings that when Epicurus talks about the health of the body and of the mind, these are physical attributes that we have, and they're all that we have. When Epicurus says that pleasure and pain are the only guides given by nature of what to choose and avoid, he is contrasting that to this idea that there's some spiritual realm that's higher that we should attempt to escape to or suppress our desire. As you were saying a minute ago, Joshua, when you're talking about the illustration of living in the cave, you're going to come to the end of your life at some point. And when you get to that point and you are about to die and you look back at your life, are you really going to want to say that you had a really good time sitting in that cave, eating bread, drinking water and staring at the wall? That's not a vision of life that I can imagine Epicurus promoting. So having said those things about the generality, we still have to deal with what we're going to read in these texts about pain and fear and how to deal with them. And I think that there are good ways to understand everything that's said here without ever coming close to a conclusion that you should suppress all desire, that you should suppress all feeling. Those are Stoic or other Eastern type ideas that are not, in my view, inherent in these texts. And we can go through these texts and see if we can't find ways to understand them that do not imply that we are at war with all desire or at war with pleasure. And when we come to the end of this text, we hope to be able to say, like Diogenes of Oinwanda, having already reached the sunset of my life, 
being almost on the verge of departure from the world on the count of old age, I wanted, before being overtaken by death, to compose a fine anthem to celebrate the fullness of pleasure. So with that in mind, I think the first thing we need to do here is to consider what we mean when we talk about desire. Because desire is, I think it's like the sixth word in this first sentence. We must consider that of desire, some are natural, others vain, and of the natural, some are necessary, and others merely natural, and of the necessary, some are necessary for happiness, others for the repose of the body, and others for very life. So how do we get a handle on that? Because I've said before, and I still think this is more or less true, that desire presents to us as a feeling. And Epicurus, Cassius, as you referenced a moment ago, says that there are two feelings and that those are pleasure and pain and that desire presents as a kind of low-level dissatisfaction, which would be categorized, in my view, as a kind of pain. I don't know if you've come around to that idea or not, but I'm going to keep saying it because I really think that's a good way to understand it. Now, one thing I'd like to get in here is that just because I say that desire presents as a kind of low level dissatisfaction or pain, that's not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing, right? The desire for water to a person who's dying of thirst is a goad that nature gives us, it gives our minds, gives our bodies to go get some water before we die. So in that sense, it, without it, you know, we might not go on living for very long. So while it does present as a kind of pain, in my view, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Joshua, are you really focusing, though, on unfulfilled desires as opposed to fulfilled desires? Because is not every feeling something ultimately that you desire to have? Every pleasure is something that you start out with a desire to have. I suppose you could just say things just happen to you and you never even (laughs) thought about them before they fell on your head. But in most things in life, we have to initiate action of some type. And if we're planning to initiate action to achieve pleasure or to avoid pain, is it that planning to undertake action? Is that what desire is in that context? How would you deal with that? Yeah, I think you're on the right track. But as I say, I I just don't think it's a bad thing, even though I think that, you know, we're animated by a desire for something by a feeling of dissatisfaction. Right. The reason the Epicurean gods just sit up there and don't do anything is because they don't have any desire. They don't experience it because they are totally fulfilled in a life of blessedness. They don't have any unfulfilled desires, but they're surrounded by pleasures of every kind of mind and body, according to the Torquatus material. So I'm not sure I would say that the gods don't have any desire, but they certainly don't have any desires that are not met, it sounds like. Let's continue to talk about that, because were we to conclude that desire itself is a bad thing, that would be a very troubling conclusion that would lead us in directions that I don't think any of us think Epicurus was going. (laughs) So does the whole equation get solved by talking about unfulfilled desires versus fulfilled desires? Or what's the best way for somebody new to Epicurean philosophy to think about that? Because indeed, if in fact Epicurus is telling you to limit all desires across the board without regard to whether you can achieve them or not, then you might as well join the local Buddhist temple or the local stoa and go that direction, because that does not appear to be. Epicurus, it says, he would not know what the good is were it not for the pleasures of this list of things he says, I think sex and food and maybe dance or something like that. So we better not go too much further without trying to decide whether Epicurus is saying that all desire is a bad thing or not. Well, I don't think it's all a bad thing, but I do think it presents as a kind of pain or dissatisfaction. But I also don't accept something you said a minute ago, which is that we should shun desire or try to get rid of it. Because what we have is another mode of dealing with desire, and that is simply to satisfy the desire or fulfill the desire. I don't think Epicurus is going to take the ascetic view of someone who's saying that, you know, okay, you experience hunger as a kind of desire, and it means that you want food. And of course, this is very natural. You're made of matter. As you use it up, you need to replenish it. This is what food is, matter and energy. And so you have to eat. You have this ingrained, you might almost say evolutionary or instinctive desire to eat. So you eat, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, you could take the view that you need to fast. This is something that's prevalent across many religions, is this idea that you have to fast. 
And what they're trying to do, in my view, is wrestle desire to the ground. You know, I don't want to be governed by desire. This is the view they seem to have. Well, that's, I think, a slightly neurotic take on this. What you could do simply is satisfy the desire for hunger. You're not required to have the most luxurious banquet to satisfy the desire for hunger. Even a simple meal will do. But you also have to understand that that desire is going to come back around again. But that's the other point is that you're talking about fulfilled desires. I think that when a desire becomes fulfilled, it goes away, at least temporarily. Good point. Let's see if Martin or Calasini have anything to add. Yes. So there's is another aspect to desire. This is a drive to action. So that means if we desire something, we take action to get this. And of course, after we took the action, the desire is gone. No? So, so from that perspective, these desires go away once we took it. So, Martin, how would you explain to a younger person, for example, should they consider all desires to be bad? Desires are neither good or bad. <laughs> the desires are drives for us to action, and we use our reason to make judgment which which of these desires are choiceworthy and which are not. No? So that means we choose which which action to take to fulfill what desire. When you say drive to action, you almost remind me of a Nietzschean will to power type of a statement there. But the question I think would still remain, the will to action, the drive to action, should we cultivate drives to action or should we, as a general rule, consider drives to action to be things to minimize? There's no need to minimize. We just choose which ones we actions we take. And no need to minimize. Maybe under some aspects, some people, depending on how energetic they are, they may choose to maximize, actually. Let's talk about just from a very general point of view. Is Epicure saying that whether you want to define desire as a, a drive to action or a will to power or some other active word description of activity, should we attempt to minimize that aspect of human life? Is there any aspect of human life other than desire for action of some kind? If desire is a feeling to accomplish something or get something that you do not currently have, are those generally something to be reduced in number as much as possible? No, no. I mean, there's no criterion in Epicurean philosophy to, to tell something like that. The goal is pleasure. And those set of desires, if we get them fulfilled, that they, are, that they help to maximize pleasure, those we pursue and the others we forego. I have a feeling you are approaching this from a very practical point of view, but Joshua and Calasini. I was just going to say, as far as understanding desire, if we look at just the feeling and we completely separate it from the objects, then that in some way makes this confusing because of this first opening section where we're comparing the natural and the vain versus some are natural and necessary, some are just natural, all these categories that are created. If we don't look at the objects, then this whole thing won't make as much sense for understanding how we see things or how we decide. Because further down, it's going to start talking about choices and avoidances and how we choose. So in some sense, it's almost like we do have to look at the objects of what we're desiring and then see whether or not they are going to fall into these categories for us, how we see things. Yeah. When he talks about health of the body and freedom from disturbance. I desire to have health of the body. I desire freedom from disturbance. It may be that I might have to take dramatic physical action in order to obtain health of the body and freedom from disturbance. So is that not even a circular issue in the first place if you try to divide the term desire from the object of desire? That's another thing we talk about a lot, I know, on the forum, is whether you can or should divide those two, as you were just saying, Calasini. And it might be that it becomes too confusing. It may be that it is becoming too abstract to try to divide desire from the object of desire. Just like when we talk about pleasure as an abstraction, it becomes very difficult if we don't try to identify back to individual feelings of pleasure so as to understand what pleasure is. But Joshua, what are you thinking based on what you're hearing uh, Martin and Calasini say? 
Yeah, I think Colosini is going in the right direction when we get down to a detailed level of how we approach each individual desire. And I think that's absolutely a direction that we have to go in the course of this episode and the next as we talk about this issue. As I take a general view of desire with sort of the detailed view in mind, I just want to get two things on record here. One, I don't think that desire is bad. And I think that if you're going to try and minimize desire, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. And one of the ways to do that is to just fulfill or satisfy the desire. As to the issue of ambition, or if you have what seems to be an outsized desire, I think Lucretius gives a good example in his own person to sit down and write this long, extensive, difficult, intricate, magnificent book of verse running to something like 7,000 lines. There must have been in Lucretius a desire to write on the nature of things. And he apparently, as an Epicurean, decided for himself that rather than just letting that difficult time-consuming ambition go by the wayside, that he would fulfill it. And he thought he would fulfill it, or he, he decided to, based on what he anticipated he would get out of it, which was, I think, pleasure for himself. He says in, uh, is that the pro to book four, where he says that a pathless country of the Pierides I traverse where no other foot has ever gone. I love to taste virgin springs and Uh, Mm -hmm. nature weaves a garland of flowers for me that no other person has ever worn, that kind of thing. He wants to do something new. Certainly he achieved that. He wants to do something beautiful. Certainly I think he achieved that. So this issue of desire is complicated by the idea that sometimes to pursue the thing is exactly what we should do. And in Lucretius's case, I'm very glad he did because without him, our source material is paltry indeed. So I guess you have something to say. Go go ahead. We may end up dividing this section into 20 episodes instead of two episodes, but sometimes rabbits just have to be chased and we have to chase this one for a while longer. So I wasn't intending to stop you at all, Joshua, because there are many situations where people are going to read on the Internet that desire should be understood as wanting something you don't currently have. And we're going to run into text of Epicurus. We're going to run into many people who will make arguments that that's the whole problem. You should not want anything that you don't already have. Therefore, you should eliminate all, quote, desire, unquote, from your life. And they look at it in a very broad way. I think that eliminating desire from your life is something that's readily recognizable by a lot of people as a viewpoint that is out there, either within religion or different psychologies or other philosophies. So we might as well come to terms with this at the very beginning of this discussion. And to be very clear on this point, what is desire in Epicurean terms and is it to be minimized across the board? If desire is to be minimized across the board, that leads in one direction. If there are some desires that are not only not to be minimized, but are to be expanded or to be encouraged, then we need to be clear about that. So we just need to really dig into this question of what is Epicurus's attitude towards desire? And if we can't become clear about that, then we're really not going to make a lot of progress. We're going to leave everything in a continued state of confusion if we seem to be ambivalent about is desire something that is good? Is it inherently good? Is it inherently bad? Is it inherently neutral? What are we talking about when we say desire? And I come back to the question that I think is the most practical way of expressing it. Is it fair to say that desire is to be suppressed in Epicurean philosophy? My answer to that is no. And the reason my answer is no is because that doesn't work. Suppressing desire is an age-old remedy that has been tried time and again, and it just doesn't work. Now, I think that a lot of this is based on a misreading of what Epicurus says elsewhere, which is that he says, do not allow the desire for things you don't have to ruin the things that you do have and that you fought so long and hard to get. And I think that people read that and they think, "Okay, I'm not supposed to let desire ruin the things that I already have. Therefore, this is the conclusion they make. Therefore, I just need to uproot all my desires, throw them by the wayside and just be content with what I have. That's an option. You can do that. But you're going to find that very difficult. 
And I think that Lucretius in particular gives us the most extensive treatment of this issue. And I think that what Lucretius would say is, as he says in his poem, sometimes just uprooting the desire is foolish. And what you have to do instead is just satisfy the desire. It presents to us as a kind of dissatisfaction. But just by satisfying the dissatisfaction, you might get some small pleasure out of that. But you also get the larger pleasure of not being gnawed by that desire at the moment. And he says about sex, and I have to put this in rather graphic terms because Lucretius puts it in graphic terms. He says, spill the gathered seed in anything at all. That's almost an exact quote from Lucretius. This is his view on how we should deal with sexual desire. Cassius, you probably know more Lucretius than I do. You agree that that is a quote I'm having trouble uh, That is clearly is in that very famous section about sexual romantic love. And Lucretius does make that very point. He's talking about how in romantic love or sexual lust and so forth, you become intoxicated basically by the thought of fulfilling your desire here. And that intoxication leads to tremendous negative results in the rest of your life. When you throw away your riches and you throw away your reputation and throw away your health, many other things that can be caused by the single-minded pursuit of lust in life. And so he's saying that you can certainly satisfy yourself and resolve at least most of that lustful feeling in ways that don't require you to suffer all those bad circumstances. And he does get graphic about what the alternatives are, which people can read for themselves and evaluate how that applies to them. And I started to stop, Joshua, when you said minimizing desire doesn't work. Well, OK, that's a good argument as long as we're all in agreement about what it means to work. And so the point remains, does it not, that what we're looking for is a pleasurable life. And if you suppress all your desire you're making the pragmatic, practical argument that if you were to somehow succeed in suppressing all your desire, your position is, is that that would not, in fact, produce a pleasurable life, I gather is your argument. Well, I don't think so, no. Okay. It, because, and the reason I say that is because people still try this, and they don't just try it on themselves, they try it on other people. For a long time, it was considered that left-handedness was, I mean, the literal word comes from the Latin which sinister means sinister. Yes. Yeah. We have to beat this out of you. If you don't start writing with your right hand, then you have to be punished. So much of it comes back to sex, which is why that I came up with that out of Lucretius and why I'm struggling to come up with other examples right now. But you could talk about these conflicts that we have today, like pray the gay away is one that comes up. Now, I don't want to get political about this, but I just have to say it typically does not work is my view. Now, that's when it's imposed from the outside. Maybe there is a point to be made about how we approach our own desires, right? And whether we can minimize them. And I think some of them can be minimized. But I think when you take that as like a cause in itself, like I have to root out desire, what you're really going for there to me is a life of pain and not a life of pleasure. And when you say it that way, that's why we have to be clear that someone who looks at desire as a pain cannot just simply decide, I want to remove pain from my life. Therefore, I'm going to remove desire from my life. Therefore, I'm going to just simply sit in my cave and stare at the wall. Okay, so you were clarifying what you meant by that when you say it doesn't work. What I heard you say then is that when you try to reduce desire to a minimum, you just simply don't succeed because that desire stays there anyway. It's not something you can just necessarily through willpower will it away, at least in many cases you can't. And you see, that's part of the problem here. I have a desire to breathe oxygen to remain alive. And that's pretty easy to fulfill. I don't think many people would say that that desire has anything bad about it. So there's clearly desires that are so absolutely required to maintain your life that nobody in their right mind, although there are many people who are not in their right minds, would say that those desires should be eliminated. And yet we have this impression that all desire is a bad thing. So there's a problem with the terminology here. And I'm not saying the problem is with an Epicurus. I do not think the problem is an Epicurus. I think the problem is in our modern superficial understanding of desire. We've absorbed through religion or I'll say also through humanism or Buddhism, but through different influences in modern life, that desire is something that has a negative connotation to it, just like pleasure. The same thing goes with pleasure. People will say 
pleasure is disreputable, ignoble, unworthy of you. And the feeling people have about desire seems to be closely intertwined with that. And since we know pleasure was not a bad word in the minds of Epicurus, I also can't imagine that desire as a whole, in general, was a bad term either. It's clear that there are some desires, and this is where we get into the discussion of the words like vain and empty and things like that. Some desires are so destructive to your life and lead to such pain that you clearly are not going to choose to pursue them. But other desires clearly do lead to tremendous pleasure or to the avoidance of great pain. And you have to, if you're sane, pursue them as aggressively and vigorously as you can. So it's not the word desire itself that is the negative term. It's some subset of desires. And it's that subset of desires that I would say we're talking about when he goes into this discussion of natural and necessary and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And just as an example, the desire to root out desire can also right. be a problem. I mean, it's been a while since I've told the story of St. Jerome on the podcast. St. Jerome was a, I think he was a pagan who converted to Christianity, but in any way, he had a very good grasp of Latin and was a great lover of pagan literature. And in particular, he loved to read Cicero. And he knew, at least he had convinced himself, that if he was a Christian, he shouldn't be reading pagan works. He should be spending his time reading sanctified works, Christian works, and in particular, the Bible itself. But he just couldn't, he just couldn't get away from reading these pagan writers, and in particular, Cicero, as I said. And so what he would do is he would read Cicero, and then he would be, he, he's always pictured in paintings with a rock in his hand and scars on his chest. He would read Cicero and then he'd beat himself with a rock as sort of punishment for fulfilling that very natural desire, the desire to experience language and, and art and beauty and culture. But he would beat himself with a rock and then he'd go read a Bible to atone for it. And then the next day he would read one of the plays of Sophocles and then he'd beat himself with a rock. <laughs> Ultimately, he comes to a point where he has this dream and it's God comes to him in a dream and uh, asks him what his what the condition of his soul is. And Jerome says, I'm a Christian. And God says, you're not a Christian, you're a Ciceronian. And <laughs> Jerome knows well, being a Christian, that this would be crime enough to, to get him sent to hell for all eternity. But God is merciful and gives him one last chance. So Jerome takes all of his pagan books, burns them, and spends the rest of his life with Christianity and translates the Bible into Latin. And so that kind of thing to me, I mean, you could see in, in what I just said there, translate the, the Bible into Latin. He hasn't gotten over his love of the Latin language or his love of the beautiful style of people like Cicero, who was a very elegant writer. But because he's suppressed it in one area of his life, he's trying to channel it into another area of his life. And meanwhile, is beating himself with a rock. So you you tell me if suppressing desire is, is a good idea or not. I, I firmly come down on the side that in most cases, it's better, in my view, to either fulfill your desire or to just alter your understanding of what, you know, you can think about why you're desiring it. You can pursue something else instead of that, maybe take your mind off of it. You could, this is where choice and avoidance comes in, but as a carte blanche idea of just suppressing desire, I think this is one of the worst ideas that the human mind has ever come up with. And Joshua, when you're talking about Jerome, that would remind me to say that your argument is very persuasive to me, and I think it should be persuasive to many people. The presumption that makes it persuasive, however, is that there's no eternal reward in heaven that you achieve by suppressing your desires in this world. If you believe that religious perspective that God wishes you to suppress your desires so as to achieve eternal reward in heaven, then yes, suppression of desire would be the most important thing you should possibly do, because that would gain you eternal reward in heaven. That is sort of a, I hate to call that a physics position, but it is a worldview position that is behind the kind of analysis we're talking about here today, because it would work to gain eternal reward if the things that you were taught in Sunday school when you were growing up were true. 
So maybe it's not necessary to make that point since most of the people listening to the podcast understand the Epicurean worldview on those things. But to me, that is a critical thing to always remember. The worldview informs the ethics. You just don't pick a desire, a a goal, and go with it regardless of the reality of the world. Martin or Calasini? It seems important that we also bring in the upcoming lines, which are about choosing things. It's about how we decide to do something, whether or not we foresee that it's going to bring greater pleasure later or if it's going to bring even worse pain in the future. So there's an evaluation about making choices based upon the pleasure and pain aspect of things. So we may do something that brings some discomfort and pain in the short term if it's going to lead to later pleasure in the long term. And so that whole thing has to be brought into the whole mix. I mean, we've been talking about to suppress desire or to act on something. So we've determined suppressing desire is not a good way to go. And then if we move into our desires, then if we see the benefit of something and that's going to have a good result, then that furthers our process of taking action on what we want. Yeah, I agree. And the the implication of choice and avoidance is that some desires are worth choosing to fulfill. Some desires are not worth choosing to fulfill. And you've got to come to some kind of way to get around that problem because uh, it, it is difficult to overcome desire. But certainly what this boils down to on the detailed level is going to be choice and avoidance, how we decide which pleasures or which desires we satisfy in the hope of gaining pleasure, how we decide which desires we avoid, maybe in the hope of avoiding pain. But the point of it all is that pleasure is the goal here. So it's not that desires are bad necessarily in themselves. It's that we choose to satisfy desires that we think will will bring us the most pleasure. And Kelsey, what I heard you saying was to remind us of this issue of the big picture People will say the same thing about the Bible. You can go pick up some isolated sentences in the Bible and prove anything you want to. And you can do that here with the letter to Menorchius if you also just pick out a sentence or a passage in isolation. It's only in the full context of the big picture of the things we're going to continue to talk about as we do move on past this initial question that everything can be made to make sense. What is it about the blind man and the elephant in the room where you feel one piece of it and you think that elephant's like a tree or like a, I'm sure Joshua knows that analogy much better than I do, but you've got to see the big picture in order to put the pieces in their proper perspective. One of the ways I think that this sections that we're talking about right now, it is extremely helpful to compare to where the similar position is discussed in the Torquatus material in Cicero's On Ends. The section corresponding to what we're talking about right now includes this passage. He says, nothing could be more useful or conducive to well-being than Epicurus's doctrine as to the different classes of the desires. One kind he classified as both natural and necessary, a second as natural without being necessary, and a third as neither natural nor necessary. And here's the point I think is very helpful. Quote, the principle of the classification being that the necessary desires are gratified with little trouble or expense. The natural desires also require but little, since nature's own riches, which suffice to content her, are both easily procured and limited in amount. But for the imaginary desires, no bound or limit can be discovered. In other words, I think Epicurus is saying this about natural and necessary as a very practical, pragmatic guide to thinking about the different choices and avoidances that are in front of you. And he's making a point that is really fairly obvious that those things which are necessary to life are usually obtainable at a relatively reasonable cost, while those things that are extravagant and luxurious and almost imaginary in terms of the benefit you would get, those things are very hard to obtain and will create a lot of trouble for you in attempting to get them if you're even able to get them at all. So if you keep that very practical advice in context, 
there's nothing in here that would require you to only go for bread and water as all you wish to have in life. He's just making the point that the more extravagant the goal, the more difficulty you're going to run into. Of course, if you're willing and able to obtain those things, then you will achieve what it is you're looking for. But if you're not able or willing to undergo that pain and effort, then you're going to end up with a lot of pain and effort without being rewarded. It's just a practical way of looking at things, not a prescription to suppress every desire that you've had since the moment you were born. Okay, we've been talking about that we're referring choices and avoidance to the health of the body and to the freedom of disturbance for the soul, basically. For it is to obtain this end that we always act, to avoid pain and fear. Let's use that sentence as a testing ground for this question. Does Epicurean philosophy value the avoidance of pain over the obtaining of pleasure? Do we avoid pain at all costs, even at the cost of certain pleasures that could be obtained if we were willing to undergo some amount of pain for them? Well, the examples I'm coming up with are somewhat difficult because it's not really possible to know a person's inmost mind. But Joshua, Uh, let me stop you. Let's go for the general question. Yes or no. Does Epicurean philosophy in general prioritize the avoidance of pain over the obtaining of pleasure? Well, that's easy. I'm going to say no. And I think that's the right answer. Okay. Now with my examples, I can, there's several points in which Epicureans, not just Epicurus himself, although he he certainly was one who did this, but I'm thinking of uh, Lucian, of Samosata, of them undergoing great personal risk in order that they can attain the pleasure or I guess the conditions that are more conducive to a life of pleasure that they want. And in some ways, it's quite odd how they do this. Now, in Epicurus's life, it's not that odd. He was not just developing a philosophy for himself that would bring him pleasure and free him from pain and existential dread and the fear of the gods and all that. But he was going forth on the world stage to proclaim this idea to people who didn't necessarily want to hear it. And in so doing, he what was the name of that town that actually he drove it, drove Epicurus out of town because they didn't want to hear what he was saying. I can't remember the name of the town, but this is the nature of the problem. Epicurus is going to these risks, not just because he thinks that he can help other people, but because he won't find that. I guess what I'm saying is maybe there's a greater pain that he experiences by having these ideas and not sharing them than the pain that he would experience by trying to share them and coming to a bad end. I don't know if there's a better way to put that. But basically what I'm saying is sometimes to pursue the pleasures that we need, we have to undergo great pain. And for Lucian, it was confronting this fraud, Alexander the Oracle monger. And there's one notable episode when Lucian claims, and whether you think it's maybe some people don't think it's true, I don't know. But he claims that Alexander paid a captain and a crew of a ship that Lucian was on to kill him and throw his body into the sea. And he underwent the risk of exposing this guy anyway. That reminds me, Joshua, how Epicurus says that we're occasionally going to die for a friend. Why would we ever do that? Joshua, as we pursue that, I want to make sure that nobody thinks that I'm setting up a straw man here. I've got a quote that we were talking about recently in one of our Wednesday Zoom meetings. I won't name the person who wrote this, although I have a high regard for him being a very good guy. He's been through both the Facebook group and our Epicurean Friends Forum. But he has a personal blog, and he's written about his view of Epicurus and his reading about the Cyreniacs and other different schools. And here's a quote that he wrote several months ago off of his blog. Quote, Indeed, it was through Epicurus that I discovered and became attracted to philosophical hedonism as a pragmatic way of life. However, like many others, I eventually grew disappointed with Epicurus's philosophy because of its strange and paradoxically ascetic hedonism. For Epicurus, pleasure is merely the absence of pain, particularly the mental pain of anxiety. In other words, Epicureanism is a form of negative hedonism, which values the avoidance of pain over the seeking of pleasure. 
Whatever merits an analgesic philosophy like this might have, it certainly wasn't my ideal of hedonism. Indeed, I was delighted when I read that a contemporaneous hedonist school made fun of Epicureanism by saying that this state of absence of pain is the condition of a corpse. Now, regardless of the merits of some of the details that he stated there, that's the end of the quote, I see that attitude a lot. In other words, Epicureanism is a form of negative hedonism, which values the avoidance of pain over the seeking of pleasure. So there are people who say that, even people who have interacted with us and who listen to us discuss it, think that that's a reasonable position to take. Is he right? Well, I, first of all, I think it's very possible to read not just the letter to Minoikius, but other Epicurean texts and emerge with that conclusion. So I don't want to fault anyone for thinking that absence of pain was Epicurus's goal. But for myself, I personally reject that as being the main goal, because the goal for me is pleasure. And when you say for yourself, I presume you're not considering yourself to be some oddball who likes to take incorrect positions. Right, Josh? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think it's when I say that it's possible to read Epicurean works and emerge with the conclusion that absence of pain is the primary goal, I think it's also very possible to read the same works and emerge with the conclusion that pleasure itself is the goal. And what we mean by pleasure is, uh, what's that quote that, Cassius, you like to cite? The pleasures of, the only one I can think of right now is sex. I don't know what that says, but. The things he says when he would not know the good, I can't quote the, the list right now either, but we'll put that in the show notes for sure. I think it's sex, food, and dancing, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Martin or Calassini, when he says, quote, in other words, Epicureanism is a form of negative hedonism, which values the avoidance of pain over the seeking of pleasure. So Martin or Calassini, do you think that's right? No, no, it's not. I mean, it ignores part of uh, what Epicurus brought. You, you can isolate some things out of, out of their context and then misinter misinterpret it this way. But if you consider everything what we have, and try to reconstruct what it means altogether with, by removing apparent contradictions, then it's not like that. Calasini, anything? Yeah. So if the goal is pleasure, if we're responsible for how our lives unfold, and we naturally seek out pleasure, and we, we really seek out to avoid things that are uncomfortable, unpleasant, it's just a natural tendency. So as we make our choices, we could choose pleasures that might be mixed with pain, like the results of things, we sometimes don't know how things will end up. Some things may be better than we expected. Sometimes they're worse. Sometimes there's an experience of both pleasure and pain all mixed together. And so in the end result, feeling is that, well, it really wasn't quite as good as I would have wanted. So my question is about, we have choices and we can move toward making better choices. So we're not going to settle for something that's like a mix of pain and pleasure. We're going the best goal would be a pleasure that is full and complete. This is a difficult subject to talk about, but it's so critical to everything that Epicurus was about that talking through it like this is something I think we absolutely have to do to improve the ability to articulate this and become confident in being able to say that there's no gross contradiction here. Because I don't think any of us feel like that this position of avoiding pain, taking priority over pursuing pleasure is viable or is, is at all what Epicurus was saying. At the worst, I think most of us would agree that he's saying pursue both. But that leaves this ambiguity of if you're supposed to pursue both, well, sometimes you can't pursue both. So what are you supposed to do? Well, Epicurus answers that in this very section we're reading today when he says, since pleasure is the first good and natural to us for this reason, we do not choose every pleasure, but sometimes we pass over many pleasures when greater discomfort accrues as a result of them. And similarly, we think many pains better than pleasures since a greater pleasure comes to us when we have endured pains for a long time. Every pleasure then, because of its natural kinship to us, is good, yet not every pleasure is to be chosen, even as every pain also is an evil, yet not all are always of a nature to be avoided. Yet by a scale of comparison and by consideration of advantages and disadvantages, we must form our judgment on all these matters, 
for the good on certain occasions we treat as bad, and conversely, the bad as good on certain occasions, he's saying there. I think when you read that, you focus on the practical advice of we simply have to realize that we have to judge and anticipate what the result is going to be. That's one of the Vatican sayings, ask of every choice, what will happen to me if I get it and what will happen to me if I don't? He's not saying sit in your cave and stare at the wall and avoid all desire. He's saying get involved with your desire and work it as aggressively as you can to produce a pleasurable result and to avoid a painful result. But you're not simply prioritizing avoidance of pain as the ultimate goal. And really, that is the message that is out there on the Internet in modern Epicurean philosophy, that Epicurus said the avoidance of pain is the goal of life. I don't think that's valid. And to the extent he even got close to saying things that are similar to that, you can understand them in ways that are consistent with the pursuit of pleasure. Because when there's only two feelings, pleasure and pain, you can interchange the terminology of one as being the absence of the other. So there's a variety of ways to look at this And you can either come out absolutely confused and just say, I'll just go read somebody else. Maybe it's time to go read some Plato. Or you can make sense of it and come up with practical advice for living life. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. And the glaring contradiction that you described to me is is the contradiction of being human and being alive and expecting or anticipating that you can live a life and not experience pain. Right. That to me is an absurd idea because we all experience pain and we all experience mental anxieties and troubles and we all experience dissatisfaction. And I just don't think there's any way of getting around that. If you were a god and you could experience both the fullness of pleasure and the absence of any pain or dissatisfaction, then I would say, yeah, go do that. But that option is not open to us. And if you were dead, then you wouldn't experience any pain. But that's not a condition that I would recommend that you pursue immediately. You are alive and you are human and you are going to experience pain. So the only thing you can do is decide what to do with your life, given those preconditions that are built into the equation. And for me, relentlessly pursuing absence of pain, I don't want to experience pain. You know, don't get me wrong. But I know that I'm going to. And the goal, I guess, is to try and minimize the experience of pain as much as I can, knowing full well that I can't get rid of it, while also pursuing what for me is the goal, and that is a life of pleasure. And Joshua, you keep qualifying what you're saying, and I applaud you for doing it by saying things like, for me, and this is the way you think, and that's what your choice would be. And you're you're being a nice guy to qualify that. But the obvious point I think people should understand, you're an intelligent guy, but you don't hold yourself up to Epicurus as being at the same intellectual level as somebody who founded a philosophy like this. So if you, Joshua, humble poet as you are, can come to these conclusions. We have to believe that Epicurus saw the same things and would not have said something inconsistent with that. To believe that Epicurus held prioritizing pain is more important than prioritizing pleasure, it's just absurd on its face, given everything that's in the philosophy and everything we know about the way the Epicureans of that time period were living. They were not living in caves, staring at candles. They were out living their lives, in many cases, very aggressively. Apparently, it's one of the great questions of Epicurean philosophy. Were the Roman Epicureans bad Epicureans? Well, I don't think the Roman Epicureans were bad Epicureans. They had better texts than we do. They knew the Greek. They had the texts. They had the teachers. And they were out there fighting wars with each other and participating with kings and living very enjoyable lives in the library of Herculaneum or Atticus and his friends paying court to all the important people of Rome and Julius Caesar's father-in-law, Julius Caesar himself perhaps having Epicurean inclinations. The ancient Romans who were supporting Epicurus and talking about Epicurean philosophy were not shy, retiring wallflowers trying to reduce their desires to a bare minimum. And in fact, I didn't get the quote this morning, but in one of Cassius's letters to Cicero, Cassius makes the point that it's very easy to explain how pleasure 
is the goal of life, but not so easy to explain how virtue should be. Well, it's almost when we get into these discussions that we find that it's not easy somehow to describe pleasure as the goal of life because of, I think, the way we've been brought up and the common philosophy of the world. But nevertheless, I think these questions have to be answered and you have to take a a firm position on them or else you're just left twisting in the wind as to what really is the value of Epicurus at all. Okay. Well, we actually did cover most of the text for today, so maybe we can, in just a couple of episodes, cover the whole section on pleasure before we get to the end of the letter. But before we talk about closing thoughts, anybody have anything on the main body of the text for today? Uh, No. Okay. That's not going to be your concluding comment yet, but Galassini or Gossard, before we start the closing section, anybody want to start any major new topics? Well, I have something to say, but you can cut it out if you want. And that is basically this, that if Epicurus and, and his followers did think that absence of pain and not pleasure was the supreme goal, it was the only thing really worth pursuing. And as the blog post you were describing, Cassius says that the Cyrenaics responded to that by saying that this is the condition of a corpse. If that really was an accurate portrayal of Epicurus and his school, and it was not to do with pleasure really, but only to do with not experiencing any kind of pain at all at any point in your life, then I have to say the Cyrenaics may have been right, and that this is the condition of a corpse, and that you're better off being dead. If that truly is what you think, if it really is the case that the only thing worth experiencing is a life totally free from any pain, and that if you can't have that, you won't settle for anything less, then you really are describing a state for a human that is a state of being dead. I say that, Cash, just knowing that you may want to cut that out because it's quite controversial. Oh, no. Oh, no. I completely agree with what you said. I think that's the way this stuff has to be analyzed. You have to take things to their logical conclusion in order to decide whether the logic you've been following to that point really makes any sense. But that would be the logical conclusion. If the most important thing in your life is to never experience any more pain, then there's only one way for a human being to do that. And we don't need to be too graphic about what that one way is. But there is not going to be any way to avoid pain in your life other than ending your life. There's always going to be some amount of effort and exertion that's required to obtain pleasure. There's going to be moments of pain that are going to come up in your life, whether you stub your toe or have an ingrown fingernail or something. And you've got to decide whether continuing to live life is worth those pains or not. And people are going to say, oh, you're being ridiculous. That's absurd. Nobody really thinks in those terms. But I do believe one of the characteristics of Epicurus is that he was a very rigorous, logical thinker. And he would not get caught in such an obvious contradiction to say that the avoidance of pain is the most important things in life. What he would say is that if, in fact, there's only two feelings, then the presence of one is the absence of the other and the absence of one is the presence of the other. And from that very limited perspective of measuring the two, yes, that is a logical way of expressing the idea. And that is a very beneficial way if you're looking to find what the limit of pleasure is. But that's a very specialized debate that has a context to it. And if you try to take that terminology out of that context, you're going to be led in very difficult directions. And I don't want to get to the very end of the episode without at least mentioning, we're not going to have time to talk about him in detail because I don't think we've done much research on him. But in Cicero's own ends, I think it's in the second book. I'm not sure which of the books right now. Cicero talks about Hieronymus of Rhodes. And I'm going to read the text here. Well, then, said I, and and I think this is Cicero that's talking. Well, then, said I, you are aware of what Hieronymus of Rhodes says is the chief good, to which he thinks that everything ought to be referred. I know, said he, that he thinks the great end is freedom from pain. Well, what are his sentiments regarding pleasure? He affirms, he replied, that it is not to be sought for its own sake, for he thinks that rejoicing is one thing and being free from pain is another. And indeed, continued he, he is in this point greatly mistaken. For as I proved a little while ago, the end of increasing pleasure is the removal of all pain. And he goes on further from there. 
But this would be another aspect that I would suggest somebody research if they're concerned about this question. Hieronymus of Rhodes, who appears to have come after Epicurus, but apparently, according to Wikipedia at least, is considered to be an Aristotelian. Hieronymus of Rhodes, in fact, took the position that freedom from pain is the ultimate goal of life. And so a person who takes that position is going to logically come to the very next conclusion that pleasure is not to be sought for its own sake, because being free from pain is the ultimate goal. So if you get confused about these issues and leave them hanging out there, you can easily go in directions that are so contradictory that you leave yourself and everybody else confused, never making any progress in understanding Epicurean philosophy or applying it for you or for anybody else. Okay, this is probably the time we need to close for the week. So, Martin, any closing thoughts for today? We're going to come back to all this next week, but for today, any closing thoughts? Mm, see. Oh, no, no closing thought. Okay, Calasini. Yeah, so this thought came to me. Let your experience of pleasure be free from pain, which is kind of a different twist on things, but it's sort of, it would be the definition of the fullness of pleasure. For example, if you go to a party where there's a potluck or you, you have Thanksgiving and there's just so much food and it's all very an enjoyable experience of eating, but you eat way too much food and before you know it, you're in pain. So in some sense, this is sort of a way of how do we know that pleasure is at its peak? It's when there is no pain present. So from this, over time, we would learn from practice, how do we make choices to maximize our pleasure and avoid pain? That sounds to me like a good way of approaching the everyday questions of choices and avoidances to lead us towards the goal of a life that's as full of pleasure as possible and as free of pain as possible. Joshua? So I mentioned earlier the proem to book four in Lucretius' On the Nature of Things, and I'm just going to read that because it tells me something about the ambition and the desire of the person who wrote it, a desire that he chose to fulfill. And he says, A pathless country of the Pierides I traverse, where no other foot has ever trod. I love to approach virgin springs and there to drink. I love to pluck new flowers and to seek an illustrious chaplet for my head from fields whence before this the muses have crowned the brows of none. First, because my teaching is of high matters and I proceed to set free the mind from the close knots of superstition. Next, because the subject is so dark and the verses I write so clear touching every part with the muse's grace. Gives you some insight into the mind that wrote the poem and the reasons he had for writing it. That he loved composing the poem and he loved immersing himself in the thoughts for the pleasure it brought him. And he did it partially because it was difficult and he wanted to take this weird, alien, difficult Greek philosophy and put it into a language that his countrymen would understand. So there's desire there, there's ambition there, and then the attainment of it all is a feeling of great pleasure. He accomplished something in his view and in many other views, wonderful. Right. And, you know, maybe one of the themes of today's episode, this will be my closing thought, but Joshua, of course, if you have more thoughts afterwards, you be sure to add them. But one of the themes that we've been discussing today is how there's a big picture involved here that there's a danger in going to one sentence or one section of passages and pulling that out and forgetting the rest of the philosophy. But if somebody is going to insist on looking for one segment to obsess on, I would suggest that this is the segment, and it would be section 129 from what we've read today. And for this cause, we call pleasure the beginning and end of the blessed life, for we recognize pleasure as the first good innate in us. And from pleasure, we begin every act of choice and avoidance. And to pleasure, we return again, using the feeling as the standard by which we judge every good. Now, I don't know how you can be much more clear than that. So anybody who thinks that we're talking about living in a cave and staring at a candle, let's talk about section 129 of what the letter to Menarchius said there. So let's close for today. 
and come back next week. So thank you, everybody, for your help and your participation in the podcast. We, we do always encourage everyone who listens to the podcast to drop by the forum and participate in the discussion. We'll have a thread for this episode, and we look forward to your comment. Any questions or comments, we'll incorporate next week. Joshua, do you have something else? Because Calasini made the very good point, which is that part of the language here is not that pleasure is absence of pain, but that the limit of pleasure is in the right. removal of all pain. And that's something that we're going to have to talk about next week because it's central to this whole issue. That's correct. And of course, that refers to principle doctrine number three, where I think Bailey translates that as the limit of quantity of pleasure is the absence of pain. So this is, of course, one of the major issues of Epicurean philosophy, and we will devote as much time as we need to to getting it right. So any suggestions or commentary, please add them to the forum thread for this, and we'll address them next week as we continue to plow through one of the most important letters ever written. Okay, so with that, we'll close for the day. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Welcome to episode 139 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean text, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and its Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we continue our discussion of pleasure in Epicurus's letter to Menoikius. Now let's join Joshua reading today's text. And again, independence of desire, we think a great good, not that we may at all times enjoy but a few things, but that if we do not possess many, we may enjoy the few in the genuine persuasion that those have the sweetest pleasure in luxury who least need it, and that all that is natural is easy to be obtained, but that which is superfluous is hard. And so plain savors bring us a pleasure equal to a luxurious diet when all the pain due to want is removed and bread and water produce the highest pleasure when one who needs them puts them to his lips. To grow accustomed, therefore, to simple and not luxurious diet gives us health to the full and makes a man alert for the needful employments of life. And when, after long intervals, we approach luxuries, disposes us better towards them and fits us to be fearless of fortune. When, therefore, we maintain that pleasure is the end, we do not mean the pleasures of profligates and those that consist in sensuality, as is supposed by some who are either ignorant or disagree with us or do not understand, but freedom from pain in the body and from trouble in the mind. For it is not continuous drinkings and revelings, nor the satisfaction of lusts, nor the enjoyment of fish and other luxuries of the wealthy table, which produce a pleasant life, but sober reasoning, searching out the motives for all choice and avoidance, and banishing mere opinions, to which are due the greatest disturbance of the spirit. Of all this, the beginning and the greatest good is prudence. Wherefore, prudence is a more precious thing even than philosophy, for from prudence are sprung all the other virtues, and it teaches us that it is not possible to live pleasantly without living prudently and honorably and justly, 
nor again to live a life of prudence, honor, and justice without living pleasantly. For the virtues are by nature bound up with the pleasant life, and the pleasant life is inseparable from them. Joshua, thank you for reading that for us this morning. By the time people hear the podcast, they are going to hear a very smooth reading of it from you. But as we were doing the astral recording, there were several stops and starts because this is the Bailey version that you read today. And there's some awkward phrasings in there where it's difficult to follow the details sometimes as you're reading through it for the first time. We also have the Hicks translation on the website for the podcast, which is a little bit different. But the reason I bring that up mainly is that this material today is extremely, extremely important. And I think we're going to be naturally tending to try to look at every word and every phrase and try to, as closely as we can, pull out the distinct meanings of what he's trying to say. That's what we need to do. But it's kind of like when you're debating whether the King James Version of the Bible is the only correct one and things like that. People have to understand that the original is written in Greek, and most of us are not classical Greek readers, and so we're going to have to depend on various translations and not get too hung up on the way a particular word or phrase is translated by a particular translator at least until we've compared it to what other translators have said and done the best we can to go back into the Greek and even compared it with the other writings of Epicurus and um, Lucretius and people like that. Which reminds me that, again, as this presentation of ethics unfolds, one of the best and more elaborate even presentations of Epicurean ethics is in the Torquato section of Cicero's On Ends. And as we've gone through this letter in the last couple of weeks, I've flipped back and forth from the Torquata section, and it really does seem to me that just about everything that's in this letter to Menorchius is stated with even greater detail in Torquatus's presentation. So it's very helpful to go back and forth between the different texts and compare them, and also to keep the big picture in mind. And that's really what I intended before you read the section today to emphasize at the very beginning. There's a lot of people out there who have problems in life and they read Epicurus on Wikipedia. They look him up on the Internet and they're drawn immediately to this section of the letter to Menorchius as Epicurus's ultimate statement on how to live. And while I think that is a reasonable and logical approach. It is also important to know what Epicurus has said prior to this and the rest of his philosophy so that you're not just hanging on a certain set of words without the context of everything else that he said, not only in his other letters like the letter to Herodotus and Pythocles, but also at the beginning and later on in this letter itself. Because, of course, the big picture is always going to be the same in Epicurean philosophy that there is no supernatural creation, no supernatural God. The world was not created supernaturally for men, for us. We're not the center of the universe. In Epicurean physics, the universe as a whole had no beginning and has no end. And as a result of the atomism, which is there not because it's just a scientific interest of Epicurus, but because it tells us the nature of our lives, as a result of applying atomism, we would know that there is no eternal soul that existed before birth or will continue to exist after death. There'll be no reward in heaven or punishment in hell. And so those contextual issues about the nature of life, the nature of humanity are really important to keep in mind as we discuss what we are actually to do with the time that we have available to us. And this section this week is the second of the weeks we're spending on a section of the letter to Menorchius here that's devoted to the nature of pleasure itself. We had a lot of comments on what we discussed last week, and we'll probably have a lot of comments on what we discussed this week. These two episodes will probably always be some of the more important ones that we have as an initial jumping off point to examine some of these issues. Last week, of course, our number one topic and what we discussed on the forum afterwards was the issue of desire. We start today by independence of desire, we think a great good, not that we may at all times enjoy but a few things, but if we do not possess many, we may enjoy the few and the genuine persuasion that those have the sweetest pleasure and luxury who least need it, and that all that is natural is easy to be obtained, but that which is superfluous is hard. So let's start out today by discussing that. And before we do our last thing I'll say about the Torquatus materials, I believe Torquatus introduces this topic by talking about that what the real issue is, is that nobody will pursue pain for itself. But sometimes when people don't understand how to properly pursue pleasure, 
they end up with pain that is much worse than the pleasure they obtain. So what we're going to be discussing today in a very general way can be described as the practical overview of how to pursue pleasure. He's previously established and asserted in this letter and established in his other works that pleasure is the great good. But once you establish that, you've got to talk about, well, how do you pursue it? So with that, let's talk about this comment on independence of desire. Does that mean that we don't want anything? We wish to suppress all of our desires and we should not pursue luxury in any way, shape or form? What does it mean when he says, not that we may at all times enjoy, but a few things, but that? Cassius, in your introduction, you gave some explanation of the context that we have to understand these passages to be in, and there's a further context. The other context that we can examine this in light of is that we are recording this now on the 21st anniversary of the September 11 attacks. And if we find that some of these passages are difficult to interpret, it's because We're dealing with ideas that are human in origin, and I think it was Kant who said that out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Now, there are those in this world, like the people motivated to fly planes into buildings, who think that there are absolute claims that can be made about nature and about human life, and that the nature of those claims cannot be called into question. We saw that, I think, on both sides, not only for the men who were responsible, but also for the people who tried to give consolation after the fact. It was, I think, Billy Graham who said that the souls of the dead were now in paradise and would not return to us even if they could. And it's precisely that idea that makes it very difficult to have a conversation about the good life in this world. You've got people who are going to make claims about paradise, make claims about the afterlife as if they have privileged information. Indeed, they claim to speak for a higher authority. When we reject all that, as I think we all do, what we're left with is a group of humans with all their flaws and all their biases and all their prejudices coming together to try and determine what the best way to live in this life is when we don't have the promise of another life. So it's not surprising that there's quite a lot of controversies circling around in this text and indeed in last episode where we talked quite a great deal about desire. We're talking about desire again. I'm trying to think about how to tie this all in. Well, I'm certainly (laughs) glad you started off the way you did because I think that's really a better way to explain what I was trying to say in the opening than I did myself. We're talking in a context in which we are presuming that the people who understand us know that there is no afterlife, there is no heaven and hell, there is no absolute standard of right and wrong, there is no supernatural God telling us what to do, and that is the absolutely key context. You know, there's so many people, they know that they're anxious, they know that they're upset, they know that they're afraid, they know that they're in pain at some point, and they're used in the modern world to just looking for a pill, an injection, some kind of immediate relief from the questions that they have. And that is not what Epicurus is providing here. And if you just go straight to these passages and think to yourself, tra-la-la, here he is telling me, I've been mistaken all my life. Really, what I should have been aiming for is absence of pain instead of pleasure. And if I just go for absence of pain instead of pleasure, then that'll be the best life. And tra-la-la, go on down the road and ignore everything else that Epicurus said. And that would be, I think, the biggest mistake you could possibly make. But people are making that mistake every day in the modern world because they're not taking seriously this background of the nature of the universe and the absence of supernatural guidance and so forth. When you talk about September the 11th, Joshua, I remember clearly shortly after that happened that my life changed in ways I analyzed religion because previous to that, or at least when I was younger, I had been impressed with the argument that, well, Christianity must be correct because the saints were willing to die for their beliefs and face the lions in the Colosseum in Rome. And so those people who gave up their lives for their religious views, they had to be right They had to know what they were talking about because they would have never done something like that if they didn't have good evidence that they were right. And so, of course, after September the 11th, 
you would have plenty of evidence long before that if you were paying attention to the world. But at this point in the United States, at least, it became impossible for me to accept the validity of that argument anymore that I should consider that just because somebody does something extreme and gives up their life for the sake of their beliefs, that that's proof that they're right. This is crazy because these people who at that point were flying their plane into the World Trade Center were every bit as intense in their belief of the truth of their values as anything that the Christian saints in the early years of the church were. And I don't believe that they were right in flying their planes into the World Trade Center. So why should I give credit to the early saints for being right to face the lions? So I saw that episode in my life personally as a really good reason to step back and think about what really is the right standard of proof of what's true and what's not and what you should believe and what you should not believe. And what it indicates, Cassius, at least for me, is that the Greeks did something right when they proceeded, not necessarily by divine revelation, but by humans engaging in arguments to figure out the truth about the nature of something. And in the case of what we're talking about today, it's an argument that Epicurus is putting forward in the context of this swirling whirlpool of arguments that are happening in and around Athens in the second and third century BC about what it means means to live a good life. Right. So it's in that context that we now approach the first line of this last few paragraphs on this issue of pleasure in the letter to Menoikias. He says, and again, independence of desire, we think a great good, not that we may at all times enjoy but a few things, but that if we do not possess many, we may enjoy the few in the genuine persuasion that those have the sweetest pleasure in luxury who least need it. It does not strike me that he's articulating a position here for throwing away all your possessions and going to live in a cave. What he seems to me to be suggesting is you need to be willing to endure hardship and lack of luxuries and and even comforts because you'll encounter times in your life when you have to experience those things and you need to be prepared for them. This is not a general rule that you have to settle for just the simplest possible pleasures and comforts and needs. It's something that you do in preparation for those times when you don't have a choice. But when you have a choice, it's just as appropriate, just as good, just as worthwhile to pursue pleasures that are not necessarily simple or easily obtained or necessary. You know, not everything we do is is absolutely strictly necessary, but it doesn't have to be. There's no moral opprobrium in doing something or pursuing a pleasure or satisfying a desire that is unnecessary. That's one thing I want to get into the books early on. We're going to come into that issue here. Pleasure is, if we are to take it as being good in itself, then it means not just the pleasures of wearing rags and living in a cave, but it means all kinds of pleasures are good in themselves. And that there's nothing wrong with pursuing more pleasures or a greater variety of pleasures in one's life just because we know that at some point we're not going to have access to them. As long as you have accustomed yourself to believe, or at least I guess acknowledge would be a better word, that you're not always going to have access to them and that you've steeled yourself against any fear or pain that that condition would bring about, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with pursuing all different kinds of pleasure, even when they're not necessary. Right. Joshua, I have two things that I'd like to say before I forget them. One of which is that, especially since we're on this line about luxury and so forth, when we read these lines, we need to really always go to text we that's very closely on point. Vatican saying 63, frugality too has a limit and the man who disregards it is like him who errs through excess. It seems to me that that one is so clear that it can hardly be misconstrued. When you combine it with what Epicurus is saying here about not that we may at all times enjoy, but a few things, he's hitting the same point over and over. There's not a magic number of things to pursue. There's not an absolute test of let's only go for bread and water. At the same time, there is not an absolute goal of saying that every luxury in life needs to be pursued. There is a sliding scale that is dependent upon our circumstances and what we are going to determine is the most pleasant for us to pursue. That's one thing that I think we hit last week was that at the banquet, we don't go for the most food, we go for the most pleasant. So that's number one point. 
The second point that came to mind in a conversation that I had this past week is that sometimes when you explain to a person who's not familiar with Epicurus and tell them that pleasure is the goal of life, I think it's normal to ask the question, well, what pleasures should I pursue? And there, I think it would be a mistake if we immediately go to discussing the issue of natural and necessary. That is a very helpful method, as we're going to discuss further today, too, to think about how much pain is going to come from a particular pursuit that we may choose to pursue. But I think that's leapfrogging to start talking about that immediately. The question of what pleasure should be pursued is something that there's not an absolute answer for in Epicurean philosophy. Under the Epicurean worldview, there would not be an absolute answer to that because people are different. And what you like to pursue, Joshua, as the most pleasant things in your life are probably different from what Calasini or Martin or I would pursue. Everybody has a different level of assessment of what they find pleasing in life. And if they try to just select an absolute standard of any kind, I think that's guaranteed to be a bad decision because Epicurus never says anything remotely like that. He just says simply that young young animals of all kind pursue pleasure, but different types of animals pursue different types of pleasures and different individuals pursue different types of pleasures. So that's probably the place to emphasize that we're not talking in this section about a list of things that everybody must do to be a good Epicurean. Epicurus has never said go for air, water, bread, shelter, warmth and given us a list that tells us exactly what to do and what not to do in every situation. In fact, as circumstances change, even those basic goals there of breathing and drinking and having enough food to eat, they are put aside at different times when we have something that's more important. Even breathing, if you need to escape from some cavern underwater, then you're going to stop breathing long enough to swim underneath the water to get out of the cavern. There are times and places for everything that will lead to a happier life in total. So that's the context, I think, of what we're talking about here. He's not saying go for the least number of pleasures in life, or he's not saying go for the most separate experiences. He's saying that one of the things to consider is that those who have the sweetest pleasure in luxury who least need it. To me, I see that as an invocation almost of the sort of intoxication or if you're obsessed with something. That's one of the things we were talking about last week in terms of desires, that people who get obsessed with something, those types of desires, especially when they're not obtainable, those are easily seen to be painful in life. So it really is a good idea to arrange your life, if possible, so that you have the least need of things that you cannot easily obtain. It would be easy for me to think about spending much of my time just in intellectual studies and reading and so forth, and that I get the most pleasure out of things like that and talking about it. And so in order to arrange for myself the most time in order to do that, I don't go out trying to maximize income and money coming in because money doesn't buy happiness, as the cliche goes. It's it's individual in terms of how you spend your time. So it's not a good idea to set your lifestyle up so that you need things that are hard for you to get. On the point, Cassius, that different people pursue different desires and they're equally valid. Lucretius gives a couple of examples from animals. He says that while hemlock is rank poison to humans, the goats eat it without any problems and they enjoy it. And that while humans use marjoram as a kind of flavoring, pigs absolutely detest it. So the variation exists not just among individuals, but also among different species. And in a context like this, who could have the authority to say authoritatively which desires are to be pursued and which are to be ignored. And I would put it that there's absolutely no one who has the authority or the knowledge that would be required to make a claim like that. Thank you for helping me with that, Joshua, because that really is the important point, I think, to hit right now. It is natural for us, especially those of us from religious backgrounds, we're told that there's sort of a salvation experience that we're supposed to be seeking that there's sort of a magical set of incantations that if we say that we believe in John 3.16, we'll have eternal life. All we have to do is follow these very clear rules, the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. If we do X, Y, and Z, that is the prescription for the best life. 
And so it's natural for us to look for that kind of thing in Epicurus. We are taught that there is a certain set of things that are good and a certain set of things that are bad. There's good and evil. And that what we really need to know in life is what's on that list of good things and what's on that list of bad things. And so that general approach is what's wrong under the analysis that Epicurus is giving us is because such an approach is looking for something that does not exist. There is no supernatural path to happiness. There's no list of things that every person has to do. I wanted to go back and touch on when you said there was no list of pleasures which are to be followed or not to be followed. Because what came up for me was um, that we could think of pleasures as either animal pleasures or human pleasures. And then that would sort of divide things into categories. But then that in itself would not necessarily answer some questions that come up for me, which is, well, how do you determine what to follow and what not to follow? So then I started thinking, okay, we have physical pleasures, we have mental pleasures. And if we really think about what physical pleasures are, they are a kind of sensual, sensory pleasure. So anything of the body. Now, mental pleasures, that to me could be more confusing because you start wandering off into concepts about what pleasure is. But I considered then as far as mentally, how do you know that something is pleasurable? Well, you can only know if it's giving you something of a feeling inside yourself. And the kinds of feeling would be things like joy, elation, all the different names that we have for mental pleasures, enthusiasm. There's all sorts of names for enjoyment in the mind. And then what came up for me was you really only know if something is pleasurable by its result. So you could be doing anything, and if it doesn't result in some kind of good feeling for you, then that would not qualify as a pleasure. And the reason why I bring this up is it's important to think about as we move forward in making choices and avoidances, are we being motivated by some kind of goal of perfection, some kind of virtue? Because so much of life is dominated by mental ideas and abstract ideas of goals. And if we don't consider really what is pleasure, then it gets confusing to decide, well, what to pursue and what should be the goal. There is a common tendency to overlook mental pleasures when we talk about these things, not because we don't value them, but because mental pleasures sort of afford their own justification. C.S. Lewis has this interesting quote, something to the effect of a man who sits in church and complains because he doesn't feel anything or nothing's happening may find that if he takes up difficult theological text and works through it with a pencil clenched in his teeth, this is the important part. His heart will sing unbidden. So this is kind of the idea of mental pleasures, and mental pleasures are something that generally people don't have as much of a problem with. So they don't come up for us very often because we're usually talking about controversial things. But certainly they form an absolutely crucial part of what Epicurus was describing as the good life. Calasini, you said you were struggling to come up with examples. One of the best examples from Epicurean philosophy is something Epicurus talks about time and time again, and that is the memory of past pleasures. That's a kind of mental pleasure. Friendship is a kind of, or at least involves a kind of mental pleasure. So certainly every bit is valid. Cassius, you said you had a, a different angle, maybe. We had such a good discussion of last week's episode. And one thing that came up, someone mentioned Bentham, John Stuart Mill. And I started a thread on this particular quote from John Stuart Mill, which I have not had a chance to track down. But Mill recognizes, quote, that there is no known Epicurean theory of life which does not assign to the pleasure of the intellect of the feelings and imagination and of the moral sentiments a much higher value as pleasures than to those of mere sensation. He apparently wrote that in an essay called Higher and Lower Pleasures, and I haven't had a chance to find out exactly what he's referring to there. 
But I know that there's a section in the letter to Torquatus that basically says the same thing, that the pleasures and pains of the mind can be much more intense than the pleasures or the pains of the body, at least in part because we have this fear or thought that the particular sensation can go on forever if we don't understand the absence of life after death. But at any rate, the bottom line is the issue that Calassini has raised about concepts and pleasures we derive from concepts. It's very important. This is a topic that we've dealt with over the last several years on the podcast, and I sometimes think we haven't been as clear and direct about it as we need to be, because it seems clear to me at this point that concepts, abstractions, emotional attachments to ideas can generate every bit as intense or more intense a feeling of pleasure or pain than can food, water, touch, and the five immediate senses. And there's nothing wrong about that. And in fact, to some extent, I think that's what Epicurus is saying. Once you get a right understanding of the facts of nature, you can really enjoy this life because you're not worried about thoughts, fears of supernatural God or life after death. And that kind of an understanding of the nature of the universe, I think, generates a pleasurable feeling in itself. Remember the opening of book two, it's sweet to be on the shore watching the storm at sea because you know that you're insulated from these errors. Like I said, that's a very famous opening of book two of Lucretius. But the other thing I wanted to say about what Callisthenes said, it's clearly a temptation. I see this through people who are really interested in Aristotle. And of course, I sometimes mention the Ayn Rand crowd, and it applies even to the Stoics. They see reason and rationality as something that's an end in itself. That's what makes up a man, is that your reasoning and thinking as opposed to just being an animal and having the sensations of lower animals. I don't think Epicurus would say that reason and logic like that are ends in themselves. He would say that pleasure is the end in itself. But on the other hand, he would not condemn the idea that reasoning and logic are important to human beings. He would just say that you have to keep them in their proper perspective and realize that these are tools that we use for the achievement of a happy life, not ends in themselves. So this tension that we think is there between the pleasures and pains of the mind versus the pleasures and pains of the body, I really don't think that they're there in Epicurean philosophy. And I think Epicurus is giving us the way to analyze the full picture and realize that there is no tension, that there is no soul trapped in the body that's at war with the flesh. There is an intellect, a soul, a mind, and there is a body. They both have interests and so forth. But pleasure and happiness is the goal of both of them. And I just also want to add, again, how to determine the difference between natural, necessary, and groundless. And what I really want to deal with is how do you decide what is groundless? Because you could just end up going in circles saying, well, there's no way to prove it. But what I think now is that you almost have to look at the result before you can decide if something is a groundless thing to pursue. You see, now, does this actually result in pleasure? Does it result in physical pleasure or in mental pleasure? And it's something that only you yourself can do. You can't really do it for anybody else. When we talk about groundless or empty and vain, do those words apply to pleasure and pain or do they apply to desire? Is there such a thing as a groundless and empty or a vain pleasure? Well, here, let me get something in here on John Stuart Mill. And, and actually, it ties together a little bit with Colosini's point that she's bringing up now, because John Stuart Mill has gotten some criticism for his extolling of intellectual pleasures as being somehow too highbrow. Now, I don't take the view that there's only one kind of intelligence and that people who don't read books and think about intellectual problems are somehow not using their minds necessarily, because I know people who do pursue intellectual pleasures, but in a different way. So, for example, right now, I'm actually, as I'm recording this, overlooking Choctahatchee Bay and I see people fishing. Now, I know people and work with people who don't pick up a book ever, but they love nothing more on the weekend to get out onto the water and catch fish. 
it may not be obvious, but this is a kind of mental or intellectual pleasure because it involves something like strategy and how you approach how you go after fish. For a lot of people, it, it's not just the adrenaline rush of killing something. That's not what we're talking about here. That exists. But it's the pleasure you get from outwitting the fish and getting it into your boat, even though it doesn't want to. And somewhat darkly, the, there's a parallel to this in war. Was it William Sherman, General Sherman, who said that it is well that war is so cruel or else there would be no end to it? There would be no end to it if it wasn't cruel, because for a certain kind of person like Sherman, there is a pleasure in having this contest where you go up against someone not just physically or tactically, but strategically, where you try to outmaneuver the enemy, where you try to lure them into a position where you can get the upper hand. This is all intellectual on a certain level. And so those kinds of intellectual pleasures, I would also say, are not inferior to the intellectual pleasures that John Stuart Mill would have had in reading Greek, which I think he could do rather well. Or that Montaigne would have in reading Latin because of his unusual upbringing. Latin was his first language. Okay, this is the time, although it may be hopping a little bit, we're talking about what's in line 132, where he says, for it's not continuous drinkings and revelings, nor the satisfaction of lust, nor the enjoyment of fish and other luxuries of the wealthy table, which produce a pleasant life, but sober reasoning, searching out the motives for all choice and avoidance and banishing mere opinions to which are due the greatest disturbance of the spirit. Now, I've seen people take that line and they say that means that Epicurus is saying that ultimately the highest pleasure is some kind of sober reasoning, that it is reflection, that it is intellectual. And so if I'm trying to link that, obviously, what Calicini and Joshua have just said by asking this question. And I think some of the other Greek philosophers do take that position that the pleasures of the intellect, the mind, all of that is the purpose of life. They put those on a higher pedestal and they look down on bodily pleasures. So what is the Epicurean position on this based on what Joshua has just said and what Calicini has asked? Is Epicurus telling us that we should seek out sober reasoning and intellectual activities of the mind as the ultimate goal of life? Is he putting those on a higher pedestal? No, of course not. I mean, the way it's written here, it's clear that it's not like that. No? So the sober reasoning is a tool to get pleasure. That's how it's written here. So by this reasoning, we can tell whether desire is vain no? and won't lead to pleasure. No? Uh, at least with some experience, we can do that. Sometimes we just need to go and try to gain that experience. But once we, we've, we've gained sufficient experience, we can tell that before. Just like you did last week, Martin, you jumped in with, I think, an excellent comment, much more concisely stated than I'm able to say myself. And so let's take that and stay with what Joshua and Calassini have brought up. Is there a absolute list of pleasures which have mental activity at the top endorsed by Epicurus as the most important? In addition to that, I would say, how do you determine what to pursue and where do you draw the line? Because we don't have a list of what's good and what's bad. It's up to each person to decide. Are you supposed to go to the natural and necessary analysis and just immediately compose your own list according to what is necessary for you to do and then what is natural for you to do? Is that the way to intellectually come up with the things that you should pursue in your life? Does the very composition of that list amount to the best way to spend your time? It's funny you put it that way, Cassius, because I can certainly picture a certain kind of person thinking, OK, it's time to make a spreadsheet now. I'm going to list all the pleasures. I'm going to chart how I use them and I'm going to chart the result and then scale it somehow. And it's um, exact. We've got a thread on the forum where I myself did exactly that, <laughs> came up with a spreadsheet and put little columns in for how long would the pleasure last, how long would the pain last. How intense would the pain of the pleasure be? And try to do exactly that and to mathematically come up with a picture spreadsheet. And I believe Bentham was suggesting something like that. Somebody mentioned that in the thread as well. That You can mathematically add up the experiences of pleasure and pain and scientifically, mathematically come up with a prescription for how you should spend your time. Is that a correct way to approach things? And believe me, in the past, we've gone down this road of discussing it, and it has been highly controversial. What we're talking about here is Bentham and his hedons and dolors, right? 
Kings right. are units of pleasure, dolors are units of pain or suffering or something. And then by adding up all the hedons and then subtracting all the dolans from that figure, you get the net pleasure you got out of an experience or something like that. My own opinion is that this is absolutely not necessary or essential in order to experience the good life. It doesn't require that level of technical approach. That's my thinking. It doesn't require it. Is it actually helpful or is it actually harmful to try to do that? Uh, as a one-time exercise, that, that may be useful to get clear on, 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 on some aspects of it. But for most people, it would not be helpful to, to really do this explicitly with a spreadsheet all the time. We do this normally just by intuition combined with reasoning. Yeah, yeah, we do it dynamically. This is how we normally approach choice and avoidance. When you encounter a desire, you implement choice and avoidance and decide whether to fulfill it or not. I think Martin makes a good point. As a one-time exercise, this might be useful, but there's such a thing as being too involved in your system, right? You have a system to help you solve a problem in your life. Sometimes, like say, for example, you're trying to work more efficiently, so you develop a system to work more efficiently. But if you're spending all your time on your system, not only are you not working efficiently, you're not working at all. And so I think an analogy could be made between that and pleasure. If you're spending so much time thinking about how you should pursue pleasure, you're probably closing yourself off from the experience of it in some important way. I'm just thinking if I agree with what Joshua just said or not. It'll be more interesting if you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your stream of consciousness and nobody here is held to a final statement. We're constantly extending and revising our prior comments. So, Joshua, did you say that it's better to not think too hard about whether something is going to be enjoyable because you'll end up somehow depleting the results? The pleasurable result will not be as great if you think too much about something? I think that in individual cases, it's not a problem to think about whether you should do it or not. You know, should I go to Europe this summer? I don't know. That's something I would have to think about for a long time. I'd have to see if I had the money for it. I'd have to see if I could get the vacation time. I'd have to see what kind of other obligations I have on the horizon or the weddings I need to go to. I don't think that spending that much time invested in it would diminish the pleasure of it, which might sound somewhat contradictory to what I've just said, but this idea that you can have a running chart with all of your desires and whether they turned out good or whether they turned out bad. To me, it, it would be possible, I think, to get too invested in the mechanical procedure of going through the chart and just simply not having enough time to actually pursue the pleasures that you've already determined were worth pursuing. I think it really depends on what you're trying to choose between or what your situation is because there's just so many different kinds of things that could arise where you're going to want to spend time considering what the end result will be such as if you are deciding between say going to two different colleges like which college will you choose then another decision is which job will you take if you have several that you're choosing between so those are rather complex decisions, which then considering the long-term results, for example, how much enjoyment will come from something would be one consideration among all the others. Oh, I totally agree with those examples because what you're describing there, I think, are commitments that you're making now that you're expecting will bear some kind of fruit over the course of your life. And so in cases like that, I don't think you could spend too much time deciding which college you should go to. The only objection to spending too much time thinking about which job you should take would be, do you have enough money to allow you to spend that much time? And if you do, great. Yeah, then there's no harm in thinking about it. Let's explore the answer to that question. We're flipping around and not going in the correct order of the text here. But the last passage we have for today, of all this, the beginning and greatest good is prudence. And the rest of it is about how prudence is more precious even than philosophy. And from prudence springs the virtues and so forth. But what is prudence in what we're talking about right now? Is prudence a spreadsheet? Can prudence be developed through a spreadsheet or is prudence a synonym here for wisdom, knowledge, or is it a synonym for good judgment, perhaps? 
I kind of think that good judgment jumps out at me when I hear the word prudence rather than necessarily an encyclopedic wisdom. What is good judgment, if prudence is translatable as good judgment or something like that? What does that tell us about how to analyze how much time to spend on a spreadsheet? I think the answer to that, again, would scale with the level of the commitment that's involved. Because when I think of prudence, the other thing I think I think of is, you know, it's not prudent to put all your eggs in one basket. So prudence involves, I think, operating in such a way that you leave other doors open if what you're doing here doesn't work out. I don't know if that's a helpful way to put it. Well, let's talk about prudence before we move on to anything else. What do Calisthene and Martin think Epicurus is focusing on here? Because prudence, I do think, implies something different than, quote, book learning. And this may even apply to what we've been discussing so far about there being an absolute list. A person who is prudent doesn't necessarily have a computer bank in his brain. He's not necessarily Mr. Spock, who's got all these facts at his command. He's somebody who is potentially... I use the word wise here now in a different way. He's someone who has good judgment, the ability to command the facts and apply them for a successful result, as opposed to just, again, the ability to read off some kind of a list like the Ten Commandments or something. The Ten Commandments is a list of things, even if you accept that they're a good idea. But how you apply the Ten Commandments or any other list of goals is the trick in every situation. Prudence implies a little bit of practicality or pragmatism, it sounds like to me, in terms of looking at the result versus in the example that you just gave, Joshua, putting all your eggs in one basket. There's no God who's telling you not to put all your eggs in one basket. There's no absolute rule that says you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. In fact, I remember clearly when I was in high school, I had a teacher who liked to talk about that particular saying, and she said she didn't agree with that saying. Her position was you should put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. In other words, obviously, take care to protect the things that you're looking for. And you may be able to do that sometimes by putting all your eggs in one basket, as opposed to diversifying where you put them. So prudence is somehow the ability to wisely and with good judgment decide whether to put all your eggs in one basket or not. And where does that come from? A spreadsheet? A list of absolute rules? Do you get prudence by reading the letter to Menorcus? We get this by looking at our experience and using reason. By reasonably evaluating our actual true experiences. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which helps, I think, to understand that we're not just going to logically project some kind of conceptual ideal. We're going to examine reality and use our experiences in the past and our analogies of what we observe to pragmatically, with common sense, live every future moment. How is Epicurus telling us to gain prudence? Well, part of the problem here is he says prudence teaches us that it is not possible to live pleasantly without living prudently. That's part of a broader quote. That could be Bailey. How does Hicks say that? The same. Oh, he does. I don't know if the circular wording is in the Greek (laughs) or is it in these translators? I don't know, but I also don't expect Epicurus to necessarily give a list of definitions for the virtues. He sees the virtues as being a tool for gaining the actual good, which is pleasure. But he also says that the pleasant life and virtues are inseparable. And he specifically says that prudence is a more precious thing even than philosophy. How do you separate prudence from philosophy, which he appears to be doing in that sentence construction? It's difficult to know exactly what he had in mind, but of course, philosophy can mean almost anything, right? There's there's any number of different kinds of philosophy, and not all people are interested in philosophy, but some people who display no interest at all in philosophy still manage to live prudently. And certainly there are people who are very interested in philosophy who manage not to live prudently. It seems that you can't really have choice and avoidance without prudence. So prudence must be tied to choice and avoidance. Yeah, successful choice and avoidance, the art of proper choice and avoidance. But in terms of the relationship to philosophy, how can you decide what the result is going to be unless you do have a worldview type understanding of the way things work? I would presume you're right, Joshua, that not everybody wants to study your philosophy or needs to study philosophy in order to successfully live happily. 
I think what we would all agree is that from a practical point of view, if you don't have a worldview or a general understanding of the way the universe operates, that's the whole issue of studying nature in the first place, is to get this general understanding of the way the world works. Because if you don't have that general understanding, you're just not even going to be able to know what is prudent or not. Well, the thing about prudence is nature will teach you whether you want to be instructed or not, right? I think people learn prudence mm -hmm. by being burned. Right, through pleasure and pain. That's the yeah. way nature teaches that. We've still got some time here today, but what we've done in the way we have sort of leapfrogged around this set of texts today is we have not taken up one of the ones that we really need to be sure we explicitly deal with. Because if there is one sentence in the text of the letter to Menorchius that a lot of people like to obsess about, it is the second sentence of what we have is 131, where it says, quote, when therefore we maintain that pleasure is the end, we do not mean the pleasure of profligates and those that consist in sensuality, as is supposed by some who are either ignorant or disagree with us or do not understand. But freedom from pain in the body and from trouble in the mind, that is the Bailey version. Hicks says basically the same thing. When we say then that pleasure is the end and the aim, we do not mean the pleasures of the prodigal or the pleasures of sensuality, as we are understood to do by some through ignorance, prejudice, or willful misrepresentation. By pleasure, we mean the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. That last phrasing in the way that Hicks says it there, quote, by pleasure, we mean the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul, unquote, is probably one of the central battlegrounds of what Epicurean philosophy is all about. So let's not pass over that one lightly, especially in the context of what we've been discussing today about prudence and luxury and things like that. Is Epicurus saying here, by pleasure we mean the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul, that the full and complete definition of pleasure is, quote, absence of pain in the body and trouble in the soul, unquote. Is that all we need to know about Epicurean philosophy? And if it is all we need to know, how do we apply it? How do we understand it? I'm looking at Vatican saying 51, which is useful because it's a case where Epicurus is giving actual instruction to an actual person on a specific issue. And what he says is this, you, meaning the youth or young person that he's talking to, tell me that the stimulus of the flesh makes you too prone to the pleasures of love. Then he goes on to say, provided that you do not break the laws or good customs and do not distress any of your neighbors or do harm to your body or squander your pittance, you may indulge your inclination as you please. Now, he goes on to say that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to not encounter one or another of these barriers. But that last sentence, you may indulge your inclination as you please, provided that it doesn't cause all these other problems seems to me to be hugely suggestive here. So Great point. As, let me put it this way. As long as the pleasures of the profligate, to use a word that Don in particular really hates as, as a translation, as long as the pleasures of the profligate don't cause this laundry list of other problems, there's absolutely nothing wrong with pursuing them. And in fact, pursuing them and enjoying the pleasure that you get from them by virtue of being a kind of pleasure, is the end and goal of life. And Joshua, since you're talking about 51, 50 right in front of it, quote, no pleasure is a bad thing in itself, but the things which produce certain pleasures entail disturbances many times greater than the pleasures themselves. I see that as exactly the same point. The converse of saying no pleasure is a bad thing in itself is all pleasures are good. If it doesn't bring pain for some reason, and 51 is an example of what you're talking about, then it's not a bad thing. And quote, as Epicurus says in 51, you may indulge your inclination as you please, period, unquote. Torquatus says something similar when he talks about how were it not for the requirements of work or some other pressing need, no one would criticize you for pursuing a particular pleasure. I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but Torquatus makes the same point. So it's clearly a really, really important point here that it's not the pleasure itself that is bad. It's only the practical result of pursuing it that can lead to a reason not to pursue it. 
And so what we're talking about, freedom from pain in the body and from trouble in the mind in terms of whether that is a full and complete description, how do we relate 50 and 51 to, to the effect that basically all pleasures are good because they're pleasing? They are reported to us as pleasing by nature, so and there's no way to go beyond that evaluation. If we can obtain a particular pleasure, if we can experience a particular pleasure without a painful result, seems to be, under these statements, that Epicurus is saying there's no reason not to do that. It is purely the practical result of pain that comes in certain circumstances from pursuing certain pleasures that is the problem. Yeah, because Epicurus says elsewhere that the limit of the quantity of pleasure is the removal of all pain. That's a very difficult thing to grasp. But what it means to me is that the goal is not absence of pain or tranquility, as we sometimes describe it. The goal is to get pain, suffering out of the way so that we can experience pleasure unmixed with anything painful. That's another passage that people will interpret as being, okay, all I need to do is remove pain. But that's not the object here, is simply to remove all of the pain. You want to remove all of the pain because the pain gets in the way of the pleasure, and the pleasure is the thing that you're trying to pursue. Now, when he says that the limit of the quantity of pleasure is the removal of all pain, you might think that, okay, now I've eliminated all pain. I'm experiencing as much pleasure as I possibly can. If you truly have eliminated all pain, all suffering, all mental disturbance, then I envy you. But that doesn't mean you have to stop enjoying pleasure. You can now enjoy pleasure, hopefully, for as long as you can without any pain. And you can also enjoy an infinite variety of pleasure. And there's no, as I said earlier, moral opprobrium in one pleasure over another as long as you're not causing all of these other problems. Now, people might at this point say, what if I get pleasure in causing other people pain? Well, that's why Epicurus says that it's impossible to live a happy life without living, or a pleasant life, I should say, without living prudently and honorably and justly. And it's impossible to live prudently and honorably and justly without living a pleasant life. So the goal in all of these cases is really pleasure, in spite of the attempt to make that goal absence of pain. Absence of pain is merely part of how we get to the goal of pleasure. Joshua, I agree with everything that you've just said, but a frequent reaction to a statement like what you have just said is, well, then that means you disagree with Epicurus, Joshua, if you were going to say that. Because what he clearly says in this sentence, we can easily and fairly summarize as, when therefore we maintain that pleasure is the end, we mean freedom from pain in the body and trouble in the mind. That is what he says in this sentence. So why is what you just said, Joshua, not a disagreement with Epicurus? Why are you willing to go and say what you just said in the light of what he's clearly said in this sentence? Pleasure because, is freedom from pain. Because what I'm willing to do, Cassius, is consider this one sentence in light of everything that survives from antiquity, from the Epicureans. And in context of all of that, I really would be willing to defend my position. Well, why does he say it this way then? I think he says it this way because he's being attacked. And if he's trying to either recruit Minoikius or to convince him not to abandon Epicurean philosophy. And in order to do that, you have to answer some of the objections. And the objections, as everyone knows, to Epicurean philosophy is that he was a greedy, sensualist pig. You see paintings from the Victorian era that picture Epicurus as laying on a bed with people just constantly bringing him food. So it's no surprise to me that he wants to get that image out of the way. But to me, the idea that pleasure is the absence of pain makes it rather difficult to proceed elsewhere in the philosophy because pleasure and pain are two different concepts, pleasure in the absence of pain. So there's an impending identity problem here if you equate one with the other directly. Let me put it this way. I just quoted where Epicurus said, the limit of the quantity of pleasure is the removal of all pain. And then here he says, we mean by pleasure, absence of pain. So in that other sentence, if you're going to accept that these definitions are identical, what he's really saying is the limit of the quantity of the absence of pain is the removal of all pain. Can you say that again? If, the limit of what? Now? <laughs> the limit of pleasure, but we're defining pleasure as the absence of pain. So he's, what he's really saying there is if we accept this definition, the limit of the quantity of the absence of pain is the removal of all pain. 
Well, that's obvious. I mean, that resolves into a tautology. That's not even worth saying. So he's got to be saying something different. He's got to be saying something more fully than what we're getting in one line of one text when we have all this other material to look at that seems to offer a different way to explain it. Joshua, and I'm not sure that we've ever pursued that before, so let's take the time to emphasize it. What you're saying, and I have, that's why I had to ask you to repeat it, I thought you had misstated it the first time through, but what you're saying is that if you end up equating pleasure and absence of pain as exact equivalents of each other, then you end up with a tautology. And what's a tautology? Why is it a bad thing to be a tautology? Uh, A tautology is problematic. When an argument resolves into a tautology, what it means is essentially A equals A. In, In other words, essentially what you're doing is assuming a case you have not proved. You're stating a claim that it's an equivalency, I guess is a way of putting it. The problem is tautologies do not allow for any new information. A plus B equals C gives you some idea about C. It also gives you some idea about A and B. But A equals A doesn't tell you anything about anything. It'd be like saying, how should I understand pleasure? And then somebody says one equals one. I, I, it's, or how should you understand pleasure? It's pleasure. You're just answering the question by using the same words you started out with. Right. What would be an interesting exercise, Cassius, is if we went through every Epicurean text where he uses the word pleasure and just use that replace function in Microsoft Word, replace every instance of the word pleasure with the words absence of pain, and just see what results. And I think it would be a monstrous and indecipherable result. But not one that is irrational to ask about, because in truth, Epicurus is saying that there are only two feelings, pleasure and pain. And if you're experiencing anything at all, you're experiencing one of those two. And he's also saying that they're different in nature so that you can be maybe experiencing different pleasures and different pains at the same time, but that pleasure and pain themselves are not a mixture. There's not a neutral, in fact, between the two of them. If it's pleasurable, it's pleasure. If it's painful, it's pain, at least under the way he is setting out his philosophy. Now, we can argue about practicalities of all that, but if you're going to follow or study what Epicurus is saying, you do have to understand that he is saying that all feeling is resolvable, at least philosophically, down into pleasure and pain. Yes, just let me rephrase. Let me rephrase that part. If you're going to say that there's only two feelings, pleasure and pain, then we could very easily rephrase that quote that I mentioned earlier to say the limit of the quantity of the removal of all pain is the fullness of pleasure. Just by rephrasing it using Epicurus's term, you put a totally a more, I guess, nuanced view of it. Mm -hmm. So to look at it and say, okay, the only goal is to remove pain, I could just as easily say, nope, I rephrased it. The only goal is the fullness of pleasure, which is the removal of all pain. It has always seemed to me that the real issue comes down to that pleasure is the absence of pain and pain is the absence of pleasure, but that that equation is not true in every respect. It's the quantity that he's talking about in Principle Doctrine 3 or this abstract definition of these two words that is true when you conceptually say there's only two feelings, therefore, if you're experiencing anything, you're experiencing one or the other, then conceptually you can say that the presence of one is the absence of the other. But it is extremely unsatisfying to try to think about the pains of life as being absence of pleasure or the pleasures of life as being absence of pain, because it does not express the subtleties involved to simply describe every feeling that you like as pleasure. The pleasure of cutting your toenails is not the same as the pleasure of looking off a mountaintop. Pleasures differ from each other in extremely major respects, but the unity that they have is that they all feel good to us. We are using words that unify them, But the experiences themselves, we experience in extremely different ways. But in terms of quantity, if you're talking about there's only two of anything, the presence of one is the absence of the other. And so it's not illogical. It's not wrong to talk in those terms. 
It's just that you have to keep in mind why you're talking in those terms and what is the purpose of the discussion and not take it out of context and attempt to prove things with that discussion that you never intended to address in the first place. Martin, any comment? I'm not sure what's exactly what you had in mind, but what I think about is, so if we, we, we become aware of a lack and this creates a desire which we want to get fulfilled, and we cannot expect to get it fulfilled anytime soon, then this continued lack causes us pain. And so, so if we have a desire like that, that means uh, we have a trouble in the mind because this pain we have from an unfulfilled desire means trouble in the mind. And as we discussed previously, one of the best ways to get rid of an unfulfilled desire is to take action to fulfill the desire, and then this trouble in the mind is gone. So that means by even by formulating it like this, it doesn't mean that you should uh, shun desires or not fulfill them. It's rather the opposite. Maybe the most efficient or in most cases, the best way is to fulfill the desires. Only if these desires are vain or if it's if they are unnecessary ones, if the, the pain through which we need to go to fulfill them doesn't make it worse to them, then we, we need to use that reasoning to get rid of that desire. But uh, more typically, what, uh, what we would do for those desires we can uh, fulfill with reasonable effort, then we just do that. And in this way, we can do a lot of pleasures and we, we, we should get, uh, get a lot of pleasures according to this philosophy of Epicurus. I do think that's an on point statement and a very good one because it does relate us back to what we were discussing last week. If we take a very conceptual point of view of a desire and we focus on the aspect that a desire means that we wish for something that we don't currently have and we attempt to fit that into this paradigm of pleasure and pain, you can certainly make an argument that in a sense, anything that you don't currently have that you would like to have could be considered to be a pain. But as we were discussing last week, you could also argue, I think, rationally, that the experience of anticipating something is pleasurable as well, and that the pursuit of certain desires is pleasurable all the way through. As we're going to be discussing this Wednesday, Principle Doctrine number 26, where he talks about some desires that, that do not lead to pain if they are unfulfilled. The problem with these words is that these words, this logos type of, of an approach, words and concepts cannot adequately the map is not the territory. The words have limitations to them and subtleties that have to be considered all the time. To try to reduce these words, desire and pain and pleasure, to try to follow them conceptually too far out in the abstract, away from the actual feelings themselves, leads to problems that are not in the experiences, not in the feelings, but they're problems in our ability to conceptually describe things. So Let's, it would be criminal to get to the end of this episode and not talk about bread and water. Right. Um, and Don, for one, would be extremely disappointed in us if we didn't get this in. And now we're jumping back to the beginning here, where in the Bailey translation, he says, Plain savers bring us a pleasure equal to a luxurious diet when all the pain due to want is removed. And bread and water produce the highest pleasure when one who needs them puts them to his lips. Now, Don has a very good commentary and translation that he put together on the letter to Minoikius. It's available on the forum. And in this commentary, he looks through the nuts and bolts of the Greek text very closely. And what he came up with for this issue of bread and water is this word masa. And for anyone who is listening to this podcast who happens to speak Spanish, you'll recognize that masa is the corn flour used in Hispanic cultures to make tortillas, which they will use then in tacos and gorditas and burritos and all those other delicious dishes. So to say that we're using masa means something more than just we're eating tortillas. We're also putting things on the tortillas. So for the case of masa in ancient Greece, which means bread, what this really is, is not necessarily a sacrifice for Epicurus, because this is the, just the common plain dish of everyday people. This is what you eat for lunch. You know, you take it to work every day or whatever. 
So it's, it's not that he's living in a cave and just living on bread and water and just throwing away everything else that society has to offer. Because while he's eating bread and water, he might also be eating things from the garden, which, of course, was all around him as he taught. He says elsewhere, send me a pot of cheese so that when I like, I may dine sumptuously. So this issue of bread and water has become, this is like the prison diet, right? Bread and water. Not anymore, of course, but this is what people imagine when you hear bread and water. But I think what Epicurus is describing is not necessarily a sacrifice. It's just something that common people eat every day, have done for thousands of years, and it doesn't necessarily involve a lack when you're eating something that you eat all the time. And come to it with good relish, as he says here, when one who needs them puts them to his lips. I don't know if I've done justice to Don with what I've said there, but clearly the goal here is not to just absolutely live with the simplest and most necessary things, because you can make a very good case that Diogenes the Cynic was doing just that when he lived in a tub or a wine crater or whatever it was, and threw away his cup when he saw a boy drinking from his cupped hands from a stream, it's possible to live that kind of life. But Epicurus elsewhere says that that is as much in error as those who say that we should only experience luxury all the time. Joshua, maybe another way to say that too, I've heard people joke about the choice between living to eat versus eating to live. In other words, much of what we're talking about resolves down into the final analysis of remembering what the actual goal is, and you tune what you do according to the ultimate goal. In general, it's going to be better to accustom yourself to a simple diet, to a normal diet, like you were expressing earlier, the everyday diet. It's much better to accustom yourself to the everyday diet so that you're confident that you'll be able to continue to experience that into the future and you'll be freed from fear that you might not be able to obtain that in the future. That's what seems to be one of the real issues with luxury as he's discussing it is that you might get so attached to it that you get afraid that you won't be able to continue to have it and that you might be deprived of something you absolutely have to have. And therefore, that causes anxiety and pain to worry about something like that. But if you accustom yourself to a normal diet of the type things that you and Don are talking about, that frees you from worry about something that is a very legitimate concern. If you devote yourself to living to eat as if you think eating itself is the goal, it's not. Let me use that as a transition to Joshua because we really haven't touched at the end here, something that is as much of an interest to everybody as anything else, this issue of virtue, because this last section we're talking about today is where he basically says the same thing that's in Principle Doctrine 5, I believe it is, that the life of prudence and honesty and justice is inseparable from living pleasantly, and where he says, for the virtues are by nature bound up with the pleasant life, and the pleasant life is inseparable from them. Maybe if there's a theme of today and what we've been talking about, it's just this issue of conceptual reasoning and how important it is to be careful with the words you're using and understand the subtleties of it. Because the Stoics, the Platonists, the Aristotelians will consider virtue to be something that's absolute and has an idealist type of definition to it that you can follow a list and know exactly what to do. But what Epicurus seems to be saying throughout is that what you choose to eat, what you choose to pursue in terms of luxury, what you choose to do in pursuit of sex, all the different drinking, reveling, satisfaction of lust, fish, and luxuries of the wealthy table, which produce the present life, and virtue as well in that list. All of these things he's raising not to condemn them or to praise them, but to tell you that those are not in themselves the goal. It is the prudent pursuit of desires and choices and avoidances in each of these topics that must be judged according to whether they in fact lead to a happy, pleasant life or not. If they don't lead to happiness and pleasure, then you're doing it wrong, but that they're not intrinsically in themselves happiness or pleasure. They are tools. Even virtue itself is a tool toward living happily. If somebody asks you if you're a happy person and you have to think about it and you say, well, I think I'm happy, but I really don't feel happy, then you've got a problem. Ultimately, life resolves to feeling 
it does not resolve to concepts. Life resolves to living experiences of which pleasure and pain are our general description. And all these other words that we're throwing in, desire, virtue, words like that, that are helpful to us in thinking about things, just like that spreadsheet. It's helpful to talk about things. It's helpful to use a spreadsheet at certain times. But life is not a spreadsheet. Life is not an analysis. The map is not the territory. Maps are very helpful for navigating through the territory, but they are not the territory itself. And if you confuse those two things and think that the map is the end, you're going to make the same mistake over and over in all of these topics we're talking about, from luxury to sex to drinking to fish to virtue. Okay, we're probably about to run long for the week. So unfortunately, we need to come to an end for today and talk about closing thoughts. And so feel free to go as long as you wish to on the closing thoughts, since I know we're hitting a lot in a short period of time. But Martin, your thoughts as we begin to close? I have no closing thought now. Calasini. Yeah, so you said life resolves to feeling and then the question of whether or not you're happy. And that was really kind of a light went off in my head regarding what you said there, because it's kind of looking at the overall picture of not just a pleasurable life, but a life well lived in a happy way, a satisfied life, but not just kind of a quiet satisfaction, but it just brings up everything that has to do with what is happiness and then the feeling part of that, to really feel that. So if I ask myself that question, how would I answer that? Am I generally a happy person? I think it's something to really think about. Do you measure happiness according to a list or do you measure happiness according to how you feel? Yeah, I really like that idea of the sense of the feeling of it, to measure it by the feeling. Joshua. Uh, Just one more point I'd like to make about these other topics that swirl around this issue of pleasure, Cassius, that you have indicated are tools for gaining pleasure, things like simpleness and luxury and vice and virtue. I think it's probably worth noting that so many of these are changing values. These are not fixed constants. They're moving targets. And one good example of that is the lobster. The lobster used to be so plentiful and disgusting to people that it was served up in prisons just so they could feed people good protein without giving them good food. Lobster was used as fertilizer and fish bait. And of course, after just the change of about two centuries, lobster is now one of the most prominently and easily identified luxurious foods that you can eat. It's gone quite expensive now to get lobster, uh, but that wasn't always the case. And the same thing is true with stuff like clothes. You know, you used to have to have somebody weave and stitch clothes together, and now they're mass produced on machinery that can make them so cheaply that anybody can get clothes just about couple more points on the same line. I keep quoting Romeo and Juliet. I'm, I'm getting to really love this play. Friar Lawrence again says, virtue itself turns vice being misapplied and vice sometimes by action dignified. If you take virtue to be the goal or end of life, then you can't allow something like that where to behave virtuously might yield a bad result, which it sometimes does, or to behave in a way that is commonly considered viciously the result turns out to be good. These are the all sorts of problems that you have. There's another quote from Shakespeare that I love. This comes from Richard III, a terrible tragedy with an utterly despicable main character. And he says about himself in his own words, he says, thus I clothe my naked villainy with odd old ends stolen forth from holy writ and seem a saint when most I play the devil. So as we come to a close here, I think worth considering is what you're choosing as the goal of your life, does it really have a solid or stable foundation? And Cassius, you pointed out that when we come right down to it, what we come down to in the end is the feelings of pleasure and pain. And that is all I have. And I'll add at the very end, principle doctrine two, death is nothing to us for that which is dissolved is without sensation. And that which lacks sensation is nothing to us. The converse of which to me is that sensation, feeling, is everything to us. So that as we look at these words that we talk about, virtue and tranquility and even pleasure and pain, ultimately are words. 
But the difference with pleasure and pain is it's a word that clearly describes a feeling. And he's pointing to us to look back at what young creatures of all types, before they are perverted, think and do and how they act. And what they do before they are perverted is they pursue pleasure, the feeling of pleasure, and they avoid the feeling of pain. That's what this all resolves to. After death, there is no feeling. Before life, there is no feeling. I think that's probably a good way to summarize a lot of this material. Okay, well, these are issues that we'll continue to talk about in podcasts as long as we continue to have Epicurean podcasts, because these are so central to everything. But for purposes of going through the letter to Menorchus right now, we'll bring this to a conclusion. And I think we have maybe only one more week of the letter to Menorchus, maybe two, before we finish. After we do finish, we'll turn back into the detail of some of these issues. So thanks again for being with us today, and we'll come back in another week to approach the end of the letter to Menorchus. See you then. Thanks, my brother. Welcome to episode 140 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean texts, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. Today we complete our discussion of Epicurus's letter to Menorchius. Now let's join Calassini reading today's text. For indeed, who think you is a better man than he who holds reverent opinions concerning the gods and is at all times free from fear of death and has reasoned out the end ordained by nature? He understands that the limit of good things is easy to fulfill and easy to attain, whereas the course of ills is either short in time or slight in pain. He laughs at destiny whom some have introduced as the mistress of all things. He thinks that with us lies the chief power in determining events, some of which happen by necessity, and some by chance, and some are within our control. For while necessity cannot be called to account, he sees that chance is inconstant, but that which is in our control is subject to no master and to it are naturally attached praise and blame. For indeed, it were better to follow the myths about the gods than to become a slave to the destiny of the natural philosophers. For the former suggests a hope of placating the gods by worship, whereas the latter involves a necessity which knows no placation. As to chance, he does not regard it as a god as most men do. For in a god's acts there is no disorder nor as an uncertain cause of all things, for he does not believe that good and evil are given by chance to man from the framing of a blessed life, but that opportunities for great good and great evil are afforded by it. He therefore thinks it better to be unfortunate in reasonable action than to prosper in unreason, for it is better in a man's actions that what is well chosen should fail rather than what is ill chosen should be successful owing to chance. Meditate, therefore, on these things and things akin to them night and day by yourself and with a companion like to yourself, and never shall you be disturbed waking or asleep, but you shall live like a god among men. 
For a man who lives among immortal blessings is not like unto a mortal being. Okay, very good. Thank you for reading that for us this morning, Calasini. We are now at the end of the letter to Menorchius. We've been covering a lot of important material on how to live. And now at the end of the letter, he's making several points regarding determinism and personal responsibility and that it would be better to be involved in a false religion than it would be to be a slave of hard determinism. So there's some interesting material here today that we can use to complete the letter. And then at the end of the episode, hopefully we'll have some time to talk about in general the full impact of the letter to Menorchius and how it fits into the Epicurean worldview. But let's start with 133. For indeed, who think he was a better man than he who holds reverent opinions concerning the gods and death and has reasoned out the end ordained by nature? Right. And on that note, Cassius, let me read a little bit of something else. This is a very similar passage, and it comes from the Torquatus material in Cicero's On Ends. He says, let us imagine a man living in the continuous enjoyment of numerous and vivid pleasures alike of body and of mind, undisturbed either by the presence or by the prospect of pain. What possible state of existence could we describe? as being more excellent or more desirable. One so situated must possess in the first place a strength of mind that is proof against all fear of death or of pain. He will know that death means complete unconsciousness and that pain is generally light if long and short if strong, so that its intensity is compensated by brief duration and its continuance by diminishing severity. Let such a man, moreover, have no dread of any supernatural power Let him never suffer the pleasures of the past to fade away, but constantly renew their enjoyment in recollection, and his lot will be one which will not admit of further improvement. So that's very similar to what we're reading in the very end of the letter to Menoikius. And it's probable, I think, that Cicero is reading the letter to Menoikius and taking that out and and inserting it into the Torquatus monologue. And he's doing that because obviously this is a very important passage and a very important end to a very important letter. And in fact, as we go through this, this is the last letter. So we'll have gone through them all. You know, Joshua, as you bring up that point, it's interesting to think about how the Torquatus material in Cicero, the manuscript of that is actually earlier than the letter that we're reading in Diogenes Laertius. To some extent, I'm beginning to think that the Torquatus material appears to come from something that is obviously more detailed than the letter to Menorchia says. And I wonder if the Torquatus material is a better representation of the full picture even than this letter to Menorchius says. Presumably, Cicero is reading from something, and maybe it's the letter to Menorchius, or maybe it's some larger work. Presumably, it is some larger work that comes down from the Epicureans. And you would think that they had something more detailed than this letter that they were going by as their primary reference source. So it's interesting to think about whether the Torquatus material in its greater detail is actually a better indication of some aspects of the philosophy than this letter itself is. You've got all the issues of who is Menorchius and whether Epicurus was tuning it in a particular way to a particular recipient. But by the time several hundred years later, Cicero is writing, he's got something in front of him that appears to be a more detailed and in-depth explanation of Epicurean philosophy. So I don't think there's any major inconsistencies or anything like that, but I think we can get a lot by doing exactly what you just did to read into the Torquatus material and see how it elaborates on it. Yeah, and and a feature of interest in Epicurean philosophy, and in fact, in most ancient philosophy, classical, Mediterranean, Greek, Latin, Roman philosophy, is you get these vignettes of what makes a good person or what makes a wise person. Or the word that uh, Diogenes Laertius always uses is the wise man or the sage, something like that. It's a portrayal of a life that we can model our own life after, I I think is what it's set up to be. You know, the goal is not for Epicurus to write this letter so that people think he's the wisest person on earth and then everybody comes and follows him. His goal, I think, is to portray what he thinks a wise person looks like or a person in better circumstances looks like so that the people he's trying to reach can emulate that kind of life 
and improve their own life by doing so. And the gods, which are mentioned here very early on, in fact, the first sentence that we're reading today, for indeed, who think you is a better man than he who holds reverent opinions concerning the gods? So the gods themselves, as Epicurus portrays them, are another kind of example of a paragon or something, something that you can look to as being optimal, an optimal way to live, and thereby doing, hopefully, improve your own life. And even if you don't get to the point where you are living a life like the gods or you're living among immortal blessings, that kind of thing, even if you don't attain that state, you can always make some progress towards happiness. And it was Torquatus who comes down to us with that very famous quote where he says that Epicurus is the master builder, if I may style him so, of the life of happiness. And Joshua, that's something very similar to what Martin and I were discussing before we started recording today. It's a sort of a continuing interest of mine to consider the issue of tranquility and how it fits into the philosophy and pleasure, of course, as well. We've gone through two episodes where we were discussing those sections of the letter, but really those fit in the context that we're looking for the optimum way of life. We're not necessarily focused every moment on either pursuing a particular pleasure or even avoiding a particular pain. And as Epicurus says, we sometimes choose the pain. We sometimes avoid the pleasure for the sake of the ultimate outcome of what we think is going to be the best for us in terms of the balance. But there's a premise when we discuss pleasure and pain that we live only a short period of time. We're not responsible to a supernatural God or to some absolute list of things to do. So in order for us to really get our lives in order, we have to decide what is the best way of life, what is the optimum way of life. And just simply saying, pursue pleasure, avoid pain, doesn't answer the specific questions that all of us confront about how to spend our time today. And that's what it seems like to me he's deciding to sort of close this letter on here. He's gone back to the ultimate question of what is the best life. Certainly the best life involves pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. It involves tranquility. It involves the different concepts that we talk about. But in order to bring into reality our big picture word discussion, it's helpful, it seems like he's saying, to think about what is the optimum picture, what is the framework of everything that you're attempting to accomplish. And so that's what we seem to be talking about here. There's a good list in the Torquatus material that you just read of the things that the better man, the best man is going to do. And as usual, just like he does in the Principal Doctrines, he goes back to the issues of having a holy belief about the gods, a correct belief about supernatural gods, and also to be free of the fear of death, which is Principal Doctrines 1 and 2. And then diligently consider the end fixed by nature and the limit of good things can be reached and attained and the duration and intensity of evils is slight. I mean, this is just a restatement of Principal Doctrines 3 and 4. So this section here we're talking about today is almost just a straight recap of Principal Doctrines 1 through 4. And as he goes forward, he brings in these other issues as well. We might as well go on to the next section about how he laughs at destiny, which some have introduced as the mistress of all things. And he thinks that within us lies the chief power in determining events, but that some happen by necessity, some by chance, and some are within our control, and obviously then some are not. For while necessity can't be called to account, he sees that chance is inconstant, but that which is in our control is subject to no master, and to it are naturally attached praise and blame. So why don't we go ahead and start talking about this personal responsibility aspect of Epicurus, because that's a highly controversial topic as well. The basic, I think, direction he's going in is if you're going to set up a goal, if you're going to identify what the optimum life is, you need to address whether you've got any ability to achieve that or not. If you don't have the ability to achieve it, then you're wasting your time or even worse by setting up some goal for life, which is impossible to obtain. And if there's supernatural gods constantly getting in our way or frustrating us in our desires, that's one thing to worry about. But also this issue of chance. It was probably as obvious to them as it is to us, and this is where Epicurus differed from Democritus, that if the atomistic nature of the universe makes us just billiard balls that we're just constantly being buffeted around by outside events, then that eliminates our own possibility of steering our lives in a more successful direction. 
I think I mentioned this in one of the Wednesday meetings. There was a movie that came out, The Hobbit, and there was a line at the very beginning of the movie in which Bilbo Baggins says, quite by chance, and the will of a wizard, fate decided that I would have a part to play in this story. <laughs> now, this to me is just typical of the confusion that swirls around these issues of fate or destiny, of choice or free will, of chance, determinism. Most people, I think, don't really spend too much time thinking about why do we do the things we do? Do we do it because we were ordained to do it by a god? Do we do it because the universe is deterministic and we couldn't choose something else even if we wanted to? Do we do it because it's our fate or our destiny? You mentioned Democritus and hard determinism, and that was a problem for the philosophers in ancient Greece. But there was a religious problem also in ancient Greece, and that was this idea of fate. And it has given Greek drama so much of its interest and flavor because you've got these characters like Oedipus, for example, who when he was born, he was son of a king, is my understanding. And there was an oracle at his birth. And the oracle said that this boy, if he grew up, would slay his father and bed his mother. Right. And so, OK, now we've got whether you want to call it the will of the gods or fate or destiny, we've got this problem hanging in the stars now. And they bind his feet or drill holes in his feet or something, and they throw him out into the wilderness. And he is taken in by a peasant farmer. This is one of the classic tropes of all literature is, is a prince taken in by a farmer in exile. He grows up and he goes on to, to what does he do? He solves the riddle of the Sphinx, I think. And then he, he goes on now to fulfill everything that the Oracle said he would fulfill when he was born. And so the problem presented by fate or destiny in literature is that no matter how hard you run, you can't get away from it. There's an old story. It's preserved by uh, W. Somerset Maugham called Death in Samsara, Samara, something like I can't remember the name of the town. Anyway, this guy sends his servant, this uh, wealthy landowner, sends his servant into town in order to get supplies for the household. And the servant comes back without the supplies. And the landlord goes, what are you doing? I sent you to get supplies. And the servant says, I was in the market getting supplies and I turned around and I saw death. And so I dropped everything and I fled back here. And now the landowner, who cared a great deal about this servant and didn't want him to die, gave him the fastest horse and sent him to the far off town of Samara or whatever it is. And the servant gets to Samara. And as soon as he gets there, he's killed by death, basically, is what happens. Before that happens, though, the landowner then goes into town, goes to the market, finds death. And says, what are you doing? Why are you scaring my servant? And Death says, well, I, I had no intention of scaring your servant. I was surprised because I wasn't expecting to see him here today because I have an appointment with him tomorrow in far off Samara. So the landowner, in trying to circumvent the fate that his servant was coming to, had actually sent him directly to his death by sending him to this other town. What do we make of all this? I think Epicurus would say you need to... Accustom yourself to simply reject the idea. There is no fate. There is no destiny. These things do not have any control, any influence over the way that you live your life. And part of the problem is if you accepted that they did, then you, there's no reason to do anything now, because no matter what happens, I have a destiny and it's going to come for me whether I want it to or not whether I try to reach it or not, whether I try to avoid it or not, it totally removes any will or ambition to do anything in life if you believe that there's a road that's been laid out for you and that it will happen no matter what you do. Joshua, people are going to push back and say that when he says the chief power in determining events lies within us, the example that you just gave about the confrontation with death in that illustration, we ourselves have the ability to decide whether we want to kill ourselves today. We have tremendous power. If we decide to do that, then there won't be a tomorrow for us. And that supersedes any possible issues of fate or supernatural interference or undue control over your life, which is something we constantly run into nowadays. And I guess people always have, but we particularly think that way today, that events are out of our control. Well, 
they're not totally out of control. We can bring our lives to an end if we choose to do so. But more even than that, earlier in the letter, he's talked about how living the simple life and not wedding yourself to luxury is, is important because you fear losing it if you get so attached to luxury that you just don't want to lose it. If you accustom yourself to simple living, it makes it a whole lot easier to walk away or to move to new areas or to take the actions that might be necessary to obtain a better life. If you decide to pick up and move across the country tomorrow, your life is going to be a lot different than if you stayed in the same place that you've been living previously. So he's affirmatively saying that there are things that are out of our control and some happen by chance, but There's an awful lot that is within our control if we choose to exert our willpower and our actions to make things happen. Again, it certainly makes it easier to do that if you accustom yourself to focusing on those things that are important in life and the basics and not getting yourself attached with, uh, I think there's all sorts of cliches about golden handcuffs, and that's what we've done in the modern world so many times through the commercialism and so forth. You live above your means and you feel like there's no way out. You feel trapped and you feel like the whole world is out of control. But those circumstances, in many cases, are the result of your own choices in the first place. Cassius, you're giving the Greek oracles less than their fair due, because if they prophesied that you were going to die tomorrow (laughs) and you killed yourself today, they would just change the prophecy. It's, It's very easy to do. They did it all the time. Alexander the Oracle Longer told Marcus Aurelius, of all people, the emperor of Rome, that if he did this certain thing and waged the battle at this certain time, there would be a great victory. Well, he went on to do those things, and then the Romans suffered a terrible defeat, and Alexander the Oracle Longer said, we prophesied a great victory, but we did not say which side it would fall to. <laughs> so, Well, let me continue with the direction you were going in, Joshua, because I think this is extremely important. 134, the section we would take up next, Epicurus has a tendency to just be in your face about things. And he says here that it would be better to follow the myths about the gods, which we've established over and over and over is not true in Epicurean philosophy. But he's saying it would be better to follow the lies, basically, of religion than to become a slave to the destiny of the natural philosophers, which I think is generally interpreted to mean hard determinism, those who are promoting that you have no ability to influence or change your own future. Because the former suggests a hope of placating the gods by worship, whereas the latter involves a necessity which knows no placation. And as he continues in that sentence, he says, as to chance, he does not regard it as a god nor an uncertain cause of all things, for he does not believe that good and evil are given by chance to a man for the framing of a blessed life, but that opportunities for great good and great evil are afforded by it. And then the 135, he therefore thinks it better to be unfortunate in a reasonable action than to prosper in unreason. For it is better in a man's action that what is well chosen should fail rather than what is ill chosen should be successful owing to chance. So that whole line of argument in 134 through 135. To me, that's putting the focus on your vigorously engaging with the events of your life that you choose and avoid in order to make good things happen to you and also to avoid bad things from happening to you. But that you're not a billiard ball. You're not a pawn of the gods. You're not a pawn of other people. It's better that you even fail, at least in trying to live happily, than to just by chance occasionally grasp a few scraps of pleasure here and there. Again, what I'm seeing in this type of material is that you're not just simply fleeing from pain. You're not just simply reaching for the immediate momentary pleasure that might be available to you. You're looking at the big picture of your life and where you fit in the universe and you're trying to use your time as best you can. The Greeks were interested in living the best life. They had to determine what the best life is before they could live it because they knew there was all this controversy about what they should be doing. But ultimately, they weren't just looking for anesthesia from pain. They were looking to identify what the goal of life should be so that they could then take steps to achieve that good life for themselves. 
unless you know what the good life is, you don't know what to do. And you don't just let yourself be pushed around by events that you think are out of your control, because ultimately these events are not totally outside your control. And it's better for you to get engaged, use your mind aggressively, reasonably, scientifically, follow the evidence and do the best you can, rather than just to sit back and hope that fate or chance is going to reward you for doing nothing. Yeah, this is the way that Cassius, the other Cassius, in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, he's speaking to Brutus here, and this is the way he puts it. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. So this is a hint of Epicureanism leaking again into one of Shakespeare's plays. And of course, totally appropriately, since Cassius Longinus was an Epicurean himself, he would be making that point. Joshua, isn't there a related text about a tide in the affairs of men that once missed? That goes in the other direction. But do you know what I'm talking about? Is that not Uh, in the same section? This is from Brutus speaking to Cassius. He says, there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Now, not to turn this into a Shakespeare debate, but I, I, <laughs> I see that as a little bit different and appropriately so coming from Brutus, who's thought of as a Stoic, but I think he's not a Stoic as much as he is a Platonist. But a tide in the affairs of men. Can you imagine Epicurus talking about a tide in the affairs of men? Does that contradict free will or can that be consistent with it? Well, he says, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. So clearly he's putting a lot onto chance here, is is my view of that. Of course, taken at the flood is, in, in fact, what they're talking about. They're trying to decide whether to move at that particular moment and engage in battle at that particular time and place or whether to postpone it or not. Now, the Epicurean objection to this, in my view, would, would not be to say that there is no tide. You know, things are happening all around us that we have absolutely no control over. We only have control over some of the things. We have control over things that we do. We don't have control over things that other people do. And no amount of turning ourselves into a rock is going to solve that problem. So the Epicurean response to this might be to say we don't have to take the road that leads on to fortune. You know, it would be possible to live a blessed life without following that necessity. But the choice is yours. That would be, I think, the response. Yeah. And if I recall the context there, they were debating with each other about where and when to engage in battle with the forces of Octavian and Antony. Yeah. If if I'm remembering correctly, I think Cassius wanted to delay or move to another area and Brutus wanted to go ahead and engage. I may have that reversed. No, you are right. Yeah, the, he's trying to convince Cassius to march to Philippi. Yeah, and maybe the important point is certainly that fate did not decree their loss in that battle. Regardless of which choice they made, Cassius would have objected to saying that the gods or fate would have been the determining factor. But I think you're right, Joshua, in what you said earlier, that tides do exist. If you set your boat out against the tides, you're going to have a different result than if you go with the tide. So tides have to be considered because general flows of events do happen, but they don't happen because of the will of the gods or because the universe is totally deterministic. Cassius could have decided, I'm not going to agree with you. I'm going to move to another area. I'm not going to fight right now. And that choice of whether to fight then at that moment was theirs and not forced upon them by the gods or by fate. Part of the reason that it seems appropriate to talk about it for just a moment as we have is that Brutus does seem to be appealing to supernatural forces and the fates spinning the results for men in that argument. But regardless of the result, it wasn't the gods or fate that led Anthony and Octavian to win. So if we move past 135 there to the final words of the letter, meditate therefore on these things and things akin to them night and day and by yourself and with a companion like to yourself. And never shall you be disturbed waking or asleep, but you shall live like a god among men. For a man who lives among immortal blessings is not like unto a mortal being. That God among men phrase is a very famous one in Epicurean philosophy. So what do we make of that? 
Well, earlier on in the in the episode, Cassius, you were using words like picture and the framework and all that to describe what we mean when we talk about the blessed life. And at that moment, I was thinking about a literal picture, and that would be the tendency by the early Epicureans to take Epicurus's face and just put it on everything. Put it on the ring on your finger, put it on a marble bust in the middle of town, put it on your wall. The tendency here, and well, by the way, this might be perceived as a problem to non-Epicureans in the ancient world, because the appearance is of being obsessed with one mortal. Well, there was another case in the ancient world where you did have a group of people who were followers of one mortal, but made claims about him that were totally discordant with the way that the Greeks and the Romans viewed the world. And I'm talking here about the early Christians and their tendency to worship what the Greeks and Romans would have thought of as clearly a man, just a person, a mortal. And you see the same thing with Alexander the Great. When he swept south, he conquered Persia and then freed the Greek city-states on the Mediterranean, and then he swept into Egypt. And when he went into Egypt, he was taken to the desert oasis of Siwa, where there's a shrine there. And he apparently allowed himself to be convinced by the Egyptians that he was no mere mortal, but in fact a god, because who else but a god could have achieved the things that he achieved? Well, that idea made him very attractive to the Egyptians, who always thought that their leaders were gods. That's what pharaohs are. They were sort of, you might think of demigods, but they were immortals who were just given the time in physical form to rule on earth. And so for the Egyptians to look at Alexander the Great that way, well, that makes sense. But for the Greeks to be expected, to look at Alexander the Great that way was frankly abhorrent to them. They had no truck with the idea that you could have a person, a mortal on earth who was also a god. And it was that problem that I, I say it's a problem. It's, it's not a problem. It's the way we should think. But it was precisely that attitude that made them hostile to the Christians who they could not assimilate. It was that attitude that made them suspicious of what Alexander was trying to do in Egypt. And I think that maybe a part of that could be at work in what we see with Cicero's uh, mockery of the Epicureans and their use of Epicurus's portrait. Because I think what they were trying to do, in addition to what Bernard Frischer thought they were doing, which was recruiting with these busts and pictures and whatnot, they were also trying to keep an image in front of their eye of what the blessed life looks like. And that's the blessed life as lived by a mortal here on Earth. That's not the blessed life of the gods. If you want to see the gods, you have to use your mind's eye and just think about them. But this tendency to take one person's image and put it on everything and a person who was not otherwise important, frankly, to the culture, he was not a conqueror. He was not a statesman. He was not a healer or a great doctor, physician. You know, he had no right, frankly, to be cast in marble and bronze and to be put on a wall in pigment. And the tendency to do so by his followers might have seemed to outsiders as a project to deify a person. People who didn't understand that Epicurean philosophy outright denies not just deifying humans, but all supernatural gods to begin with. Yeah, I think that's very appropriate for us to be summarizing the whole letter here on this point of visualizing, identifying what the goal is in as realistic a terms as possible, whether it's putting the face of Epicurus up as an example of a living person who was able to embody the best life. It's important to have a understanding of where you're going in order to get there. Well, we basically have come to the end of the letter, and probably for the rest of the episode, we should try to put everything in context and look at the big picture of what we're talking about. So we don't want to leave this last section without emphasizing that he's ending the letter by giving us the most practical advice about how to pursue these ideas that he's been talking about when he tells us to meditate on these things day and night, both by yourself and with people who are like yourself and who basically share the same interests and the same values and direction of this philosophy. And that, that allows you to live like a God among men, because people who live among immortal blessings are not really like mortals, if you look at it in that way.
Let me get one more little story here and about that, and then we can move on to the, to the general context, because okay. this has to do with Lucretius, who drew from Ennius, but he also drew from Empedocles. And Empedocles was a very strange person. He was also convinced that he was a god like Alexander, and he died by jumping into a volcano to prove that he was immortal. All he really proved was that he was mortal and made of flesh and blood and bone. And when he jumped into a volcano, he died like a mortal. So that is all I have to say about that issue. But as far as the broader context, I think this is a very, very good ending to a great letter and a very good way also to cap off everything we've been talking about since the letter to Herodotus, more or less. Herodotus and then Pythocles and now Monoikius. That's three in the book. And now on to brilliant insights from Martin and Colosini. Yeah, I have here one thing. If you look at the translation of 135 from Bailey and Hicks, to me, Hicks' translation is makes more sense than Bailey's translation by just by the content, no? Well, especially the second one. No? I mean, the first one is the first sentence. Maybe still, still you can say it's the same me- meaning, but the, the second one is, is really changes the meaning somewhat. You're right, Martin. Go ahead and read that and explain it further, because yeah. I see what you're talking about, and I think you're definitely right. So in the Higgs translation says for the second sentence, it is better, in short, that what is well judged in action should not owe its successful issue to the aid of chance. And Bailey writes, for it is better in a man's action that what is well chosen should fail rather than what is ill chosen should be successful owing to chance. And I, from Hicks one, it means we should do our planning such that we do not need to rely on fate. So that means that by making reasonable assumptions and taking the right actions, we should have reasonable expectation of success. And then, of course, it may st- still fail. But if if we don't plan properly and just just count on that we are lucky, then this is the wrong way to do. But in, in Bailey, it is really that it, it states it's the wrong way. Martin, I'm glad you brought that up because I think you're exactly right. Bailey makes it sound like it's better to fail and to have a painful ultimate result as long as you're pursuing reason, as long as you're being reasonable in the way you do things. And I think you're right. I think Epicurus would probably disagree with that. He might well say that you don't want to rely on chance, like you said, but it's certainly better in the end to have a successful result than to have a bad result. That reminds me, for some reason in my childhood, I remember one of the phrases I heard maybe from my father or somebody else was, it's better to be lucky than smart. And that is probably not a very wise saying to follow in general, but I think that's the issue that we're talking about. In the end, you want to be smart, but if you have to have luck in order to win your goal, then by no means are you going to reject that just because it came to you through chance. Especially with uh, uh, respect to future. Now, Epicurus was, was very critical about certainty. That means for the future, we can plan only with some probability. That means we are aware if you make our decisions that what we do may still with some low probability have a bad outcome. So so in some way, chance may still get into it, but we try to minimize it by proper planning. Right. Joshua? Yeah, and I think the problem here is not so much that you were helped by chance, but that you might develop this attitude of, oh, I'm just lucky. Everything just works out in the end for me. I don't have to mm-hmm. worry. I don't have to make any hard progress or do any work. I, I, everything just seems to work out for me. I'm favored by the gods. <laughs> right. be an even more ridiculous way of putting it. Because sometimes it does really take hard work. You know, it takes hard work to accustom yourself to believe that death is nothing to you. People don't find that to be easy. Lucretius recognized that it was difficult and said that his verse that he was writing was a kind of honey that would make the medicine go down easier because it's not pleasant. You know, the process is difficult. And if you think that everything's just going to work out for you in the end, I don't have to think about these things because everything's just going to be all right. It's I think it's more the attitude that Epicurus has a problem with than simply, you know, oh, chance was good to me today. Although even that would be a, a problematic formulation. So I have something to add here because Earlier, Cassius, you brought up about suicide, and also we've been talking about free will and personal responsibility. And so I started thinking, when a person has ideas about suicide, suicidal ideation, 
is it possible that they are somehow succumbing to some feeling that there's a fate involved in their life that they can't overcome so that they're somehow not in full control of their life or somehow they're unlucky and by chance life has unfolded in a certain way and they just somehow can't escape out of that. So there's almost a denial of free will in that sense when somebody starts thinking that suicide is a choice that would be good. Joshua, you want to take that first or shall I? Well, let me expand on the question because there's another issue with free will, and that is what if I am coming to the philosophy late and I've already made, I've spent 40 years of my life making nothing but wrong decisions, and I have no room now to make any significant changes because I've allowed myself to become trapped. That's, I think, a feeling that comes up when you talk about the feeling of suicide or intrusive thoughts or ideation is it's I've done everything wrong now and it's too late to fix things. I don't have an answer to that, but that might be a way to expand. Of course, whenever we start talking about suicide, the first thing we need to always remember is that sometimes people who have these issues can in fact be under the influence of disease processes or issues of the brain that don't have the ability to think your way out of them. And they need clinical help from and medical care. And they always should be thinking about that if they ever get anywhere close to thinking that this is the best way out. They need to first exhaust all of those alternatives for treatment and so forth. But Calisini, I think basically your question is correct. People get themselves in situations all the time where they believe they are trapped They believe they have no alternative way of dealing with it that's satisfactory to them. And rather than attempt to deal with it in some other way, they look upon exiting life as the only option. And Epicurus has said, even in this letter, that life is desirable and it makes the most sense to exhaust all possibilities for improving things for yourself. And you see suicide as an absolute last resort because you know that nothing happens to you after that point. There's no hope for anything after that. Right. And I still want to add that it's not just a matter of some type of mental illness, but I'm saying, could it be just some kind of erroneous thinking pattern that is almost on a subliminal unconscious level regarding fate. That even in the modern world, somehow this idea of fate still continues in how some people think. And that when people think about suicide, they really need to stop and think, are they believing somehow that there is some fate in their lives? And that this is not a correct way of thinking about the world and how to live. And so with Epicureanism, I see this as an actual therapeutic thing for anyone who is considering suicide to really go into what it means to have free will, what it means to take personal responsibility and to make choices in life. So I just wanted to add that all in. I think what uh, Calosini describes sounds like a fate neurosis. So that if someone really thinks that fate always gives uh, him the the, the bad outcomes, so so that uh, it, it could very well be that this person suffers from fate neurosis and possibly also more subconsciously takes the action in a way that it has to fail in, or is likely to fail. Huh? So it is something that actually exists, and in in that case. Those people should rather rather go to a, a psychologist for help, some, some other similar professional help on, on that matter. No? Sometimes, though, it's not about what the world is doing to me, though. It's not like, oh, I'm just fated to fail and, and everything's just everything bad happens to me. Sometimes it's about the way that people talk about themselves. And if, if you view yourself constantly in, in a negative way, then eventually you poison your self-esteem to such a level that you don't think that you can do any good. Not just that something bad's going to happen to you, but that you can't take action that will make anything better. I feel somewhat ill-equipped to talk about this issue. 
Well, it has lots of components to it, not just from the straight psychological issue of how you think and just your thought processes, but several people here have mentioned, even in the modern world, well, I don't know that this issue is all that different from what many people who are considered to be part of mainstream religion in the United States today, when you start talking basically Calvinist or reform theology that believes that God from the beginning of the universe has ordained that everything should happen exactly as it happens and that everything is just part of that chain of events from the beginning of time. I mean, that is still today a widely held belief among people who are otherwise healthy in mind and body in general. If you take that kind of position, then you're going to find yourself in these traps and from that point of view, the philosophical worldview, physics point of view, absolutely, that's where Epicurus is targeting these comments. You can unwind those feelings of helplessness and the fate of supernatural gods and in the fate of destiny and fate. You can unwind that by studying nature and realizing that those things do not and cannot exist and that they're figments of people's imaginations or manipulation or worse. So, yeah, I think that really is the key aspect of what Epicurus is doing here. For those people who are in relatively healthy condition, but who are suffering from false beliefs about the nature of the universe, to me, that's the very focus of Epicurean philosophy, is showing those people the way out of those problems. It's much more difficult when you have people who are not philosophically oriented and who have just absorbed from the culture around them these ideas that everything is out of their control. There's the cliche about when people conclude they have nothing to lose, they lose it. And it's bad to just give in to this idea that there's nothing you can do. Because in fact, when you do take steps, if, if you were considering ending your life or taking some other kind of dramatic action, that's an example of how Epicurus is right. You do have control over many of the events of your life. I do have something I could talk about here. And it's something I didn't think of when we were talking about Epicurus living a meager, measly life on just bread and water. And Don has done some very interesting work on the forum of trying to put some context around this bread and water issue by actually going to the trouble of making himself some barley bread. Part of it, he said, was a, a dismal failure. Part of it worked out OK. But just this morning, I thought of another angle on this. And I should point out also that Colosini found a good article on barley bread and how it was actually, in some ways, a luxury compared to simply wheat flour. But this is a story that comes from a guy I've talked about earlier in the episode. This is Alexander the Great. And this is Dinocrates, who was, in a weird way, the person that he chose, the person that he selected, hired to design and build his city, the city of Alexandria on the north coast of Africa, west of the Nile Delta. And it's interesting because in Greece and in Macedon and, and maybe even in Italy, You've got a lot of chalk. The rock is it can be ground into a fine chalk. And then the surveyors, when they went out to lay out roads, when they went to lay out buildings, palaces, temples, theaters, gardens, they would take a crew out with a whole bunch of bags of chalk. And then where the surveyors laid out lines, the workmen would lay down lines of chalk after them. Well, Egypt, or at least North Egypt, where they were, didn't have chalk. And so this was their solution. And this comes from a book that I've talked about quite a lot on the forum. This is The Rise and Fall of Alexandria by Justin Pollard and Howard Reed. And I don't know what their primary source citation for this is, but they say crisscrossing the sandy shore were lines of barley flour carefully poured out by workmen walking behind teams of surveyors who calculated angles and distances using tools unchanged since the days of the pyramid builders. The entire area now lay under a net of these white lines, attended to by countless small birds that did their best to eat them as fast as they were laid. So why did they use barley flour? Well, they didn't have chalk, I've already mentioned that. The other reason they used barley flour is because Alexandria, sorry, Alexander had to feed an army. And so we had a lot of barley flour because that's what the army was eating. 
So this image of Epicurus, I think, sitting in a cave and eating bread and water and having no ambition or desire to do anything, it simply does not follow because here Alexander is with an army and a whole bunch of barley flour, shiploads of it. And not only does he have ambition, but he is the archetype of ambition, the paragon of ambition. And his army goes on to conquer most of what at that time was the known world. So just because we're eating bread does not mean that we are living miserable, wretched lives stuck in a cave, I guess is the direction I want to go with that. And the letter to Menoikias, when you read it in its whole context, and when you consider it more broadly in the context of everything that survives from Epicurean philosophy, in the context of Lucretius, in the context of what we have from Diogenes Laertius, in the context of Cicero, and on ends in the context of the inscription at Oinwanda in the context of the surviving fragments of the papyrus rolls of Philodemus in Herculaneum. The broad picture, all in my eye, seems to tell the same story. And it's the story of what it means to live a blessed life. And it's precisely what Epicurus says here in the letter to Monoikius. Here, I think that's a great analogy, Joshua, about Alexander's army and the barley issue. That's what armies do. That's what soldiers do in the middle of fighting. They have simple meals available to them that sustains their strength and allows them to do the fighting and achieve their goals. But it's not luxury out on the battlefield. It can be a harsh struggle in life to achieve the things that you want to achieve. And that, to me, is exactly where Epicurus is going with the discussion of simplicity in diet and simplicity in way of life. It equips you to be strong in the face of adversity and to push forward to achieve the things you want to achieve in the limited lifespan that you have. You were citing at the end, I think you're talking about basically that same section from Torquatus again about the ideal is that the man is living in continuous enjoyment of numerous and vivid pleasures alike of body and mind, undisturbed either by the presence or the prospect of pain. And Torquatus says, what possible state of existence could we describe as being more excellent or more desirable? So there's that phrasing that's reflected in both Torquatus and the letter to Menorchius that the best way of life is to live in the constant enjoyment of numerous and vivid pleasures of body and of mind, undisturbed by the presence or the prospect of pain. And that's where the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain fit together. So you've got this visualization of the goal, but then you have to decide how you're going to get there. And that's where the simplicity of diet and lifestyle comes in, because as Torquata says, one so situated must possess in the first place a strength of mind that is proof against all fear of death and of pain. And strength of mind and knowing these things are affirmative choices. They're actions that we have to take. We can't just be passive billiard balls waiting to just react to what's around us. We have to engage our minds to understand the big picture so that we can play our role in making sure that our pleasure is maximized and our pain is minimized. But you do that through knowing these things of the basic philosophy that Epicurus is teaching and not just floating through life, wondering what's right, and what's wrong and thinking everything is basically the same. You always return to those basics about let such a man have no dread of supernatural power, never let him suffer the pleasures of the past to fade away, but renew them in recollection, and his lot will be one of which will not admit of further improvement. So there's specific ways that Epicurus is suggesting that you achieve these results that we've been talking about. We're coming to the end of a normal length episode, so let's talk about final ways to comment on what we think is the takeaway from the letter to Menorchius. And as usual, we should go to Martin to start with. Oh, I can't. I have no idea how to put this in short. Joshua or Calasini, how about final thoughts for today? Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at the very end of this letter, and I still have some questions for my own self. Because I don't fully feel like I understand the very end. It talks about living like gods among men. And so I am still going to be pondering and meditating upon what that means. In some sense, we could have a whole episode just discussing that. <laughs> to me, at least, that's what I think. Because I think there's a lot there. 
I mentioned that, you know, the Greeks of Epicurus's world might be hostile to somebody who takes this view that it's possible to live like a god in a sense. You know, you're not a god. You don't have the power or the immortality of a god. But in the blessings of your life, you are like a god. I mentioned that some of the Greeks might have a problem with that, but there was one Greek in particular who was, this ties back into my whole barley flour thing, who was a contemporary of Epicurus and who was a boy of about the same age of Epicurus and in the same cohort as Epicurus. Uh, that's probably not the right word. That's more of a Latin word, but who served the necessary and required mandatory two-year minimum military training with Epicurus. And I'm talking here about the celebrated playwright Menander. And Menander in the Greek anthology, uh, anthology means garland of flowers. So this is a group of preserved poems, epitaphs, epigrams, little laconic snippets of wisdom that come down to us from the ancient world. Menander says, hail you twin born sons of Naocles, of whom the one saved his country from slavery, the other from folly. So I mentioned earlier, what achievement did Epicurus make that would allow him to have his students and pupils and successors carve his face in marble and put it up all over town? Well, this is this is the achievement. Themistocles was a general and a statesman who averted a military disaster that was impending in Athens. But it was Epicurus, according to Menander, who saved Athens and indeed the world from folly, from false belief, from from superstition, from fate and and fortune, chance, destiny and predetermination. And it was Epicurus who gave us the method. As Torquatus said, he was the master builder of the life of happiness. And so in order to live like a God among men, according to Epicurus, you have to live the life of blessedness because you've taken Epicurus's advice on this subject and you've rejected about the gods any claims that are made about their capriciousness, their lust, any intervention they make in the affairs of people, their diverse and angry and capricious personalities. To live like a god, in other words, according to Epicurus, is to live like an Epicurean god, which is a life of deepest peace unmixed with any fear of pain or death or anxiety, with any fear of divine retribution, and full of the life of pleasure. Joshua, I think in expanding what you're saying there, somebody who is talking about living like a god and addressing Calisthenes' question, there's also the beginning of book five of Lucretius's poem, where Epicurus is, in fact, analogized to a god. There may be something worth saying there. Book five starts out, Who can, with all his soul inspired, compose fit numbers worthy of the majesty of such great things of these discoveries? Or who, in words alone, can sing his praise and equal his deserts? Who, from the labor of his mind, has left such benefits and bestowed rewards so glorious on mankind? No mortal man alive, as I conceive, for could I raise my verse to reach the dignity of things he knew? He was a god, my noble Mimius, a god he was who first found out that rule of life which is now called true wisdom, and who this human life so tossed with storms and so overwhelmed in darkness has been rendered by his art so calm and placed in so clear a light. And then he continues on, unless the mind be purged, what wars within what dangers wretched mortals must endure, what piercing cares of fierce desire must tear the minds of men. And then the man, therefore, that subdued these monsters and drove them from the mind by precept, not by force, should not this man be worthy to be numbered with the gods, especially since of these immortal deities he has spoken nobly and by his writings has explained to us the laws of universal nature. So probably what Lucretius is talking about there in book five is related to what Epicurus would be saying in terms of living as a god among men, that you are, by understanding the philosophy and talking about it and engaging with it, you're experiencing this ability to realize that the pleasures of life are worth whatever pains we do have to endure. And even though as mortals, we don't have the ability to continue to do that forever, we can share in the experience while we are alive. 
Cash, that was a very good answer. I think, Calasini, you partially gave your own answer when you said that your approach was to meditate on the question, because that, to me, is the heart of the advice that we get from the letter to Monoikius. Meditate on these things, whether alone or with persons like yourself, night and day. That is the way that we have to approach this question. We're not going to solve everything right now. I probably derailed Cassius's attempt to solve it right now, but it's the meditating alone and with company, night and day. That, to me, is the ultimate suggestion on how we should continue to explore philosophy that we get from the letter to Monoikius. Yeah. Meditation is an action. It's an activity. It's engaging. It's taking a positive step towards pursuing what you're looking for, as opposed to just giving in and being a billiard ball and being a slave of supernatural religion or false philosophy. It means engagement and study, the study of nature, which is so important to Lucretius and Epicurus both. That Epicurus says is the way he finds his happiness through the study of nature. Those are actions that you take. You choose to pursue these good things. You're not just a slave or a pawn of outside forces. You have the ability through your mind to make lemonade from lemons. Well, and I would say that living like the gods is going to be not just making lemonade out of lemons, but something far grander and far superior. There's definitely no absolute way that everybody has to live their lives and no list of choices that everybody has to follow. The feeling of pleasure is individual and cliches like lemons from lemonade is helpful, just like just like it's helpful to say pursue pleasure and avoid pain. But we each have to translate that into reality because we're the ones that are living our lives. Nobody else is. I feel like we're not on the final point yet, though. Joshua, any other wrap up here? My instinct is to read the Torquatus material and put a pin on that. And as you're finding that, Joshua, one of the things you've always said in these podcasts is that we've come to the end of the letter to Menorchius, but only the beginning of our attempts to apply the letter to Menorchius to our own lives. Simply reading isn't the end of anything. It's the beginning of wisdom, maybe. But what we're here is not to pursue wisdom, but actually to live happily. And that means making decisions of our own and pursuing them to a successful conclusion, if at all possible. So that's what we have to do. And we can't do that unless we keep in mind what the goal is. Actually, I changed my mind since we're capping (laughs) off all of the letters to Epicurus here, except for the will. I can now read the ending of the Torquatus material, which might even be better, where he says, if then the doctrine I have set forth is clearer and more luminous than daylight itself, if it is derived entirely from nature's source, if my whole discourse relies throughout for confirmation on the unbiased and unimpeachable evidence of the senses, If lisping infants, nay, even dumb animals prompted by nature's teaching, almost find voice to proclaim that there is no welfare but pleasure, no hardship but pain, and their judgment in these matters is neither sophisticated nor biased, ought we not to feel the greatest gratitude to him who caught this utterance of nature's voice and grasped its import so firmly and so fully that he has guided all sane-minded men into the paths of peace and happiness, calmness and repose. That's a great way to end the episode. Obviously, Epicurus did not write that himself, but several hundred years later, by the time of Cicero, someone else had written that, that Cicero incorporated into his book. And in doing so, they left for us one of the best statements we have for summarizing the whole importance of the philosophy and what we can and should do with it. So why don't we close with that for the day, and we'll come back next week. We will continue pursuing the philosophy of Epicurus. It looks like we're probably going to go into the inscription from Diogenes of Oinoander, but we'll make a final decision and bring it to you next week. Thank you for your time and listening to us today. We invite you to come by the forum where we have a thread on this and many other topics. So we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks and bye. 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 Bye.